Introduction to Myths Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Myths Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Introduction. In many parts of the country where the soil is disturbed, arrowheads are found. Now, it is a great many years since arrowheads have been used, and they were never used by the people who own the land in which they appear, or by their ancestors. To explain the presence of these roughly cut pieces of stone, we must recall the weapons with which the Indians fought when Englishmen, Frenchmen, Dutchmen, and Spaniards first came to this part of the world. There may be no authentic history of Indians in the particular locality in which these old-fashioned weapons come to light, but their presence in the ground is the best kind of evidence that Indians once lived on these fields or were in the habit of hunting over them. In many parts of the country these arrowheads are turned up in great numbers. Museums large and small are plentifully supplied with them, and they form part of the record of the men who once lived here and of their ways of killing game and destroying their enemies. Wherever there are arrowheads, there have been Indians. Among every people and in every language there are found stories, superstitions, traditions, phrases, which are not to be explained by the thoughts or ideas or beliefs of people now living. And the same stories, superstitions, phrases, are found among people as far apart as those of Norway and Australia. The people of today tell these stories or remember the superstitions or use the phrases without understanding where they came from or what they meant when first used. As the ground in some sections is full of arrowheads that have been buried no one knows how many centuries, so the poetry we read, the music we hear, the stories told us when we are children, have come down from a time in the history of man so early that there are in many cases no other records or remains of it. These stories vary greatly in details. They fit every climate and wear the peculiar dress of every country, but it is easy to see that they are made up of the same materials and that they describe the same persons or ideas or things, whether they are told in Greece or India or Norway or Brittany. Wherever they are found, they make it certain that they come from a very remote time and grew out of ideas or feelings and ways of looking at the world which a great many men shared in common in many places. When a man sneezes, people still say in some countries, God bless you. They do not know why they say it. They simply repeat what they heard older people say when they were children and do not know that every time they use these words, they recall the age when people believed that evil spirits could enter into a man and that when a man sneezed, he expelled one of these spirits. It is a very old and widely spread superstition that when a dog howls at night, someone not far away is dying or will soon die. Many people are uncomfortable when they hear a dog howling after dark, not because they believe that dogs have any knowledge that death is present or coming, but because their ancestors, for many centuries, believed that the howling of a dog was ominous, and the habits of our ancestors leave deep traces in our natures. Now, every time the melancholy howling of a dog at night makes a child uncomfortable, he recalls the old superstition which identified the roaring or wailing of the wind with a wolf or dog into which a god or demon had entered with power to summon the spirits of men to follow him as he rushed along in the darkness in the old homes in the forest thousands of years ago children crowded about the open fire and trembled when a great blast shook the house for fear that the gigantic beast who made the sound would call them and they would be compelled to follow him we think of wind as air in motion. They thought of it as the breath and sound of some living creature. When we say that the wind whistled in the keyhole, or kissed the flowers, or drove the clouds before it, we are using poetically the language our forefathers used literally. We speak of the siren voice of pleasure, the blow of fate, the smile of fortune, and do not remember, often do not know, that we are recalling that remote past when people believed that there were sirens on the coast of Crete 
whose voices were so sweet that sailors could not resist them and were drawn on to the rock and drowned that fate was a terrible relentless passionless person with supreme power over gods and men that fortune was a being who smiled or frowned as men smile or frown but whose smile meant prosperity and her frown disaster there are few poems which have interested children more than robert browning's pipe piper of hamlin the story runs that long ago in the year 1284 the old german town of hamlin was so overrun with rats that there was no peace for the people living in it when things were at their worst a strange man appeared in the place and offered for a sum of money to clear it of these pests the bargain was made and the stranger began to pipe and straightway from every nook and corner of the old town the rats came in swarms followed him to the river wisa and jumped in and were drowned when the people found that the city was really free from rats they were ungrateful enough to say that the piper had used magic which was believed to be the practice of the evil spirit and refused to carry out their part of the contract the stranger went off in a great rage and threatened to come back again and take payment in his own way on st john's day which was a time of great festivity he suddenly reappeared blew a new and beguiling air on his pipe and immediately every child in the city felt as if a hand had seized him and ran pell-mell after the musician as he climbed the mountain in which a door suddenly opened and through that door all save a lame boy passed and were never seen again from this old story probably came the proverb about paying the piper and it is one of many stories which turn on the magical power of a voice or a sound to draw men women and children to their doom these very interesting stories are not like the stories which are made up just to please people and help them pass away the time they are different forms of one story the story of the wind told by people who thought that the wind was not what we call a force but a person and that when he called those who heard must follow if he chose for the piper is no other than the wind and the ancients held that in the wind were the souls of the dead if every time we think of a force we should think of a person we should see the world as the men and women who made the myth saw it everything that moved or made a sound or flashed out light or gave out heat was a person to them they could not think of the wind rushing through the trees or the storm devastating the fields without imagining someone like themselves only more powerful behind the uproar and destruction any more than we can see a lantern moving along the road at night without thinking instinctively that somebody is carrying it our idea of the world is scientific because it is based on exact though by no means complete knowledge the myth-maker's idea of the world was poetic because with very incomplete knowledge they could not imagine how anything could be done unless it was done as they did things when the black clouds gather on a summer afternoon and roll up in the sky in great terrifying masses and the lightning flashes from them and the crash of the thunder fills the air and the rain beats down the crops we feel as if we were in the laboratory of nature seeing a wonderful experiment made when our ancestors saw the same spectacle they were sure that a great dragon breathing fire and roaring with anger was ravaging the earth as children today imagine that dolls are alive that fairies dance in moonlit meadows on summer nights or beasts and indians make the sounds in the woods so the people who made the myths filled the world with creatures unlike themselves but with something of human intelligence feeling and will as imaginative children personify the sounds they hear so the men and women of an early time personified everything that lived or moved or gave any sign of life they filled the earth, air, and sea with imaginary beings who had power over the elements and affected the lives of men. There were nymphs in the sea, dryads in the trees, kindly or destructive spirits in the air, household gods who watched over the home, and greater gods who managed the affairs of the world. When an intelligent man finds himself in new surroundings, he begins at once to study them and try to understand them. In every age, this has been one of the greatest objects of interest to men and every generation has endeavored to explain the world so as to satisfy not only his curiosity but its reason the myths were explanations of the world created by people 
who had not had time to study that world closely, nor to train themselves to study it in a scientific way. They saw the world with their imaginations quite as much as with their eyes, and as they put persons behind every kind and form of life, they told stories about the world instead of making accurate and matter-of-fact reports of it. The change of the seasons is not at all mysterious to us, but to the Norsemen it was a wonderful struggle between gods and giants. In the summer the gods had their triumph, but in the winter the giants had their way. Year after year and century after century this terrible warfare went on, until a day should come when, in the last great battle, both gods and giants would be destroyed, and a new heaven and earth arise. These same brave and warlike men believed that the most powerful fighter among the gods was Thor, and that it was the swinging and crashing of his terrible hammer which made the lightning and thunder. The sun which vanquished the darkness put out the stars, drove the cold to the far north, called back the flowers, made the fields fertile, awoke men from sleep, and filled them with courage and hope, was the centre of mythology and appears and reappears in a thousand stories in many parts of the world and in all kinds of disguises now he is the most beautiful and noble of the greek gods apollo now he is odin with a single eye now he is hercules the hero with his twelve great labours for the good of men now he is oedipus who met the sphinx and sold her riddle in the early times men saw how everything in the world about them drew its strength and beauty from the sun, how the sun warmed the earth and made the crops grow, how it brought gladness and hope and inspiration to men, and they made it the centre of the great world stories, the foremost hero of the great world play. For the myths form a poetical explanation of the earth, the sea, the sky, and of the life of man in this wonderful universe, and each great myth was a chapter in a story which endowed day and night summer and winter, sun, moon, stars, winds, clouds, fire, with life, and made them actors in the mysterious drama of the world. Our North's forefathers thought of themselves always as looking on at a terrible fight between the gods, who were light and heat and fruitfulness, revealed in the beauty of day and the splendour of summer, and the giants, who were darkness, cold and barrenness, revealed in the bloom of night, and the desolation of winter to the northmen as to the greek the roman the hindu and other primitive peoples the world was the scene of a great struggle the stage on which gods demons and heroes were contending for supremacy and they told that story in a thousand different ways every myth is a chapter in that story and differs from other stories and legends because it is an explanation of something that happened in earth sea or sky if the men who created the myths had set to work to make wonder tales, as stories are sometimes made to instruct while they entertain children, they would have left a mass of very dull tales which few people would have cared to read. They had no idea of doing anything so artificial and mechanical. They made these old stories because all life was a story to them, full of splendour or terrible figures moving across the sky or through the sea and in the depths of the woods and whichever way they looked they saw or thought they saw mysterious and wonderful things going on they were as much interested in their world as we are in ours we write hundreds of scientific books every year to explain our world they told hundreds of stories every year to explain theirs this selection represents the work of several authors and does not therefore preserve uniformity of style it is probably better for the young reader that the greek myths should come from one hand and the Norse myths from another. The classical work of Hawthorne has been generously drawn upon. No change of any kind has been made in the text, but the introductions connecting one myth with another have been omitted. End of Introduction by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section 1 of Myths Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Myths Every Child Should Know 
Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section 1. The Three Golden Apples. Part 1. Did you ever hear of the golden apples that grew in the garden of the Hesperides? Ah, these were such apples as would bring a great price by the bushel if any of them could be found growing in the orchards of nowadays. But there is not, I suppose, a graft of that wonderful fruit on a single tree in the wide world, not so much as a seed of those apples exists any longer. And even in the old, old, half-forgotten times before the garden of the Hesperides was overrun with weeds, and a great many people doubted whether there could be real trees that bore apples of solid gold upon their branches. All had heard of them, but nobody remembered to have seen any. Children nevertheless used to listen open-mouthed to stories of the golden apple tree, and resolved to discover it when they should be big enough. Adventurous young men who desired to do a braver thing than any of their fellows set out in quest of this fruit. Many of them returned no more. None of them brought back the apples. No wonder that they found it impossible to gather them. It is said that there was a dragon beneath the tree with a hundred terrible heads, fifty of which were always on the watch, while the other fifty slept. In my opinion, it was hardly worth running so much risk for the sake of a solid golden apple. Had the apples been sweet, mellow, and juicy, indeed, that would be another matter. There might then have been some sense in trying to get at them in spite of the hundred-headed dragon. But as I have already told you, it was quite a common thing with young persons, when tired of too much peace and rest, to go in search of the garden of the Hesperides. Now once the adventure was undertaken by a hero who had enjoyed very little peace or rest since he came into the world. At the time of which I am going to speak, he was wandering through the pleasant land of Italy, with a mighty club in his hand, and a bow and quiver slung across his shoulders. He was wrapped in the skin of the biggest and fiercest lion that ever had been seen, and which he himself had killed, and though on the whole he was a kind and generous and noble man, there was a good deal of the lion's fierceness in his heart. As he went on his way, he continually inquired whether that were the right road to the famous garden. But none of the country people knew anything about the matter, and many looked as if they would have laughed at the question if the stranger had not carried so very big a club. And so he journeyed on and on, still making the same inquiry, until at last he came to the brink of a river where some beautiful young women sat twining wreaths of flowers. "'Can you tell me, pretty maidens,' asked the stranger, whether this is the right way to the garden of the Hesperides. The young women had been having a fine time together, weaving the flowers into wreaths and crowning one another's heads, and there seemed to be a kind of magic in the touch of their fingers that made the flowers more fresh and dewy and of brighter hues and sweeter fragrance while they played with them than even when they had been growing on their native stems. But on hearing the stranger's question, they dropped all their flowers on the grass and gazed at him with astonishment. The garden of the Hesperides, cried one. We thought mortals had been weary of seeking it after so many disappointments, and pray, adventurous traveller, what do you want there? A certain king, who is my cousin, replied he, has ordered me to get him three of the golden apples. Most of the young men who go in quest of these apples, observed another of the damsels, desire to obtain them for themselves, or to present them to some fair maiden whom they love. Do you then love this king, your cousin, so very much? Perhaps not, replied the stranger, sighing. He has often been severe and cruel to me, but it is my destiny to obey him. And do you know, asked the damsel who had first spoken, that a terrible dragon with a hundred heads keeps watch under the golden apple tree? I know it well, answered the stranger calmly, but from my cradle upward it has been my business, and almost my pastime, to deal with serpents and dragons. The young women looked at his massive club, and at the shaggy lion skin which he wore, and likewise at his heroic limbs and figure, and they whispered to each other that the stranger appeared to be one who might reasonably expect to perform deeds far beyond the might of other men. But, 
then the dragon with a hundred heads what mortal even if he possessed a hundred lives could hope to escape the fangs of such a monster so kind-hearted were the maidens that they could not bear to see this brave and handsome traveler attempt what was so very dangerous and devote himself most probably to becoming a meal for the dragon's hundred ravenous mouths go back cried they all go back to your own home your mother beholding you safe and sound will shed tears of joy and what can she do more should you win ever so great a victory no matter for the golden apples no matter for the king your cruel cousin we do not wish the dragon with a hundred heads to eat you up the stranger seemed to grow impatient at these remonstrances he carelessly lifted his mighty club and let it fall upon a rock that lay half buried in the earth nearby with the force of that idle blow the great rock was shattered all to pieces it cost the stranger no more effort to achieve this feat of a giant's strength than for one of the young maidens to touch her sister's rosy cheek with a flower do you not believe said he looking at the damsels with a smile that such a blow would have crushed one of the dragon's hundred heads then he sat down on the grass and told them the story of his life or as much of it as he could remember from the day when he was first cradled in a warrior's brazen shield and while he lay there two immense serpents came gliding over the floor and opened their hideous jaws to devour him and he a baby of a few months old had gripped one of the fierce snakes in each of his little fists and strangled them to death when he was but a stripling he had killed a huge lion almost as big as the one whose vast and shaggy hide he now wore upon his shoulders the next thing that he had done was to fight a battle with an ugly sort of monster called a hydra which had no less than nine heads and exceedingly sharp teeth in every one but the dragon of the hesperides you know observed one of the damsels has a hundred heads nevertheless replied the stranger i would rather fight two such dragons than a single hydra for as fast as i cut off a head two others grew in its place and besides there was one of the heads that could not possibly be killed but kept biting as fiercely as ever long after it was cut off so i was forced to bury it under a stone where it is doubtless alive to this very day but the hydra's body and its eight other heads will never do any further mischief the damsels judging that the story was likely to last a good while had been preparing a repast of bread and grapes that the stranger might refresh himself in the intervals of his talk they took pleasure in helping him to this simple food and now and then one of them would put a sweet grape between her rosy lips lest it should make him bashful to eat alone the traveler proceeded to tell her he had chased a very swift stag for a twelvemonth together without ever stopping to take breath and had at last caught it by the antlers and carried it home alive and he had fought with a very odd race of people half horses and half men and had put them all to death from a sense of duty in order that their ugly figures might never be seen any more besides all this he took to himself great credit for having cleaned out a stable do you call that a wonderful exploit asked one of the young maidens with a smile any clown in the country has done as much had it been an ordinary stable replied the stranger i should not have mentioned it but this was so gigantic a task that it would have taken me all of my life to perform it if i had not luckily thought of turning the channel of a river through the stable door that did the business in a very short time seeing how earnestly his fair auditors listened he next told them how he had shot some monstrous birds and had caught a wild bull alive and let him go again and had tamed a number of very wild horses and had conquered hippolyte the warlike queen of the amazons he mentioned likewise that he had taken off hippolyte's enchanted girdle and had given it to the daughter of his cousin the king was it the girdle of venus inquired the prettiest of the damsels which makes women beautiful no answered the stranger it had formerly been the sword belt of mars and it can only make the wearer valiant and courageous an old sword belt cried the damsel tossing her head then i should not care about having it you are right said the stranger 
Going on with his wonderful narrative, he informed the maidens that as strange an adventure as ever happened was when he had fought with Geryon, the six-legged man. This was a very odd and frightful sort of figure. As you may well believe, any person looking at his tracks in the sand or snow would suppose that three sociable companions had been walking along together. On hearing his footsteps at a little distance, it was no more than reasonable to judge that several people must be coming. But it was only the strange man Geryon clattering onward with his six legs. Six legs and one gigantic body. Certainly he must have been a very queer monster to look at, and my stars, what a waste of shoe leather. When the stranger had finished the story of his adventures, he looked around at the attentive faces of the maidens. Perhaps you may have heard of me before, said he modestly. My name is Hercules. We had already guessed it, replied the maidens, for your wonderful deeds are known all over the world. We do not think it strange any longer that you should set out in quest of the golden apples of the Hesperides. Come, sisters, let us crown the hero with flowers. Then they flung beautiful wreaths over his stately head and mighty shoulders, so that the lion's skin was almost entirely covered with roses. They took possession of his ponderous club, and so entwined it about with the brightest, softest, and most fragrant blossoms, that not a finger's breadth of its oaken substance could be seen. It looked all like a huge bunch of flowers. Lastly, they joined hands and danced around him, chanting words which became poetry of their own accord, and grew into a choral song in honor of the illustrious Hercules. And Hercules was rejoiced, as any other hero would have been, to know that these fair young girls had heard of the valiant deeds which it had cost him so much toil and danger to achieve. But still he was not satisfied. He could not think that what he had already done was worthy of so much honor while there remained any bold or difficult adventure to be undertaken. Dear maidens, said he, when they paused to take breath, now that you know my name, will you not tell me how I am to reach the garden of the Hesperides? Ah, must you go so soon, they exclaimed, you that have performed so many wonders and spent such a toilsome life, cannot you content yourself to repose a little while on the margin of this peaceful river? Hercules shook his head. I must depart now, said he. We will then give you the best directions we can, replied the damsels. You must go to the seashore and find out the old one, and compel him to inform you where the golden apples are to be found. The old one, repeated Hercules, laughing at this odd name, and pray, who may the old one be? Why, the old man of the sea, to be sure, answered one of the damsels. He has fifty daughters, whom some people call very beautiful but we do not think it proper to be acquainted with them, because they have sea-green hair and taper away like fishes. You must talk with this old man of the sea. He is a seafaring person, and knows all about the garden of the Hesperides, for it is situated in an island which he is often in the habit of visiting. Hercules then asked the whereabouts the old one was most likely to be met with. When the damsels had informed him, he thanked them for all their kindness, for the bread and grapes with which they had fed him, the lovely flowers with which they had crowned him, and the songs and dances wherewith they had done him honor. And he thanked them most of all for telling him the right way, and immediately set forth upon his journey. But before he was out of hearing, one of the maidens called after him. Keep fast hold of the old one when you catch him, cried she, smiling, and lifting her finger to make the caution more impressive. Do not be astonished at anything that may happen, only hold him fast, and he will tell you what you wish to know. Hercules again thanked her, and pursued his way, while the maidens resumed their pleasant labor of making flower wreaths. They talked about the hero long after he was gone. We will crown him with the loveliest of our garlands, said they, when he returns hither with the three golden apples, after slaying the dragon with a hundred heads. Meanwhile Hercules travelled constantly onward over hill and dale, and through the solitary woods. 
Sometimes he swung his club aloft and splintered a mighty oak with a downright blow. His mind was so full of the giants and monsters with whom it was the business of his life to fight that perhaps he mistook the great tree for a giant or a monster. And so eager was Hercules to achieve what he had undertaken that he almost regretted to have spent so much time with the damsels, wasting idle breath upon the story of his adventures. But thus it always is with persons who are destined to perform great things. What they have already done seems less than nothing. What they have taken in hand to do seems worth toil, danger, and life itself. Persons who happen to be passing through the forest must have been affrighted to see him smite the trees with his great club. With but a single blow, the trunk was riven as by the stroke of lightning, and the broad boughs came rustling and crashing down. Hastening forward without ever pausing or looking behind, he by and by heard the sea roaring at a distance. At this sound he increased his speed, and soon came to a beach where the great surf waves tumbled themselves upon the hard sand in a long line of snowy foam. At one end of the beach, however, there was a pleasant spot where some green shrubbery clambered up a cliff, making its rocky face look soft and beautiful. A carpet of verdant grass, largely intermixed with sweet-smelling clover, covered the narrow space between the bottom of the cliff and the sea. And what should Hercules espy there but an old man fast asleep? But was it really and truly an old man? Certainly at first sight it looked very like one, but on closer inspection it rather seemed to be some kind of a creature that lived in the sea for on his legs and arms there were scales such as fishes have he was web-footed and web-fingered after the fashion of a duck and his long beard being of a greenish tinge had more the appearance of a tuft of seaweed than of an ordinary beard have you never seen a stick of timber that has been long tossed about by the waves and has got all overgrown with barnacles, and at last drifting ashore, seems to have been thrown up from the very deepest bottom of the sea? Well, the old man would have put you in mind of just a wave-tossed spar. But Hercules, the instant he set eyes on this strange figure, was convinced it could be no other than the old one who was to direct him on his way. Yes, it was the self-same old man of the sea whom the hospitable maidens had talked to him about. Thanking his stars for the lucky accident of finding the old fellow asleep, Hercules stole on tiptoe towards him and caught him by the arm and leg. Tell me, cried he before the old one was well awake, which is the way to the garden of the Hesperides? As you may easily imagine, the old man of the sea awoke in a fright. But his astonishment could hardly have been greater than was that of Hercules the next moment, for all of a sudden the old one seemed to disappear out of his grasp, and he found himself holding a stag by the fore and hind leg. But still he kept fast hold. Then the stag disappeared, and in its stead there was a seabird, fluttering and screaming, while Hercules clutched it by the wing and claw. But the bird could not get away. Immediately afterward there was an ugly three-headed dog which growled and barked at Hercules and snapped fiercely at the hands by which he held him. But Hercules would not let him go. In another minute, instead of the three-headed dog, what should appear but the Geryon, the six-legged man-monster, kicking at Hercules with five of his legs in order to get the remaining one at liberty. But Hercules held on. By and by, no Geryon was there but a huge snake, like one of those which Hercules had strangled in his babyhood, only a hundred times as big, and it twisted and twined about the hero's neck and body, and threw its tail high into the air, and opened its deadly jaws as if to devour him outright, so that it was really a very terrible spectacle. But Hercules was no whit disheartened, and squeezed the great snake so tightly that he soon began to hiss with pain. End of section one. Section two of Myths Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Myths Every Child Should Know, edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section 2. The Three Golden Apples, Part 2. You must understand that the old man of the sea, though he generally looked so much like the wave-beaten figurehead of a vessel, had the power of assuming any shape he pleased. When he found himself so roughly seized by Hercules, he had been in hopes of putting him in such surprise and terror by these magical transformations that the hero would be glad to let him go. If Hercules had relaxed his grasp, the old one would certainly have plunged down to the very bottom of the sea, whence he would not soon have given himself the trouble of coming up in order to answer any impertinent questions. Ninety-nine people out of a hundred, I suppose, would have been frightened out of their wits by the very first of his ugly shapes, and would have taken to their heels at once. For one of the hardest things in this world is to see the difference between real dangers and imaginary ones. But as Hercules held on so stubbornly, and only squeezed the old one so much the tighter at every change of shape, and really put him in no small torture, he finally thought it best to reappear in his own figure. So there he was again, a fishy, scaly, web-footed sort of personage, with something like a tuft of seaweed at his chin. "'Pray, what do you want with me?' cried the old one as soon as he could take breath for it is quite a tiresome affair to go through so many false shapes why do you squeeze me so hard let me go this moment or i shall begin to consider you an extremely uncivil person my name is hercules roared the mighty stranger and you will never get out of my clutch until you tell me the nearest way to the garden of the hesperides when the old fellow heard who it was that had caught him he saw with half an eye that it would be necessary to tell him everything he wanted to know. The old one was an inhabitant of the sea, you must recollect, and roamed about everywhere like other seafaring people. Of course, he had often heard of the fame of Hercules and of the wonderful things that he was constantly performing in various parts of the earth, and how determined he always was to accomplish whatever he undertook. He therefore made no more attempts to escape but told the hero how to find the garden of the Hesperides, and likewise warned him of many difficulties which must be overcome before he could arrive thither. "'You must go on thus and thus,' said the old man of the sea, after taking the points of the compass, "'till you come into sight of a very tall giant who holds the sky on his shoulders, and the giant if he happens to be in the humor, will tell you exactly where the garden of the Hesperides lies. And if the giant happens not to be in the humor, remarked Hercules, balancing his club on the tip of his finger, perhaps I shall find means to persuade him. Thanking the old man of the sea and begging his pardon for having squeezed him so roughly, the hero resumed his journey. He met with a great many strange adventures, which would be well worth your hearing, if I had leisure to narrate them as minutely as they deserve. It was in this journey, if I mistake not, that he encountered a prodigious giant who was so wonderfully contrived by nature that every time he touched the earth he became ten times as strong as ever he had been before. His name was Antaeus. You may see plainly enough that it was a very difficult business to fight with such a fellow, for as often as he got a knock-down blow, up he started again, stronger, fiercer, and abler to use his weapons than if his enemy had let him alone. Thus the harder Hercules pounded the giant with his club, the further he seemed from winning the victory. I have sometimes argued with such people, but never fought with one. The only way in which Hercules found it possible to finish the battle was by lifting Antaeus up off his feet into the air and squeezing him and squeezing him until finally the strength was quite squeezed out of his enormous body. When this affair was finished, Hercules continued his travels and went to the land of Egypt, where he was taken prisoner and would have been put to death if he had not slain the king of the country and made his escape. Passing through the deserts of Africa, and going as fast as he could, he arrived at last on the shore of the great ocean. And here, 
unless he could walk on the crests of the billows it seemed as if his journey must needs be at an end nothing was before him save the foaming dashing measureless ocean but suddenly as he looked toward the horizon he saw something a great way off which he had not seen the moment before it gleamed very brightly almost as you may have beheld the round golden disk of the sun when it rises or sets over the edge of the world it evidently drew nearer for at every instant this wonderful object became larger and more lustrous at length it had come so nigh that hercules discovered it to be an immense cup or bowl made either of gold or burnished brass how it had got afloat upon the seas more than i can tell you there it was at all events rolling on the tumultuous billows which tossed it up and down and heaved their foamy tops against its sides but without ever throwing their spray over the brim i have seen many giants in my time thought hercules but never one that would need to drink his wine out of a cup like this and true enough what a cup it must have been it was as large as large but in short i'm afraid to say how immeasurably large it was to speak within bounds it was ten times larger than a great mill wheel and all of metal as it was it floated over the heaving surges more lightly than an acorn cup adown the brook the waves tumbled it onward until it grazed against the shore within a short distance of the spot where hercules was standing as soon as this happened he knew what was to be done for he had not gone through so many remarkable adventures without learning pretty well how to conduct himself whenever anything came to pass a little out of the common rule it was just as clear as daylight that this marvelous cup had been set adrift by some unseen power and guided hitherward in order to carry hercules across the sea on his way to the garden of the hesperides accordingly without a moment's delay he clambered over the brim and slid down on the inside where spreading out his lion skin he proceeded to take a little repose he had scarcely rested until now since he bade farewell to the damsels on the margin of the river the waves dashed with a pleasant and ringing sound against the circumference of the hollow cup it rocked lightly to and fro and the motion was so soothing that it speedily rocked hercules into an agreeable slumber his nap had probably lasted a good while when the cup chanced to graze against a rock and in consequence immediately resounded and reverberated through its golden or brazen substance a hundred times as loudly as ever you heard a church bell the noise awoke hercules who instantly started up and gazed around him wondering whereabouts he was he was not long in discovering that the cup had floated across a great part of the sea and was approaching the shore of what seemed to be an island and on that island what do you think he saw no you will never guess it not if you were to try fifty thousand times it positively appears to me that this was the most marvelous spectacle that had ever been seen by hercules in the whole course of his wonderful travels and adventures it was a greater marvel than the hydra with nine heads which kept growing twice as fast as they were cut off greater than the six-legged man monster greater than antaeus greater than anything that was ever beheld by anybody before or since the days of hercules or than anything that remains to be beheld by travelers in all time to come it was a giant but such an intolerably big giant a giant as tall as a mountain so vast a giant that the clouds rested about his midst like a girdle and hung like a hoary beard from his chin and flitted before his huge eyes so that he could neither see hercules nor the golden cup in which he was voyaging and most wonderful of all the giant held up his great hands and appeared to support the sky which so far as hercules could discern through the clouds was resting upon his head this does really seem almost too much to believe meanwhile the bright cup continued to float onward and finally touched the strand 
Just then a breeze wafted away the clouds from before the giant's visage, and Hercules beheld it with all its enormous features, eyes, each of them as big as yonder lake, a nose a mile long, and a mouth of the same width. It was a countenance terrible from its enormity of size, but disconsolate and weary, even as you may see the faces of many people nowadays who are compelled to sustain burdens above their strength. What the sky was to the giant, such are the cares of earth to those who let themselves be weighed down by them. And whenever men undertake what is beyond the just measure of their abilities, they encounter precisely such a doom as had befallen this poor giant. Poor fellow! He had evidently stood there a long while. An ancient forest had been growing and decaying around his feet, and oak trees of six or seven centuries old had sprung from the acorn and forced themselves between his toes. The giant now looked down from the far height of his great eyes, and perceiving Hercules, roared out in a voice that resembled thunder proceeding out of the cloud that had just flitted away from his face. Who are you down at my feet there? And whence do you come in that little cup? I am Hercules, thundered back the hero, in a voice pretty nearly or quite as loud as the giant's own, and I am seeking for the garden of the Hesperides. Ho, 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 roared the giant, in a fit of immense laughter. That is a wise adventure, truly. And why not, cried Hercules, getting a little angry at the giant's mirth. Do you think I am afraid of the dragon with a hundred heads? Well, just at this time, while they were talking together, some black clouds gathered around the giant's middle, and burst out into a tremendous storm of thunder and lightning, causing such a pother that Hercules found it impossible to distinguish a word. Only the giant's immeasurable legs were to be seen, standing up into the obscurity of the tempest, and now and then a momentary glimpse of his whole figure, mantled in a volume of mist. He seemed to be speaking most of the time, but his big, deep, rough voice chimed in with the reverberations of the thunderclaps and rolled away over the hills like them. Thus, by talking out of season, the foolish giant expended an incalculable quantity of breath to no purpose, for the thunder spoke quite as intelligibly as he. At last the storm swept over as suddenly as it had come and there again was the clear sky, and the weary giant holding it up, and the pleasant sunshine beaming over his vast height, and illuminating it against the background of the sullen thunder-clouds. So far above the shower had been his head, that not a hair of it was moistened by the raindrops. When the giant could see Hercules still standing on the seashore, he roared out to him anew, I am Atlas, the mightiest giant in the world, and I hold the sky upon my head. So I see, answered Hercules, but can you show me the way to the garden of the Hesperides? What do you want there? asked the giant. I want three of the golden apples, shouted Hercules, for my cousin the king. There is nobody but myself, quoth the giant that can go to the garden of the Hesperides and gather the golden apples. If it were not for this little business of holding up the sky, I would make half a dozen steps across the sea and get them for you. You are very kind, replied Hercules, and cannot you rest the sky upon a mountain? None of them is quite high enough, said Atlas, shaking his head. But if you were to take your stand on the summit of that nearest one, your head would be pretty nearly on a level with mine. You seem to be a fellow of some strength. What if you should take my burden on your shoulders while I do your errand for you? Hercules, as you must be careful to remember, was a remarkably strong man, and though it certainly requires a great deal of muscular power to uphold the sky, yet if any mortal could be supposed capable of such an exploit, he was the one. Nevertheless, it seemed so difficult an undertaking that for the first time in his life he hesitated. Is the sky very heavy? he inquired. Why, not particularly so at first, answered the giant, shrugging his shoulders, but it gets to be a little burdensome after a thousand years. And how long a time, asked the hero, will it take you to get the golden apples? Oh, that will be done in a few moments, cried Atlas. 
I shall take ten or fifteen miles at a stride and be at the garden and back again before your shoulders begin to ache. Well, then, answered Hercules, I will climb the mountain behind you there and relieve you of your burden. The truth is, Hercules had a kind heart of his own and considered that he should be doing the giant a favor by allowing him this opportunity for a ramble. And besides, he thought that it would be still more for his own glory if he could boast of upholding the sky than merely to do so ordinary a thing as to conquer a dragon with a hundred heads. Accordingly, without more words, the sky was shifted from the shoulders of Atlas and placed upon those of Hercules. When this was safely accomplished, the first thing that the giant did was to stretch himself, and you may imagine what a prodigious spectacle he was then. Next he slowly lifted one of his feet out of the forest that had grown up around it, then the other, then all at once he began to caper and leap and dance for joy at his freedom, flinging himself nobody knows how high into the air, and floundering down again with a shock that made the earth tremble, and then he laughed ho 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 with a thunderous roar that was echoed from the mountains far and near as if they and the giant had been so many rejoicing brothers. When his joy had a little subsided, he stepped into the sea ten miles at the first stride, which brought him mid-leg deep, and ten miles at the second, when the water came just above his knees, and ten miles more at the third, by which he was immersed nearly to his waist. This was the greatest depth of the sea. Hercules watched the giant as he still went onward, for it was really a wonderful sight, this immense human form, more than thirty miles off, half hidden in the ocean but with his upper half as tall and misty and blue as a distant mountain at last the gigantic shape faded entirely out of view and now hercules began to consider what he should do in case atlas should be drowned in the sea or if he were to be stung to death by the dragon with a hundred heads which guarded the golden apples of the hesperides if any such misfortune were to happen how could he ever get rid of the sky and by the by, its weight began already to be a little irksome to his head and shoulders. I really pity the poor giant, thought Hercules, if it wearies me so much in ten minutes. How much must it have wearied him in a thousand years? Oh, my sweet little people, you have no idea what a weight there was in that same blue sky, which looked so soft and aerial above our heads and there too was the bluster of the wind and the chill and the watery clouds and the blazing sun all taking their turns to make hercules uncomfortable he began to be afraid that the giant would never come back he gazed wistfully at the world beneath him and acknowledged to himself that it was a far happier kind of life to be a shepherd at the foot of a mountain than to stand on its dizzy summit and bear up the firmament with his might and mane for of course as you will easily understand hercules had an immense responsibility on his mind as well as a weight on his head and shoulders why if he did not stand perfectly still and keep the sky immovable the sun would perhaps be put ajar or after nightfall a great many of the stars might be loosened from their places and shower down like fiery rain upon the people's heads and how ashamed would the hero be if knowing to his unsteadiness beneath its weight the sky should crack and show a great fissure quite across it i know not how long it was before to his unspeakable joy he beheld the huge shape of the giant like a cloud on the far-off edge of the sea at his nearer approach atlas held up his hand in which hercules could perceive three magnificent golden apples as big as pumpkins all hanging from one branch i am glad to see you again shouted hercules when the giant was within hearing so you have got the golden apples certainly certainly answered atlas and very fair apples they are i took the finest that grew on the tree i assure you ah it is a beautiful spot that garden of hesperides yes and the dragon with a hundred heads is a sight worth any man seeing after all you had better have gone for the apples yourself no matter replied hercules you have had a pleasant ramble and have done the business as well as i could i heartily thank you for your trouble 
and now as i have a long way to go and am rather in a haste and as the king my cousin is anxious to receive the golden apples will you be kind enough to take the sky off my shoulders again why as to that said the giant chucking the golden apples into the air twenty miles high or thereabouts and catching them as they came down as to that my good friend i consider you a little unreasonable cannot i carry the golden apples to the king your cousin much quicker than you could as his majesty is in such a hurry to get them i promise you to take my longest strides and besides i have no fancy for burdening myself with the sky just now here hercules grew impatient and gave a great shrug of his shoulders it being now twilight you might have seen two or three stars tumble out of their places everybody on earth looked upward in a fright thinking that the sky might be going to fall next oh that will never do cried giant atlas with a great roar of laughter i have not let fall so many stars within the last five centuries by the time you've stood there as long as i did you will begin to learn patience what shouted hercules very wrathfully do you intend to make me bear this burden forever we will see about that one of these days answered the giant at all events you ought not to complain if you have to bear it the next hundred years or perhaps the next thousand i bore it a good while longer in spite of the backache well then after a thousand years if i happen to feel in the mood we may possibly shift about again you are certainly a very strong man and can never have a better opportunity to prove it posterity will talk of you i warrant it pish a fig for its talk cried hercules with another hitch of his shoulders just take the sky upon your head one instant will you i want to make a cushion of my lion skin for the weight to rest upon it really chafes me and will cause unnecessary inconvenience in so many centuries as i am to stand here well, that's no more than fair and i'll do it quoth the giant for he had no unkind feelings toward hercules and was merely acting with a too selfish consideration of his own ease for just five minutes then i'll take back the sky only for five minutes recollect i have no idea of spending another thousand years as i spent the last variety is the spice of life say i ah the thick-witted old rogue of a giant he threw down the golden apples and received back the sky from the head and shoulders of hercules upon his own where it rightly belonged and hercules picked up the three golden apples that were as big or bigger than pumpkins and straightway set out on his journey homeward without paying the slightest heed to the thundering tones of the giant who bellowed after him to come back another forest sprang up around his feet and grew ancient there and again might be seen oak trees of six or seven centuries old that had waxed thus aged betwixt his enormous toes and there stands the giant to this day or at any rate there stands a mountain as tall as he and which bears his name and when the thunder rumbles about its summit we may imagine it to be the voice of giant atlas bellowing after hercules end of section two Section 3 of Myths Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Myths Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section 3 The Pomegranate Seeds, Part 1. Mother Ceres was exceedingly fond of her daughter Proserpina, and seldom let her go alone into the fields. But, just at the time when my story begins, the good lady was very busy, because she had the care of the wheat, and the Indian corn, and the rye, and barley, and, in short, of the crops of every kind all over the earth. And as the season had thus far been uncommonly backward, it was necessary to make the harvest ripen more speedily than usual. So she put on her turban, made of poppies, a kind of flower which she was always noted for wearing, and got into her car drawn by a pair of winged dragons, and was just ready to set off. 
Dear mother, said Proserpina, I shall be very lonely while you are away. May I not run down to the shore and ask some of the sea nymphs to come up out of the waves and play with me? Yes, child, answered Mother Ceres. The sea nymphs are good creatures and will never lead you into any harm, but you must take care not to stray away from them, nor go wandering about the fields by yourself. Young girls without their mothers to take care of them are very apt to get into mischief. The child promised to be as prudent as if she were a grown-up woman, and by the time the winged dragons had whirled the car out of sight, she was already on the shore, calling to the sea nymphs to come and play with her. They knew Proserpina's voice, and were not long in showing their glistening faces and sea-green hair above the water, at the bottom of which was their home. They brought along with them a great many beautiful shells, and sitting down on the moist sand, where the surf wave broke over them, they busied themselves in making a necklace which they hung around Proserpina's neck. By way of showing her gratitude, the child besought them to go with her a little way into the fields, so that they might gather abundance of flowers, with which she would make each of her kind playmates a wreath. "'Oh, no, dear Proserpina,' cried the sea nymphs, "'we dare not go with you upon the dry land.' We are apt to grow faint, unless at every breath we can snuff up the salt breeze of the ocean. And don't you see how careful we are to let the surf wave break over us every moment or two, so as to keep ourselves comfortably moist? If it were not for that, we should soon look like bunches of uprooted seaweed dried in the sun. It is a great pity, said Proserpina, but do you wait for me here, and I will run and gather my apron full of flowers, and be back again before the surf wave has broken ten times over you. I long to make you some wreaths that shall be as lovely as this necklace of many-coloured shells. We will wait, then, answered the sea nymphs, but while you are gone we may as well lie down on a bank of soft sponge under the water. The air today is a little too dry for our comfort, but we will pop up our heads every few minutes to see if you are coming. The young Proserpina ran quickly to a spot where, only the day before, she had seen a great many flowers. These, however, were now a little past their bloom, and wishing to give her friends the freshest and loveliest blossoms, she strayed farther into the fields, and found some that made her scream with delight. Never had she met with such exquisite flowers before, violets so large and fragrant, roses with so rich and delicate a blush, such superb hyacinths, and such aromatic pinks, and many others, some of which seemed to be of new shapes and colours. Two or three times, moreover, she could not help thinking that a tuft of most splendid flowers had suddenly sprouted out of the earth before her very eyes, as if on purpose to tempt her a few steps farther. Proserpina's apron was soon filled and brimming over with delightful blossoms. She was on the point of turning back, in order to rejoin the sea nymphs and sit with them on the moist sands, all twining wreaths together. But, a little farther on, what should she behold? It was a large shrub, completely covered with the most magnificent flowers in the world. "'The darlings!' cried Posepina, and then she thought to herself, "'I was looking at that spot only a moment ago. How strange it is that I did not see the flowers!' The nearer she approached the shrub, the more attractive it looked, until she came quite close to it, and then, although its beauty was richer than words can tell, she hardly knew whether to like it or not. It bore above a hundred flowers of the most brilliant hues, and each different from the others, but all having a kind of resemblance among themselves, which showed them to be sister blossoms. But there was a deep, glossy luster on the leaves of the shrub, and on the petals of the flowers, that made Proserpina doubt whether they might not be poisonous. To tell you the truth, foolish as it may seem, she was half inclined to turn round and run away. "'What a silly child I am,' thought she, taking courage. "'It is really the most beautiful shrub that ever sprang out of the earth. I will pull it up by the roots and carry it home, and plant it in my mother's garden.' Holding her apron full of flowers with her left hand, Proserpina seized the large shrub with the other, and pulled and pulled, but it was hardly able to loosen the soil about its roots. What a deep-rooted plant it was! Again the girl pulled with all her might, 
and observed that the earth began to stir and crack to some distance around the stem. She gave another pull, but relaxed her hold, fancying that there was a rumbling sound right beneath her feet. Did the roots extend down into some enchanted cavern? Then, laughing at herself for so childish a notion, she made another effort. Up came the shrub, and Proserpina staggered back, holding the stem triumphantly in her hand, and gazing at the deep hole which its roots had left in the soil. Much to her astonishment, this hole kept spreading wider and wider, and growing deeper and deeper, until it really seemed to have no bottom, and all the while there came a rumbling noise out of its depths, louder and louder, and nearer and nearer, and sounding like the tramp of horses' hoofs and the rattling of wheels. Too much frightened to run away, she stood straining her eyes into this wonderful cavity, and soon saw a team of four sable horses snorting smoke out of their nostrils and tearing their way out of the earth, with a splendid golden chariot whirling at their heels. They leaped out of the bottomless hole, chariot and all, and there they were, tossing their black manes, flourishing their black tails, and curveting with every one of their hooves off the ground at once, close by the spot where Proserpina stood. In the chariot sat the figure of a man, richly dressed, with a crown on his head, all flaming with diamonds. He was of a noble aspect, and rather handsome, but looked sullen and discontented, and he kept rubbing his eyes and shading them with his hand, as if he did not live enough in the sunshine to be very fond of its light. As soon as this personage saw the affrighted Proserpina, he beckoned her to come a little nearer. "'Do not be afraid,' said he, with as cheerful a smile as he knew how to put on. "'Come, will you not like to ride a little way with me in my beautiful chariot?' But Proserpina was so alarmed that she wished for nothing but to get out of his reach, and no wonder. The stranger did not look remarkably good-natured, in spite of his smile, and as for his voice, its tones were deep and stern, and sounded as much like the rumbling of an earthquake underground as anything else. As is always the case with children in trouble, Proserpina's first thought was to call for her mother. "'Mother! Mother Ceres!' cried she, all in a tremble. "'Come quickly and save me!' But her voice was too faint for her mother to hear. Indeed, it is most probable that Ceres was then a thousand miles off, making the corn grow in some far distant country. Nor could it have availed her poor daughter, even had she been within hearing, for no sooner did Proserpina begin to cry out than the stranger leaped to the ground, caught the child in his arms, and again mounting the chariot, shook the reins and shouted to the four horses to set off. They immediately broke into so swift a gallop that it seemed rather like flying through the air than running along the earth. In a moment, Proserpina lost sight of the pleasant vale of Enna in which she had always dwelt. Another instant, and even the summit of Mount Etna had become so blue in the distance that she could scarcely distinguish it from the smoke that gushed out of its crater. But still the poor child screamed and scattered her full apron of flowers along the way, and left a long cry trailing behind the chariot. And many mothers, to whose ears it came, ran quickly to see if any mischief had befallen their children. But Mother Ceres was a great way off, and could not hear the cry. As they rode on, the stranger did his best to soothe her. "'Why should you be so frightened, my pretty child?' said he, trying to soften his rough voice. "'I promise not to do you any harm. What, you have been gathering flowers? Wait till we come to my palace, and I will give you a garden full of prettier flowers than those, all made of pearls and diamonds and rubies. Can you guess who I am? They call my name Pluto, and I am the king of diamonds and all other precious stones.' Every atom of the gold and silver that lies under the earth belongs to me, to say nothing of the copper and iron, and of the coal mines which supply me with abundance of fuel. Do you see this splendid crown upon my head? You may have it for a plaything. Oh, we shall be very good friends, and you will find me more agreeable than you expect, when once we get out of this troublesome sunshine. Let me go home, cried Proserpina. Let me go home. "'My home is better than your mother's,' answered King Pluto. "'It is a palace, all made of gold, with crystal windows, 
and because there is little or no sunshine thereabouts, the apartments are illuminated with diamond lamps. You never saw anything half so magnificent as my throne. If you like, you may sit down on it, and be my little queen, and I will sit on the footstool. I don't care for golden palaces and thrones, sobbed Proserpina. Oh, my mother, my mother, carry me back to my mother. But King Pluto, as he called himself, only shouted to his steeds to go faster. Pray do not be foolish, Proserpina, said he, in rather a sullen tone. I offer you my palace and my crown, and all the riches that are under the earth, and you treat me as if I were doing you an injury. The one thing which my palace needs is a merry little maid to run upstairs and down, and cheer up the rooms with her smile, and this is what you must do for King Pluto. Never, answered Proserpina, looking as miserable as she could. I shall never smile again till you set me down at my mother's door. But she might just as well have talked to the wind that whistled past them, for Pluto urged on his horses and went faster than ever. Proserpina continued to cry out, and screamed so long and so loudly that her poor little voice was almost screamed away, and when it was nothing but a whisper, she happened to cast her eyes over a great broad field of waving grain, and whom do you think she saw? Whom but Mother Ceres making the corn grow, and too busy to notice the golden chariot as it went rattling along? The child mustered all her strength, and gave one more scream, but was out of sight before Ceres had time to turn her head. King Pluto had taken a road which now began to grow excessively gloomy. It was bordered on each side by rocks and precipices, between which the rumbling of the chariot wheels was reverberated with a noise like rolling thunder. The trees and bushes that grew in the crevices of the rocks had very dismal foliage, and by and by, although it was hardly noon, the air became obscured with a grey twilight. The black horses had rushed along so swiftly that they were already beyond the limits of the sunshine, but the duskier it grew, the more did Pluto's visage assume an air of satisfaction. After all, he was not an ill-looking person, especially when he left off twisting his features into a smile that did not belong to them. Proserpina peeped at his face through the gathering dusk, and hoped that he might not be so very wicked as she at first thought him. "'Ah, this twilight is truly refreshing,' said King Pluto, after being so tormented with that ugly and impertinent glare of the sun. How much more agreeable is lamplight or torchlight, more particularly when reflected from diamonds? It will be a magnificent sight when we get to my palace. Is it much farther? asked Proserpina. And will you carry me back when I have seen it? We will talk of that by and by, answered Pluto. We are just entering my dominions. Do you see that tall gateway before us? When we pass those gates, we are at home, and there lies my faithful mastiff at the threshold. Cerberus, Cerberus, come hither, my good dog. So saying, Pluto pulled at the reins and stopped the chariot right between the tall, massive pillars of the gateway. The mastiff of which he had spoken got up from the threshold and stood on his hinder legs, so as to put his forepaws on the chariot wheel. But my stars, what a strange dog it was! Why, he was a big, rough, ugly-looking monster, with three separate heads, and each of them fiercer than the two others. But fierce as they were, King Pluto patted them all. He seemed as fond of his three-headed dog as if he had been a sweet little spaniel with silken ears and curly hair. Cerberus, on the other hand, was evidently rejoiced to see his master, and expressed his attachment as other dogs do by wagging his tail at great rate. Proserpina's eyes being drawn to it by its brisk motion, she saw that his tail was neither more nor less than a live dragon, with fiery eyes and fangs that had a very poisonous aspect. And while the three-headed Cerberus was fawning so lovingly on King Pluto, there was the dragon tail wagging against its will, and looking as cross and ill-natured as you can imagine, on its own separate account. "'Will the dog bite me?' asked Proserpina, shrinking closer to Pluto. "'What an ugly creature he is!' "'Oh, never fear,' answered her companion. "'He never harms people unless they try to enter my dominions without being sent for, "'or to get away when I wish to keep them here. "'Down, Cerberus! 
Now, my pretty Proserpina, we will drive on. On went the chariot, and King Pluto seemed greatly pleased to find himself once more in his own kingdom. He drew Proserpina's attention to the rich veins of gold that were to be seen among the rocks, and pointed to several places where one stroke of a pickaxe would loosen a bushel of diamonds. All along the road, indeed, there were sparkling gems, which would have been of inestimable value above ground, but which were here reckoned of the meaner sort and hardly worth a beggar's stooping for. Not far from the gateway they came to a bridge which seemed to be built of iron. Pluto stopped the chariot and bade Proserpina look at the stream which was gliding so lazily beneath it. Never in her life had she beheld so torpid, so black, so muddy-looking a stream. Its waters reflected no images of anything that was on the banks, and it moved as sluggishly as if it had quite forgotten which way it ought to flow, and had rather stagnate than flow either one way or the other. "'This is the river Lethe,' observed King Pluto. "'Is it not a very pleasant stream?' "'I think it a very dismal one,' said Proserpina. "'It suits my taste, however,' answered Pluto, who was apt to be sullen when anybody disagreed with him. "'At all events, its water has one very excellent quality, "'for a single draught of it makes people forget every care and sorrow "'that has hitherto tormented them. "'Only sip a little of it, my dear Proserpina, "'and you will instantly cease to grieve for your mother.' and will have nothing in your memory that can prevent you of being perfectly happy in my palace. I will send for some in a golden goblet the moment we arrive. Oh, no, 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 cried Proserpina, weeping afresh. I had a thousand times rather be miserable with remembering my mother than be happy in forgetting her. That dear, dear mother, I never, never will forget her. "'We shall see,' said King Pluto. "'You do not know what fine times we will have in my palace. "'Here we are just at the portal. "'These pillars are solid gold, I assure you.' "'He alighted from the chariot, and taking Proserpina in his arms, "'carried her up a lofty flight of steps into the great hall of the palace. "'It was splendidly illuminated by means of large precious stones of various hues, "'which seemed to burn like so many lamps.' and glowed with a hundredfold radiance all through the vast apartment. And yet there was a kind of gloom in the midst of this enchanted light, nor was there a single object in the hall that was really agreeable to behold, except the little Proserpina herself, a lovely child, with one earthly flower which she had not let fall from her hand. It is my opinion that even King Pluto had never been happy in his palace, and that this was the true reason why he had stolen away Proserpina, in order that he might have something to love, instead of cheating his heart any longer with this tiresome magnificence. And though he pretended to dislike the sunshine of the upper world, yet the effect of the child's presence, bedimmed as she was by her tears, was as if a faint and watery sunbeam had somehow or other found its way into the enchanted hall. Pluto now summoned his domestics, and bade them lose no time in preparing a most sumptuous banquet, and above all things not to fail of setting a golden beaker of the water of Lethe by Proserpina's plate. "'I will neither drink that nor anything else,' said Proserpina, "'nor will I taste a morsel of food, even if you keep me for ever in your palace.' "'I should be sorry for that,' replied King Pluto, patting her cheek, "'for he really wished to be kind.' "'if he had only known how. "'You are a spoiled child, I perceive, my little Proserpina, "'but when you see the nice things which my cook will make for you, "'your appetite will quickly come again.' "'Then, sending for the head cook, he gave strict orders "'that all sorts of delicacies, such as young people are usually fond of, "'should be set before Proserpina. "'He had a secret motive in this, for, you are to understand, "'it is a fixed law that, when persons are carried off to the land of magic, if they once taste any food there, they can never get back to their friends. Now, if King Pluto had been cunning enough to offer Proserpina some fruit, or bread and milk, which was the simplest fare to which the child had always been accustomed, it is very probable that she would soon have been tempted to eat it. But he left the matter entirely to his cook, who, like all other cooks, considered nothing fit to eat unless it were rich pastry or highly seasoned meat, or spiced sweet cakes, things which Proserpina's mother had never given her, 
and the smell of which quite took away her appetite instead of sharpening it. End of section three. Section four of Myths Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Myths Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section 4. The Pomegranate Seeds, Part 2. But my story must now clamber out of King Pluto's dominions, and see what Mother Ceres has been about since she was bereft of her daughter. We had a glimpse of her, as you remember, half hidden among the waving grain, while the four black steeds were swiftly whirling along the chariot in which her beloved Proserpina was so unwillingly borne away. You recollect, too, the loud scream which Proserpina gave, just when the chariot was out of sight. Of all the child's outcries, this last shriek was the only one that reached the ears of Mother Ceres. She had mistaken the rumbling of the chariot wheels for a peal of thunder, and imagined that a shower was coming up, and that it would assist her in making the corn grow. But at the sound of Proserpina's shriek she started, and looked about in every direction, not knowing whence it came, but feeling almost certain that it was her daughter's voice. It seemed so unaccountable, however, that the girl should have strayed over so many lands and seas, which she herself could not have traversed without the aid of her winged dragons, that the good Ceres tried to believe that it must be the child of some other parent, and not her own darling Proserpina, who had uttered this lamentable cry. Nevertheless, it troubled her, with a vast many tender fears, such as are ready to bestir themselves in every mother's heart, when she finds it necessary to go away from her dear children, without leaving them under the care of some maiden aunt or other such faithful guardian. So she quickly left the field in which she had been so busy, and as her work was not half done, the grain looked next day as if it needed both sun and rain, and as if it were blighted in the ear and had something the matter with its roots. The pair of dragons must have had very nimble wings, for in less than an hour Mother Ceres had alighted at the door of her home and found it empty. Knowing, however, that the child was fond of sporting on the seashore, she hastened thither as fast as she could, and there beheld the wet faces of the poor sea-nymphs peeping over a wave. All this while the good creatures had been waiting on the bank of sponge, and, once every half-minute or so, had popped up their four heads above water, to see if their playmate were yet coming back. When they saw Mother Ceres, they sat down on the crest of the surf-wave, and let it toss them ashore at her feet. "'Where is Proserpina?' cried Ceres. "'Where is my child? Tell me, you naughty sea-nymphs, have you enticed her under the sea?' "'Oh, no, good Mother Ceres,' said the innocent sea-nymphs, tossing back their green ringlets, and looking her in the face. We never should dream of such a thing. Proserpina has been at play with us, it is true, but she left us a long while ago, meaning only to run a little way upon the dry land and gather some flowers for a wreath. This was early in the day, and we have seen nothing of her since. Ceres scarcely waited to hear what the nymphs had to say before she hurried off to make inquiries all through the neighbourhood. But nobody told her anything, that could enable the poor mother to guess what had become of Proserpina. A fisherman, it is true, had noticed her little footprints in the sand, as he went homeward along the beach with a basket of fish. A rustic had seen the child stooping to gather flowers. Several persons had heard either the rattling of chariot wheels or the rumbling of distant thunder, and one old woman, while plucking vervain and catnip, had heard a scream, but supposed it to be some childish nonsense, and therefore did not take the trouble to look up. The stupid people! It took them such a tedious while to tell the nothing that they knew, that it was dark night before Mother Ceres found out that she must seek her daughter elsewhere. So she lighted a torch and set forth, resolving never to come back until Proserpina was discovered. In her haste and trouble of mind, she quite forgot her car and the winged dragons, 
or, it may be, she thought that she could follow up the search more thoroughly on foot. At all events, this was the way in which she began her sorrowful journey, holding the torch before her, and looking carefully at every object along the path. And as it happened, she had not gone far before she found one of the magnificent flowers which grew on the shrub that Proserpina had pulled up. Ha! thought Mother Ceres, examining it by torchlight. Here is mischief in this flower. The earth did not produce it by any help of mine, nor of its own accord. It is the work of enchantment, and is therefore poisonous, and perhaps it has poisoned my poor child. But she put the poisonous flower in her bosom, not knowing whether she might ever find any other memorial of Proserpina. All night long, at the door of every cottage and farmhouse, Ceres knocked and called up the weary labourers to inquire if they had seen her child, and they stood gaping and half asleep at their threshold, and answered her pityingly, and besought her to come in and rest. At the portal of every palace, too, she made so loud a summons that the menials hurried to throw open the gate, thinking that it must be some great king or queen, who would demand a banquet for supper and a stately chamber to repose in. And when they saw only a sad and anxious woman, with a torch in her hand and a wreath of withered poppies on her head, they spoke rudely and sometimes threatened to set the dogs upon her, but nobody had seen Proserpina, nor could give Mother Ceres the least hint which waged to seek her. Thus passed the night, and still she continued her search without sitting down to rest, or stopping to take food, or even remembering to put out the torch. Although first the rosy dawn, and then the glad light of the morning sun, made its red flame look thin and pale. But I wonder what sort of stuff this torch was made of, for it burned dimly through the day, and at night was as bright as ever, and never was extinguished by the rain or wind in all the weary days and nights while Ceres was seeking for Proserpina. It was not merely of human beings that she asked tidings of her daughter. In the woods and by the stream she met creatures of another nature, who used in those old times to haunt the pleasant and solitary places, and were very sociable with persons who understood their language and customs, as Mother Ceres did. Sometimes, for instance, she tapped with her finger against the knotted trunk of a majestic oak, and immediately its rude bark would cleave asunder, and forth would step a beautiful maiden, who was the hamadryad of the oak, dwelling inside it, and sharing its long life, and rejoicing when its green leaves sported with the breeze. But not one of these leafy damsels had seen Proserpina. Then, going a little further, Ceres would, perhaps, come to a fountain gushing out of a pebbly hollow in the earth, and would dabble with her hand in the water. Behold, up through its sandy and pebbly bed, along with the fountain's gush, a young woman with dripping hair would arise, and stand gazing at Mother Ceres half out of the water, and undulating up and down with its ever-restless motion. But when the mother asked whether the poor lost child had stopped to drink out of the fountain, the naiad, with weeping eyes, for these water-nymphs had tears to spare for everybody's grief, would answer, No, in a murmuring voice, which was just like the murmur of the stream. Often, likewise, she encountered fawns, who looked like sunburnt country people, except that they had hairy ears, and little horns upon their foreheads, and the hinder legs of goats, on which they gambled merrily about the woods and fields. They were a frolicsome kind of creature, but grew as sad as their cheerful dispositions would allow when Ceres inquired for her daughter, and they had no good news to tell. But sometimes she came suddenly upon a rude gang of satyrs, who had faces like monkeys and horses' tails behind them, and who were generally dancing in a very boisterous manner, with shouts of noisy laughter. When she stopped to question them, they would only laugh the louder and make new merriment out of the lone woman's distress. How unkind of those ugly satyrs! And once, while crossing a solitary sheep pasture, she saw a personage named Pan, seated at the foot of the tall rock, and making music on a shepherd's flute. He, too, had horns and hairy ears and goat's feet, but, being acquainted with Mother Ceres, he answered her question as civilly as he knew how, and invited her to taste some milk and honey out of a wooden bowl. But neither could Pan tell her what had become of Proserpina, any better than the rest of these wild people. And thus Mother Ceres went wandering about, 
for nine long days and nights, finding no trace of Proserpina, unless it were now and then a withered flower, and these she picked up and put in her bosom, because she fancied that they might have fallen from her poor child's hand. All day she travelled onward through the hot sun, and at night again the flame of the torch would redden and gleam along the pathway, and she continued her search by its light without ever sitting down to rest. On the tenth day she chanced to espy the mouth of a cavern, within which, though it was bright noon everywhere else, there would have been only a dusky twilight, but it so happened that a torch was burning there. It flickered and struggled with the duskiness, but could not half light up the gloomy cavern with all its melancholy glimmer. Ceres was resolved to leave no spot without a search, so she peeped into the entrance of the cave, and lighted it up a little more by holding her own torch before her. In so doing, she caught a glimpse of what seemed to be a woman, sitting on the brown leaves of the last autumn, a great heap of which had been swept into the cave by the wind. This woman, if woman it were, was by no means so beautiful as many of her sex, for her head, they tell me, was shaped very much like a dog's, and, by way of ornament, she wore a wreath of snakes around it. But Mother Ceres, the moment she saw her, knew that this was an odd kind of person, who put all her enjoyment in being miserable, and never would have a word to say to other people, unless they were as melancholy and wretched as she herself delighted to be. "'I am wretched enough now,' thought poor Ceres, "'to talk with this melancholy Hecate, "'were she ten times sadder than ever she was yet.' So she stepped into the cave and sat down on the withered leaves by the dog-headed woman's side. In all the world, since her daughter's loss, she had found no other companion. "'Oh, Hecate,' she said, "'if ever you lose a daughter, you will know what sorrow is. Tell me, for pity's sake, have you seen my poor child Proserpina pass by the mouth of your cavern?' "'No,' answered Hecate, in a cracked voice and sighing betwixt every word or two. "'No, Mother Ceres.' I have seen nothing of your daughter, but my ears, you must know, are made in such a way that all cries of distress and affright all over the world are pretty sure to find their way to them. And nine days ago, as I sat in my cave, making myself very miserable, I heard the voice of a young girl shrieking as if in great distress. Something terrible has happened to the child, you may rest assured. As well as I could judge, a dragon or some other cruel monster was carrying her away. "'You kill me by saying so,' cried Ceres, almost ready to faint. "'Where was the sound, and which way did it seem to go?' "'It passed very swiftly along,' said Hecate, "'and at the same time there was a heavy rumbling of wheels towards the eastward. "'I can tell you nothing more, except that, in my honest opinion, "'you will never see your daughter again. "'The best advice I can give you is to take up your abode in this cavern,' where we will be the two most wretched women in the world. Not yet, dark Hecate, replied Ceres, but do you first come with your torch and help me to seek for my lost child, and when there shall be no more hope of finding her, if that black day is ordained to come, then, if you will give me room to fling myself down, either on these withered leaves or on the naked rock, I will show you what it is to be miserable. But until I know that she has perished from the face of the earth, I will not allow myself space even to grieve. The dismal Hecate did not much like the idea of going abroad into the sunny world, but then she reflected that the sorrow of the disconsolate Ceres would be like a gloomy twilight round about them both, let the sun shine ever so brightly, and that therefore she might enjoy her bad spirits quite as well as if she were to stay in the cave. So she finally consented to go, and they set out together, both carrying torches, although it was broad daylight and clear sunshine. The torchlight seemed to make a gloom, so that the people whom they met along the road could not very distinctly see their figures, and indeed if they once caught a glimpse of Hecate, with the wreath of snakes around her forehead, they generally thought it prudent to run away without waiting for a second glance. As the pair travelled along in this woe-begone manner, a thought struck Ceres, "'There is one person,' she exclaimed, "'who must have seen my poor child, "'and can doubtless tell what has become of her. "'Why did I not think of him before? "'It is Phoebus.' "'What?' said Hecate. "'The young man that always sits in the sunshine, 
Oh, pray do not think of going near him. He is a gay, light, frivolous young fellow, and will only smile in your face, and besides there is such a glare of the sun about him that he will quite blind my poor eyes, which I have almost wept away already. You have promised to be my companion, answered Ceres. Come, let us make haste, or the sunshine will be gone and Phoebus along with it. Accordingly they went along in quest of Phoebus, both of them sighing grievously, and Hecate, to say the truth, making a great deal worse lamentation than Ceres, for all the pleasure she had, you know, lay in being miserable, and therefore she made the most of it. By and by, after a pretty long journey, they arrived at the sunniest spot in the whole world. There they beheld a beautiful young man with long, curling ringlets, which seemed to be made of golden sunbeams. His garments were like light summer clouds, and the expression of his face was so exceedingly vivid that Hecate held her hands before her eyes, muttering that he ought to wear a black veil. Phoebus, for this was the very person whom they were seeking, had a lyre in his hands, and was making its chords tremble with sweet music, at the same time singing a most exquisite song, which he had recently composed, for, besides a great many other accomplishments, this young man was renowned for his admirable poetry. As Ceres and her dismal companion approached him, Phoebus smiled on them so cheerfully that Hecate's wreath of snakes gave a spiteful hiss, and Hecate heartily wished herself back in her cave. But as for Ceres, she was too earnest in her grief either to know or care whether Phoebus smiled or frowned. Phoebus, exclaimed she, I am in great trouble and have come to you for assistance. Can you tell me what has become of my dear child Proserpina? Proserpina? Proserpina, did you call her name? answered Phoebus, endeavouring to recollect for there was such a continual flow of pleasant ideas in his mind that he was apt to forget what had happened no longer ago than yesterday. Ah, oh, yes, I remember her now, a very lovely child indeed. I am happy to tell you, my dear madam, that I did see the little Proserpina not many days ago. You may make yourself perfectly easy about her. She is safe and in excellent hands. Oh, where is my dear child? cried Ceres, clasping her hands and flinging herself at his feet. Why, said Phoebus, and as he spoke, he kept touching his lyre so as to make a thread of music run in and out among his words. As the little damsel was gathering flowers, and she really has a very exquisite taste for flowers, she was suddenly snatched up by King Pluto and carried off to his dominions. I have never been in that part of the universe, but the royal palace, I am told, is built in a very noble style of architecture, and of the most splendid and costly materials. Gold, diamonds, pearls, and all manner of precious stones will be your daughter's ordinary playthings. I recommend to you, my dear lady, to give yourself no uneasiness. Proserpina's sense of beauty will be duly gratified, and, even in spite of the lack of sunshine, she will lead a very enviable life. Hush! Say not a word, answered Ceres indignantly. What is there to gratify her heart? What are all the splendours you speak of without affection? I must have her back again. Will you go with me, Phoebus, to demand my daughter of this wicked Pluto? Pray excuse me, replied Phoebus, with an elegant obeisance. I certainly wish you success, and regret that my own affairs are so immediately pressing that I cannot have the pleasure of attending you. Besides, I am not upon the best of terms with King Pluto. To tell you the truth, his three-headed mastiff would never let me pass the gateway, for I should be compelled to take a sheaf of sunbeams along with me, and those, you know, are forbidden things in Pluto's kingdom. Ah, oh, Phoebus, said Ceres, with bitter meaning in her words, you have a harp instead of a heart. Farewell. Will you not stay a moment, asked Phoebus, to hear me turn the pretty and touching story of Proserpina into extemporary verse? But Ceres shook her head, and hastened away along with Hecate. Phoebus, who, as I have told you, was an exquisite poet, forthwith began to make an ode about the poor mother's grief, and if we were to judge of his sensibility by this beautiful production, he must have been endowed with a very tender heart. But when a poet gets into the habit of using his heart-strings to make chords for his lyre, he may thrum upon them as much as he will, without any great pain to himself. Accordingly, 
though Phoebus sang a very sad song, he was as merry all the while as were the sunbeams amid which he dwelt. Poor Mother Ceres had now found out what had become of her daughter, but was not a whit happier than before. Her case, on the contrary, looked more desperate than ever. As long as Proserpina was above ground, there might have been hopes of regaining her. But now that the poor child was shut up within the iron gates of the King of the Mines, at the threshold of which lay the three-headed Cerberus, there seemed no possibility of her ever making her escape. The dismal Hecate, who loved to take the darkest view of things, told Ceres that she had better come with her to the cavern, and spend the rest of her life in being miserable. Ceres answered that Hecate was welcome to go back thither herself, but that, for her part, she would wander about the earth in quest of the entrance to King Pluto's dominions. And Hecate took her at her word, and hurried back to her beloved cave, frightening a great many little children with a glimpse of her dog's face as she went. Poor Mother Ceres, it is melancholy to think of her pursuing her toilsome way all alone, and holding up that never-dying torch, the flame of which seemed an emblem of the grief and hope that burned together in her heart. So much did she suffer that, though her aspect had been quite youthful when her troubles began, she grew to look like an elderly person in a very brief time. She cared not how she was dressed, nor had she ever thought of flinging away the wreath of withered poppies, which she put on the very morning of Proserpina's disappearance. She roamed about in so wild a way, and with her hair so dishevelled, that people took her for some distracted creature, and never dreamed that it was Mother Ceres who had the oversight of every seed which the husbandman planted. Nowadays, however, she gave herself no trouble about seed-time, nor harvest, but left the farmers to take care of their own affairs, and the crops to fade or flourish, as the case might be. There was nothing now in which Ceres seemed to feel an interest, unless when she saw children at play or gathering flowers along the wayside. Then, indeed, she would stand and gaze at them with tears in her eyes. The children, too, appeared to have a sympathy with her grief, and would cluster themselves in a little group about her knees, and look up wistfully in her face, and Ceres, after giving them a kiss all round, would lead them to their homes and advise their mothers never to let them stray out of sight. For if they do, said she, it may happen to you, as it happened to me, that the iron-hearted King Pluto will take a liking to your darlings, and snatch them up in his chariot, and carry them away. One day, during her pilgrimage in quest of the entrance to Pluto's kingdom, she came to the palace of King Celius, who reigned at Eleusis. Ascending a lofty flight of steps, she entered the portal, and found the royal household in very great alarm about the queen's baby. The infant, it seems, was sickly, being troubled with its teeth, I suppose, and would take no food, and was all the time moaning with pain. The queen, her name was Metanira, was desirous of finding a nurse, and when she beheld a woman of matronly aspect coming up the palace steps, she thought in her own mind that here was the very person whom she needed. So Queen Metanira ran to the door, with the poor wailing baby in her arms, and besought Ceres to take charge of it, at least to tell her what would do it good. "'Will you trust the child entirely to me?' asked Ceres. "'Yes, and gladly too,' answered the Queen, "'if you will devote all your time to him, for I can see that you have been a mother.' "'You are right,' said Ceres. "'I once had a child of my own. "'Well, I will be the nurse of this poor, sickly boy, "'but beware, I warn you, that you do not interfere.' "'with any kind of treatment which I may judge proper for him. "'If you do so, the poor infant must suffer for his mother's folly.' "'Then she kissed the child, and it seemed to do him good, "'for he smiled and nestled closely into her bosom. "'So Mother Ceres set her torch in a corner, "'where it kept burning all the while, "'and took up her abode in the palace of King Celius, "'as nurse to the little prince de Mophoon. She treated him as if he were her own child, and allowed neither the king nor the queen to say whether he should be bathed in warm or cold water, or what he should eat, or how often he should take the air, or when he should be put to bed. You would hardly believe me if I were to tell how quickly the baby prince got rid of his ailments, and grew fat and rosy and strong, and how he had two rows of ivory teeth in less time than any other little fellow, 
before or since. Instead of the palest and wretchedest and puniest imp in the world, as his own mother confessed him to be when Ceres first took him in charge, he was now a strapping baby, crowing, laughing, kicking up his heels, and rolling from one end of the room to the other. All the good women of the neighbourhood crowded to the palace, and held up their hands in unutterable amazement at the beauty and wholesomeness of this darling little prince. Their wonder was the greater, because he was never seen to taste any food, not even so much as a cup of milk. "'Pray, nurse,' the queen kept saying, "'how is it that you make the child thrive so?' "'I was a mother once,' Ceres always replied, "'and having nursed my own child, I know what other children need.' But Queen Metanira, as was very natural, had a great curiosity to know precisely what the nurse did to her child. One night, therefore, she hid herself in the chamber where Ceres and the little prince were accustomed to sleep. There was a fire in the chimney, and it had now crumbled into great coals and embers, which lay glowing on the hearth, with a blaze flickering up now and then, and flinging a warm and ruddy light upon the walls. Ceres sat before the hearth with the child in her lap, and the firelight making her shadow dance upon the ceiling overhead. She undressed the little prince and bathed him all over with some fragrant liquid out of a vase. The next thing she did was to rake back the red embers and make a hollow place among them, just where the backlog had been. At last, when the baby was crowing and clapping his fat little hands, and laughing in the nurse's face, just as you may have seen your little brother or sister do before going into its warm bath, Ceres suddenly laid him, all naked as he was, in the hollow among the red-hot embers. She then raked the ashes over him, and turned quietly away. You may imagine, if you can, how Queen Metanira shrieked, thinking nothing less than that her dear child would be burned to a cinder. She burst forth from her hiding-place, and running to the hearth, raked open the fire, and snatched up poor little Prince de Mofawam, out of his bed of live coals, one of which he was gripping in each of his fists. He immediately set up a grievous cry, as babies are apt to do, when rudely startled out of a sound sleep. To the Queen's astonishment and joy, she could perceive no token of the child's being injured by the hot fire in which he had lain. She now turned to Mother Ceres and asked her to explain the mystery. "'Foolish woman,' answered Ceres, "'did you not promise to entrust this poor infant entirely to me? "'You little know the mischief you have done him. "'Had you left him to my care, "'he would have grown up like a child of celestial birth, "'endowed with human strength and intelligence, "'and would have lived for ever. "'Do you imagine that earthly children are to become immortal "'without being tempered to it in the fiercest heat of the fire? "'But you have ruined your own son.' For though he will be a strong man and a hero in his day, yet on account of your folly he will grow old and finally die like the sons of other women. The weak tenderness of his mother has cost the poor baby an immortality. Farewell. Saying these words, she kissed the little prince de Mofawam and sighed to think what he had lost, and took her departure without heeding Queen Metanira, who entreated her to remain and cover up the child among the hot embers as often as she pleased. Poor baby, he never slept so warmly again. End of section four. Section five of Myths Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Myths Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section 5. The Pomegranate Seeds, Part 3. While she dwelt in the King's Palace, Mother Ceres had been so continually occupied with taking care of the young prince that her heart was a little lightened of its grief for Proserpina. But now, having nothing else to busy herself about, she became just as wretched as before. At length, in her despair, she came to the dreadful resolution that not a stalk of grain, nor a blade of grass, not a potato, nor a turnip, nor any other vegetable that was good for man or beast to eat, should be suffered to grow until her daughter was restored. 
She even forbade the flowers to bloom, lest somebody's heart should be cheered by their beauty. Now, as not so much as a head of asparagus ever presumed to poke itself out of the ground without the especial permission of Ceres, you may conceive what a terrible calamity had here befallen upon the earth. The husbandmen ploughed and planted as usual, but there lay the rich black furrows, all as barren as a desert of sand. The pastures looked as brown in the sweet month of June as ever they did in chill November. The rich man's broad acres and the cottager's small garden patch were equally blighted. Every little girl's flower bed showed nothing but dry stalks. The old people shook their white heads and said that the earth had grown aged like themselves and was no longer capable of wearing the warm smile of summer on its face. It was really piteous to see the poor, starving cattle and sheep, how they followed behind Ceres, lowing and bleating, as if their instinct taught them to expect help from her. And everybody that was acquainted with her power besought her to have mercy on the human race, and, at all events, to let the grass grow. But Mother Ceres, though naturally of an affectionate disposition, was now inexorable. Never, said she, if the earth is ever again to see any verdure, it must first grow along the path which my daughter will tread in coming back to me. Finally, as there seemed to be no other remedy, our old friend Quicksilver was sent post-haste to King Pluto, in hopes that he might be persuaded to undo the mischief he had done, and to set everything right again by giving up Proserpina. Quicksilver accordingly made the best of his way to the great gate, took a flying leap right over the three-headed mastiff, and stood at the door of the palace in an inconceivably short time. The servants knew him both by his face and garb, for his short cloak and his winged cap and shoes, and his snaky staff had often been seen thereabouts in times gone by. He requested to be shown immediately into the king's presence, and Pluto, who heard his voice from the top of the stairs, and who loved to recreate himself with Quicksilver's merry talk, called out to him to come up, and while they settled their business together, we must inquire what Proserpina has been doing ever since we saw her last. The child had declared, as you may remember, that she would not taste a mouthful of food as long as she should be compelled to remain in King Pluto's palace. How she contrived to maintain her resolution, and at the same time to keep herself tolerably plump and rosy, is more than I can explain. But some young ladies, I am given to understand, possess the faculty of living on air, and Proserpina seems to have possessed it too. At any rate, it was now six months since she left the outside of the earth, and not a morsel, so far as the attendants were able to testify, had yet passed between her teeth. This was the more creditable to Proserpina, inasmuch as King Pluto had caused her to be tempted day by day with all manner of sweetmeats and richly preserved fruits and delicacies of every sort, such as young people are generally most fond of. But her good mother had often told her of the hurtfulness of these things, and for that reason alone, if there had been no other, she would have resolutely refused to taste them. All this time, being of a cheerful and active disposition, the little damsel was not quite so unhappy as you may have supposed. The immense palace had a thousand rooms, and was full of beautiful and wonderful objects. There was a never-ceasing gloom, it is true, which half hid itself among the innumerable pillars, gliding before the child as she wandered among them, and treading stealthily behind her in the echo of her footsteps. Neither was all the dazzle of the precious stones which flamed with their own light worth one gleam of natural sunshine, nor could the most brilliant of the many-coloured gems which Proserpina had for playthings vie with the simple beauty of the flowers she used to gather. But still, wherever the girl went, among those gilded halls and chambers, it seemed as if she carried nature and sunshine along with her, and if she scattered dewy blossoms on her right hand and on her left... After Proserpina came, the palace was no longer the same abode of stately artifice and dismal magnificence that it had been before. The inhabitants all felt this, and King Pluto more than any of them. "'My own little Proserpina,' he used to say, "'I wish you could like me a little better. We gloomy and cloudy-natured persons have often as warm hearts at bottom as those of a more cheerful character.' 
If you would only stay with me of your own accord, it would make me happier than the possession of a hundred such palaces as this. Ah, said Proserpina, you should have tried to make me like you before carrying me off, and the best thing you can do now is to let me go again. Then I might remember you sometimes, and think that you were as kind as you knew how to be. Perhaps, too, one day or other, I might come back and pay you a visit. No, no, answered Pluto, with his gloomy smile. I will not trust you for that. You are too fond of living in the broad daylight and gathering flowers. What an idle and childish taste that is. Are not these gems, which I have ordered to be dug for you, and which are richer than any in my crown, are they not prettier than a violet? Not half so pretty, said Proserpina, snatching the gems from Pluto's hand and flinging them to the other end of the hall. Oh, my sweet violet, shall I never see you again? And then she burst into tears. But young people's tears have very little saltness or acidity in them, and do not inflame the eyes so much as those of grown persons, so that it is not to be wondered at if, a few minutes afterward, Proserpina was sporting through the hall almost as merrily as she and the four sea-nymphs had sported along the edge of the surf-wave. King Pluto gazed after her, and wished that he too was a child. And little Proserpina, when she turned about and beheld this great king standing in his splendid hall, and looking so grand and so melancholy and so lonesome, was smitten with a kind of pity. She ran back to him, and, for the first time in all her life, put her small, soft hand in his. "'I love you a little,' whispered she, looking up in his face. "'Do you indeed, my dear child?' cried Pluto, bending his dark face down to kiss her. But Proserpina shrank away from the kiss, for, though his features were noble, they were very dusky and grim. "'Well, I have not deserved it of you, after keeping you a prisoner for so many months, and starving you besides.' "'Are you not terribly hungry? "'Is there nothing which I can get you to eat?' "'In asking this question, "'the king of the mines had a very cunning purpose. "'For, you will recollect, "'if Proserpina tasted a morsel of food in his dominions, "'she would never afterward be at liberty to quit them.' "'No, indeed,' said Proserpina. "'Your head cook is always baking and stewing "'and roasting and rolling out paste "'and contriving one dish or another, "'which he imagines may be to my liking.' "'but he might just as well save himself the trouble, "'poor fat little man that he is. "'I have no appetite for anything in the world "'unless it were a slice of bread of my mother's own baking "'or a little fruit out of her garden.' "'When Pluto heard this, "'he began to see that he had mistaken the best method "'of tempting Proserpina to eat. "'The cook's made dishes and artificial dainties "'were not half so delicious in the good child's opinion "'as the simple fare to which Mother Ceres had accustomed her. Wondering that he had never thought of it before, the king now sent one of his trusty attendants with a large basket to get some of the finest and juiciest pears, peaches, and plums which could anywhere be found in the upper world. Unfortunately, however, this was during the time when Ceres had forbidden any fruits or vegetables to grow, and, after seeking all over the earth, King Pluto's servant found only a single pomegranate, and that so dried up as to be not worth eating. Nevertheless, since there was no better to be had, he brought this dry, old, withered pomegranate home to the palace, put it on a magnificent golden salver, and carried it up to Proserpina. Now it happened, curiously enough, that just as the servant was bringing the pomegranate into the back door of the palace, our friend Quicksilver had gone up the front steps on his errand to get Proserpina away from King Pluto. As soon as Proserpina saw the pomegranate on the golden salver, she told the servant he had better take it away again. "'I shall not touch it, I assure you,' said she. "'If I were ever so hungry, I should never think of eating such a miserable dry pomegranate as that.' "'It is the only one in the world,' said the servant. He set down the golden salver, with the wizened pomegranate upon it, and left the room. When he was gone, Proserpina could not help coming close to the table, and looking at this poor specimen of dried fruit with a great deal of eagerness, for, to say the truth, on seeing something that suited her taste, she felt all the six months' appetite taking possession of her at once. To be sure, it was a very wretched-looking pomegranate, and seemed to have no more juice in it than an oyster-shell, 
but there was no choice of such things in King Pluto's palace. This was the first fruit she had seen there, and the last she was ever likely to see, and unless she ate it up immediately, it would grow drier than it already was, and be wholly unfit to eat. At least I may smell it, thought Proserpina. So she took up the pomegranate and applied it to her nose, and, somehow or other, being in such close neighbourhood to her mouth, the fruit found its way into that little red cave. Dear me, what an everlasting pity! Before Proserpina knew what she was about, her teeth had actually bitten it of their own accord. Just as this fatal deed was done, the door of the apartment opened, and in came King Pluto, followed by Quicksilver, who had been urging him to let his little prisoner go. At the first noise of their entrance, Proserpina withdrew the pomegranate from her mouth, but Quicksilver, whose eyes were very keen and his wits the sharpest that ever anybody had, perceived that the child was a little confused, and seeing the empty salver, he suspected that she had been taking a sly nibble of something or other. As for honest Pluto, he never guessed at the secret. "'My little Proserpina,' said the king, sitting down, and affectionately drawing her between his knees, "'here is Quicksilver, who tells me that a great many misfortunes have befallen innocent people, on account of my detaining you in my dominions.' To confess the truth, I myself had already reflected that it was an unjustifiable act to take you away from your good mother. But then you must consider, my dear child, that this vast palace is apt to be gloomy, although the precious stones certainly shine very bright, and that I am not of the most cheerful disposition, and that therefore it was a natural thing enough to seek for the society of some merrier creature than myself. I hoped you would take my crown for a plaything, and me, Ah, you laugh, naughty Proserpina, me, grim as I am, for a playmate. It was a silly expectation. Not so extremely silly, whispered Proserpina. You have really amused me very much sometimes. Thank you, said King Pluto rather dryly, but I can see plainly enough that you think my palace a dusky prison, and me the iron-hearted keeper of it. And an iron heart I should surely have, if I could detain you here any longer, my poor child, when it is now six months since you tasted food, I give you your liberty. Go with Quicksilver. Hasten home to your dear mother. Now, although you may not have supposed it, Proserpina found it impossible to take leave of poor King Pluto without some regrets, and a good deal of compunction for not telling him about the pomegranate. She even shed a tear or two, thinking how lonely and cheerless the great palace would seem to him, with all its ugly glare of artificial light, after she herself, his one little ray of natural sunshine, whom he had stolen, to be sure, but only because he valued her so much, after she should have departed. I know not how many kind things she might have said to the disconsolate king of the mines, had not Quicksilver hurried her away. "'Come along quickly,' whispered he in her ear, "'or his majesty may change his royal mind, "'and take care, above all things, "'that you say nothing of what was brought you on the golden salver.' "'In a very short time they had passed the great gateway, "'leaving the three-headed Cerberus barking and yelping and growling "'with threefold din behind them, "'and emerged upon the surface of the earth. "'It was delightful to behold.' As Proserpina hastened along, how the path grew verdant behind and on either side of her. Wherever she set her blessed foot, there was at once a dewy flower. The violets gushed up along the wayside. The grass and the grain began to sprout with tenfold vigour and luxuriance, to make up for the dreary months that had been wasted in barrenness. The starved cattle immediately set to work grazing, after their long fast, and ate enormously all day and got up at midnight to eat more. But I can assure you, it was a busy time of year with the farmers, when they found the summer coming upon them with such a rush. Nor must I forget to say that all the birds in the whole world hopped upon the newly blossoming trees, and sang together in a prodigious ecstasy of joy. Mother Ceres had returned to her deserted home, and was sitting disconsolately on the doorstep, with her torch burning in her hand, she had been idly watching the flame for some moments past, when all at once it flickered and went out. "'What does this mean?' thought she. "'It was an enchanted torch, and should have kept burning till my child came back.' 
Lifting her eyes, she was surprised to see a sudden verdure flashing over the brown and barren fields, exactly as you may have observed a golden hue gleaming far and wide across the landscape from the just-risen sun. "'Does the earth disobey me?' exclaimed Mother Ceres indignantly. "'Does it presume to be green when I have bidden it be barren, until my daughter shall be restored to my arms?' "'Then open your arms, dear mother,' cried a well-known voice, "'and take your little daughter into them.' "'And Proserpina came running, "'and flung herself upon her mother's bosom. "'Their mutual transport is not to be described. "'The grief of their separation "'had caused both of them to shed a great many tears, "'and now they shed a great many more, "'because their joy could not so well express itself "'in any other way. "'When their hearts had grown a little more quiet, "'Mother Ceres looked anxiously at Proserpina.' "'My child,' said she, "'did you taste any food while you were in King Pluto's palace?' "'Dearest mother,' answered Proserpina, "'I will tell you the whole truth. "'Until this very morning not a morsel of food has passed my lips. "'But today they brought me a pomegranate, "'a very dry one it was, and all shriveled up, "'till there was little left of it but seeds and skin. "'And having seen no fruit for so long a time, "'and being faint with hunger, "'I was tempted just to bite it.' The instant I tasted it, King Pluto and Quicksilver came into the room. I had not swallowed a morsel, but, dear mother, I hope it was no harm, but six of the pomegranate seeds, I am afraid, remained in my mouth. "'Ah, unfortunate child, and miserable me!' exclaimed Ceres. "'For each of those six pomegranate seeds, you must spend one month of every year in King Pluto's palace. You are but half restored to your mother.' "'only six months with me, and six with that good-for-nothing king of darkness.' "'Do not speak so harshly of poor King Pluto,' said Proserpina, kissing her mother. "'He has some very good qualities, and I really think I can bear to spend six months in his palace, "'if he will only let me spend the other six with you. "'He certainly did very wrong to carry me off, but then, as he says, it was but a dismal sort of life for him, "'to live in that great gloomy place all alone.' and it has made a wonderful change in his spirits to have a little girl to run upstairs and down. There is some comfort in making him so happy, and so, upon the whole, dearest mother, let us be thankful that he is not to keep me the whole year round. End of section 5「Section number 6 of Myths Every Child Should Know » This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kira Davidson. Myths Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section 6. The Chimera. Part 1. Once. In the old, old times, for all the strange things which I tell you about happened long before anybody can remember, a fountain gushed out of a hillside in the marvellous land of Greece. And, for aught I know, after so many thousand years, it is still gushing out of the very self-same spot. At any rate, there was the pleasant fountain, welling freshly forth and sparkling adown the hillside, in the golden sunset, when a handsome young man named Bellerophon drew near its margin. In his hand he held a bridle, studded with brilliant gems, and adorned with a golden bit. Seeing an old man, and another of middle age, and a little boy near the fountain, and likewise a maiden, who was dipping up some of the water in a pitcher, he paused, and begged that he might refresh himself with a draught. "'This is very delicious water,' he said to the maiden, as he rinsed and filled her pitcher, after drinking out of it. "'Will you be kind enough to tell me whether the fountain has any name?' "'Yes, it is called the Fountain of Pyrene,' answered the maiden, and then she added, "'My grandmother has told me that this clear fountain was once a beautiful woman, and when her son was killed by the arrows of the huntress Diana,' She melted all away into tears. And so the water, which you find so cool and sweet, is the sorrow of that poor mother's heart. 
I should not have dreamed, observed the young stranger, that so clear a wellspring, with its gush and gurgle, and its cheery dance out of the shade into the sunlight, had so much as one teardrop in its bosom. And this, then, is Pyrene? I thank you, pretty maiden, for telling me its name. I have come from a faraway country to find this very spot. A middle-aged country fellow, he had driven his cow to drink out of the spring, stared hard at young Bellerophon and at the handsome bridle which he carried in his hand. The watercourses must be getting low, friend, in your part of the world, remarked he, if you come so far only to find the fountain of Pyrene. But pray, have you lost a horse? I see you carry the bridle in your hand, and a very pretty one it is, with that double row of bright stones upon it. If the horse was as fine as the bridle, you are much to be pitied for losing him. I have lost no horse, said Bellerophon with a smile, but I happen to be seeking a very famous one, which, as wise people have informed me, must be found hereabouts, if anywhere. Do you know whether the winged horse Pegasus still haunts the fountain of Pyrene, as he used to do in your forefathers' days? But the country fellow laughed. Some of you, my little friends, have probably heard that this Pegasus was a snow-white steed with beautiful silvery wings who spent most of his time on the summit of Mount Helicon. He was as wild and as swift and as buoyant in his flight through the air as any eagle that ever soared into the clouds there was nothing else like him in the world he had no mate he never had been backed or bridled by a master and for many a long year he led a solitary and happy life oh how fine a thing it is to be a winged horse sleeping at night as he did on a lofty mountain top and passing the greater part of the day in the air, Pegasus seemed hardly to be a creature of the earth. Whenever he was seen, up very high above people's heads, with the sunshine on his silvery wings, you would have thought that he belonged to the sky, and that, skimming a little too low, he had got astray among our mists and vapours, and was seeking his way back again. It was very pretty to behold him plunge into the fleecy bosom of a bright cloud and be lost in it for a moment or two, and then break forth from the other side. Or in a sullen rainstorm, when there was a grey pavement of clouds over the whole sky, it would sometimes happen that the winged horse descended right through it, and the glad light of the upper region would gleam after him. In another instant, it is true, both Pegasus and the pleasant light would be gone away together. But any one that was fortunate enough to see this wondrous spectacle felt cheerful the whole day afterwards, and as much longer as the storm lasted. In the summertime, and in the beautifulest of weather, Pegasus often alighted on the solid earth, and, closing his silvery wings, would gallop over hill and dale for pastime as fleetly as the wind. Oftener than in any other place, he had been seen near the fountain of Pyrene, drinking the delicious water, or rolling himself upon the soft grass of the margin. Sometimes, too, but Pegasus was very dainty in his food, he would crop a few of the clover blossoms that happened to be sweetest. To the fountain of Pyrene, therefore, People's great-grandfathers had been in the habit of going as long as they were youthful and retained their faith in winged horses, in hopes of getting a glimpse at the beautiful Pegasus. But, of late years, he had been very seldom seen. Indeed, there were many of the country folks, dwelling within half an hour's walk of the fountain, who had never beheld Pegasus and did not believe that there was any such creature in existence. The country fellow to whom Bellerophon was speaking chanced to be one of those incredulous persons, and that was the reason why he laughed. 
Pegasus indeed, cried he, turning up his nose as high as such a flat nose could be turned up. Pegasus indeed, a winged horse, truly. Why, friend, are you in your senses? Of what use would wings be to a horse? Could he drag the plough so well, think you? To be sure, there might be a little saving in the expense of shoes, but then how would a man like to see his horse flying out of the stable window? Yes, or whisking him up above the clouds when he only wanted to ride to mill. No, no, I don't believe in Pegasus. There never was such a ridiculous kind of horse fowl made. I have some reason to think otherwise, said Bellerophon quietly. And then he turned to an old grey man, who was leaning on a staff, and listening very attentively, with his head stretched forward and one hand at his ear, because, for the last twenty years, he had been getting rather deaf. "'And what say you, venerable sir?' inquired he. "'In your younger days, I should imagine, you must frequently have seen the winged steed.' "'Ah, young stranger, my memory is very poor,' said the aged man. When I was a lad, if I remember rightly, I used to believe that there was such a horse, and so did everybody else. But nowadays I hardly know what to think, and very seldom think about the winged horse at all, if I ever saw the creature. It was a long, long while ago, and, to tell you the truth, I doubt whether I ever did see him. One day, to be sure, when I was quite a youth, I remember seeing some hoof-tramps round about the brink of the fountain. Pegasus might have made those hoof-marks, and so might some other horse. And have you never seen him, my fair maiden? asked Bellerophon of the girl, who stood with the pitcher on her head while this talk went on. You certainly could see Pegasus, if anybody can, for your eyes are very bright. Once I thought I saw him, replied the maiden with a smile and a blush. It was either Pegasus or a large white bird, a very great way up in the air, and one other time, as I was coming to the fountain with my pitcher, I heard a neigh. Oh, such a brisk and melodious neigh as that was! My very heart leaped with delight at the sound, but it startled me nevertheless so I ran home without filling my pitcher. That truly was a pity, said Bellerophon. And he turned to the child, whom I mentioned at the beginning of the story, and who was gazing at him, as children are apt to gaze at strangers, with his rosy mouth wide open. Well, my little fellow, cried Bellerophon, playfully pulling one of his curls. I suppose you have often seen the winged horse. That I have, answered the child very readily. I saw him yesterday, as many times before. You are a fine little man, said Bellerophon, drawing the child closer to him. Come, tell me all about it. Why, replied the child, I often come here to sail little boats in the fountain, and to gather pretty pebbles out of its basin. And sometimes, when I look down into the water, I see the image of the winged horse in the picture of the sky that is there. I wish he would come down and take me on his back and let me ride him up to the moon. But if I so much as stir to look at him, he flies far away out of sight. And Bellerophon put his faith in the child, who had seen the image of Pegasus on the water, and in the maiden who had heard him neigh so melodiously, rather than in the middle-aged clown who believed only in cart-horses, or in the old man who had forgotten the beautiful things of his youth. Therefore he haunted about the fountain of Pyrene for a great many days afterward. He kept continually on the watch, looking upward at the sky or else down into the water, hoping forever that he should see either the reflected image of the winged horse or the marvellous reality. He held the bridle, with its bright gems and golden bit, always ready in his hand. 
The rustic people who dwelt in the neighbourhood, and drove their cattle to the fountain to drink, would often laugh at poor Bellerophon, and sometimes take him pretty severely to task. They told him that an able-bodied young man like himself ought to have better business than to be wasting his time in such idle pursuit. They offered to sell him a horse if he wanted one, and when Bellerophon declined the purchase, they tried to drive a bargain with him for his fine bridle. Even the country boys thought him so very foolish that they used to have a great deal of sport about him, and were rude enough not to care a fig, although Bellerophon saw and heard it. One little urchin, for example, would play Pegasus, and cut the oddest imaginable capers by way of flying, while one of his schoolfellows would scamper after him, holding forth a twist of bulrushes, which was intended to represent Bellerophon's ornamental bridle. But the gentle child, who had seen the picture of Pegasus in the water, comforted the young stranger more than all the naughty boys could torment him. The dear little fellow, in his play hours, often sat down beside him, and, without speaking a word, would look down into the fountain and up toward the sky, with so innocent a faith that Bellerophon could not help feeling encouraged. Now you will, perhaps, wish to be told why it was that Bellerophon had undertaken to catch a winged horse, and we shall find no better opportunity to speak about this matter than while he is waiting for Pegasus to appear. If I were to relate the whole of Bellerophon's previous adventures, they might easily grow into a very long story. It will be quite enough to say that, in a certain country of Asia, a terrible monster called a chimera had made its appearance, and was doing more mischief than could be talked about between now and sunset. According to the best accounts which I have been able to obtain, this chimera was nearly, if not quite, the ugliest and most poisonous creature, and the strangest and unaccountablest, and the hardest to fight with, and the most difficult to run away from, that ever came out of the earth's inside. It had a tail like a boa constrictor. Its body was like I do not care what, and it had three separate heads, one of which was a lion's, the second a goat's, and the third an abominably great snake's. And a hot blast of fire came flaming out of each of its three mouths. Being an earthly monster, I doubt whether it had any wings, but, wings or no, it ran like a goat and a lion, and wriggled along like a serpent and thus contrived to make about as much speed as all the three together. Oh, the mischief, and mischief, and mischief, that this naughty creature did! With its flaming breath, it could set a forest on fire, or burn up a field of grain, or, for that matter, a village, with all its fences and houses. It laid waste to the whole country around, and used to eat up people and animals alive, and cook them afterward in the burning oven of its stomach. Mercy on us, little children! I hope neither you nor I will ever happen to meet a chimera. While the hateful beast, if a beast we can anywise call it, was doing all these horrible things, it so chanced that Bellerophon came to that part of the world on a visit to the king, the king's name was Iobates, and Lycia was the country which he ruled over. Bellerophon was one of the bravest youths in the world, and desired nothing so much as to do some valiant and beneficent deed, such as would make all mankind admire and love him. In those days, the only ways for a young man to distinguish himself was by fighting battles, either with the enemies of his country or with wicked giants, or with troublesome dragons, or with wild beasts, when he could find nothing more dangerous to encounter. King Iobates, perceiving the courage of his youthful visitor, 
proposed to him to go and fight the chimera, which everybody else was afraid of, and which, unless it should be soon killed, was likely to convert Lycia into a desert. Bellerophon hesitated not a moment, but assured the king that he would either slay this dreaded chimera or perish in the attempt. But, in the first place, as the monster was so prodigiously swift, he bethought himself that he should never win the victory by fighting on foot. The wisest thing he could do, therefore, was to get the very best and fleetest horse that could anywhere be found. And what other horse in all the world was half so fleet as the marvellous horse Pegasus, who had wings as well as legs, and was even more active in the air than on the earth? To be sure, a great many people denied that there was any such horse with wings, and said that the stories about him were all poetry and nonsense. But, wonderful as it appeared, Bellerophon believed that Pegasus was a real steed, and hoped that he himself might be fortunate enough to find him, and, once fairly mounted on his back, he would be able to fight the chimera at better advantage. And this was the purpose with which he had travelled from Lycia to Greece, and had put the beautifully ornamented bridle in his hand. It was an enchanted bridle. If he could only succeed in putting the golden bit in the mouth of Pegasus, the winged horse would be submissive, and would own Bellerophon for his master, and fly whithersoever as he might choose to turn the rein. But, indeed, it was a weary and anxious time, while Bellerophon waited and waited for Pegasus, in hopes that he would come and drink at the fountain of Pyrene. He was afraid lest King Iobates should imagine that he had fled from the chimera. It pained him, too, to think of how much mischief the monster was doing, while he himself, instead of fighting with it, was compelled to sit idly poring over the bright waters of Pyrene as they gushed out of the sparkling sand. And as Pegasus came thither so seldom in these latter years, and scarcely alighted there more than once in a lifetime, Bellerophon feared that he might grow an old man, and have no strength left in his arms, nor courage in his heart, before the winged horse would appear. Oh, how heavily passes the time, while an adventurous youth is yearning to do his part in life, and to gather in the harvest of his renown. How hard a lesson it is to wait! Our life is brief, and how much of it is spent in teaching us only this! Well was it for Bellerophon that the gentle child had grown so fond of him, and was never weary of keeping him company. Every morning the child gave him a new hope to put in his bosom, instead of yesterday's withered one. Dear Bellerophon, he would cry, looking up hopefully into his face, I think we shall see Pegasus today. And, at length, if it had not been for the little boy's unwavering faith, Bellerophon would have given up all hope, and would have gone back to Lycia, and have done his best to slay the chimera without the help of the winged horse. And in that case, poor Bellerophon would at least have been terribly scorched by the creature's breath, and would most probably have been killed and devoured. Nobody should ever try to fight an earth-born chimera unless he can first get upon the back of an aerial steed. End of section 6 Section 7 of Myths Every Child Should Know This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Myths Every Child Should Know Edited by Hamilton Wright Mabby Section 7 The Chimera, Part 2 One morning the child spoke to Bellerophon even more hopefully 
than usual. Dear, dear Bellerophon, cried he, I know not why it is, but I feel as if we should certainly see Pegasus to-day. In all that day he would not stir a step from Bellerophon's side. So they ate a crust of bread together, and drank some of the water of the fountain. In the afternoon there they sat, and Bellerophon had thrown his arm around the child, who likewise had put one of his little hands into Bellerophon's. The latter was lost in his own thoughts, and was fixing his eyes vacantly on the trunks of the trees that overshadowed the fountain, and on the grapevines that clambered up among their branches. But the gentle child was gazing down into the water. He was grieved for Bellerophon's sake, that the hope of another day should be deceived, like so many before it, and two or three quiet tear-drops fell from his eyes, and mingled with what were said to be the many tears of Perini when she wept for her slain children. But when he least thought of it, Bellerophon felt the pressure of the child's little hand, and heard a soft, almost breathless whisper, See there, dear Bellerophon, there is an image in the water. The young man looked down into the dimpling mirror of the fountain, and saw what he took to be the reflection of a bird which seemed to be flying at a great height in the air, with a gleam of sunshine on its snowy or silvery wings. What a splendid bird it must be, said he, and how very large it looks, though it must really be flying higher than the clouds. It makes me tremble, whispered the child. I am afraid to look up into the air. It is very beautiful, and yet I dare only look at its image in the water. Dear Bellerophon, do you not see that it is no bird? It is the winged horse Pegasus. Bellerophon's heart began to throb. He gazed keenly upward, but could not see the winged creature, whether bird or horse, because just then it had plunged into the fleecy depths of a summer cloud. It was but a moment, however, before the object reappeared, sinking lightly down out of the cloud, although still at a vast distance from the earth. Bellerophon caught the child in his arms and shrank back with him, so that they were both hidden among the thick shrubbery which grew all around the fountain. Not that he was afraid of any harm, but he dreaded, lest, if Pegasus caught a glimpse of them, he would fly far away and alight in some inaccessible mountain top, for it was really the winged horse. After they had expected him so long, he was coming to quench his thirst with the water of Perini. Nearer and nearer came the aerial wonder, flying in great circles, as you may have seen a dove when about to alight. Downward came Pegasus, in those wide, sweeping circles, which grew narrower and narrower still as he gradually approached the earth. The nigher the view of him, the more beautiful he was, and the more marvelous the sweep of his silvery wings. At last, with so light a pressure as hardly to bend the grass about the fountain, or imprint a hoof tramp in the sand of its margin, he alighted, and stooping his wild head, began to drink. He drew in the water, with long and pleasant sighs, and tranquil pauses of enjoyment, and then another draught, and another, and another, for nowhere in the world, or up among the clouds, did Pegasus love any water as he loved this of Perini, and when his thirst was slaked, he cropped a few of the honey blossoms of the clover, delicately tasting them, but not caring to make a hearty meal, because the herbage just beneath the clouds on the lofty sides of Mount Helicon suited his palate better than this ordinary grass. After thus drinking to his heart's content, and in his dainty fashion condescending to take a little food, 
the winged horse began to caper to and fro, and dance, as it were, out of mere idleness and sport. There never was a more playful creature made than this very Pegasus. So there he frisked, in a way that it delights me to think about, fluttering his great wings as lightly as ever did a linnet, and running little races, half on earth and half in air, and which I know not whether to call a flight or a gallop. When a creature is perfectly able to fly, he sometimes chooses to run, just for the pastime of the thing, and so did Pegasus, although it cost him some little trouble to keep his hoofs so near the ground. Bellerophon, meanwhile, holding the child's hand, peeped forth from the shrubbery, and thought that never was any sight so beautiful as this, nor ever a horse's eyes so wild and spirited as those of Pegasus. It seemed a sin to think of bridling him and riding on his back. Once or twice Pegasus stopped and snuffed the air, pricking up his ears, tossing his head, and turning it on all sides, as if he partly suspected some mischief or other. Seeing nothing, however, and hearing no sound, he soon began his antics again. At length, not that he was weary, but only idle and luxurious, Pegasus folded his wings and lay down on the soft green turf. But being too full of aerial life to remain quiet for many moments together, he soon rolled over on his back with his four slender legs in the air. It was beautiful to see him, this one solitary creature whose mate had never been created but who needed no companion, and living a great many hundred years, was as happy as the centuries were long. The more he did such things as mortal horses are accustomed to do, the less earthly and the more wonderful he seemed. Bellerophon and the child almost held their breaths, partly from a delightful awe, but still more because they dreaded, lest the slightest stir or murmur should send him up, with the speed of an arrow flight, into the farthest blue of the sky. Finally, when he had had enough of rolling over and over, Pegasus turned himself about, and indolently, like any other horse, put out his forelegs in order to rise from the ground, and Bellerophon, who had guessed that he would do so, darted suddenly from the thicket and leaped astride of his back. Yes, there he sat on the back of the winged horse. But what a bound did Pegasus make when, for the first time, he felt the weight of a mortal man upon his loins. A bound, indeed. Before he had time to draw a breath, Bellerophon found himself five hundred feet aloft and still shooting upward while the winged horse snorted and trembled with terror and anger. Upward he went, up, 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 until he plunged into the cold, misty bosom of a cloud, at which, only a little while before, Bellerophon had been gazing, and fancying it a very pleasant spot. Then again, out of the heart of the cloud, Pegasus shot down like a thunderbolt, as if he meant to dash both himself and his rider headlong against a rock. Then he went through about a thousand of the wildest caprioles that had ever been performed either by a bird or a horse. I cannot tell you half that he did. He skimmed straight forward and sideways and backward. He reared himself erect with his forelegs on a wreath of mist and his hind legs on nothing at all. He flung out his heels behind and put down his head between his legs, with his wings pointing right upward. At about two miles height above the earth, he turned a somerset so that Bellerophon's heels were where his head should have been, and he seemed to look down into the sky instead of up. He twisted his head about 
and looking Bellerophon in the face, with fire flashing from his eyes, made a terrible attempt to bite him. He fluttered his pinions so wildly that one of the silver feathers was shaken out, and floating earthward, was picked up by the child, who kept it as long as he lived, in memory of Pegasus and Bellerophon. But the latter, who, as you may judge, was as good a horseman as ever galloped, had been watching his opportunity, and at last clapped the golden bit of the enchanted bridle between the winged steed's jaws. No sooner was this done than Pegasus became as manageable as if he had taken food all his life out of Bellerophon's hand. To speak what I really feel, it was almost a sadness to see so wild a creature grow suddenly so tame. And Pegasus seemed to feel it so likewise. He looked round to Bellerophon with the tears in his beautiful eyes instead of the fire that so recently flashed from them. But when Bellerophon patted his head and spoke a few authoritative yet kind and soothing words, another look came into the eyes of Pegasus, for he was glad at heart, after so many lonely centuries, to have found a companion and a master. Thus it always is with winged horses, and with all such wild and solitary creatures. If you can catch and overcome them, it is the surest way to win their love. While Pegasus had been doing his utmost to shake Bellerophon off his back, he had flown a very long distance, and they had come within sight of a lofty mountain by the time the bit was in his mouth. Bellerophon had seen this mountain before, and knew it to be Helicon, on the summit of which was the winged horse's abode. Thither, after looking gently into his rider's face as if to ask leave, Pegasus now flew, and alighting, waited patiently until Bellerophon should please to dismount. The young man accordingly leaped from his steed's back, but still held him fast by the bridle. Meeting his eyes, however, he was so affected by the gentleness of his aspect, and by the thought of the free life which Pegasus had heretofore lived, that he could not bear to keep him a prisoner, if he really desired his liberty. Obeying this generous impulse, he slipped the enchanted bridle off the head of Pegasus, and took the bit from his mouth. Leave me, Pegasus, said he. Either leave me, or love me. In an instant, the winged horse shot almost out of sight, soaring upward from the summit of Mount Helicon. Being long after sunset, it was now twilight on the mountain top, and dusky evening over all the country round about. But Pegasus flew so high that he overtook the departed day, and was bathed in the upper radiance of the sun. Ascending higher and higher, he looked like a bright speck, and at last could no longer be seen in the hollow waste of the sky. And Bellerophon was afraid that he should never behold him more. But while he was lamenting his own folly, the bright speck reappeared and drew nearer and nearer, until it descended lower than the sunshine, and behold, Pegasus had come back. After this trial, there was no more fear of the winged horses making his escape. He and Bellerophon were friends, and put loving faith in one another. That night they lay down and slept together, with Bellerophon's arm about the neck of Pegasus, not as a caution, but for kindness, and they awoke at peep of day, and bade one another good morning, each in his own language. In this manner, Bellerophon and the wondrous steed spent several days, and grew better acquainted and fonder of each other all the time. They went on long aerial journeys, and sometimes ascended so high that the earth looked hardly bigger than the moon. They visited distant countries, and amazed the inhabitants, who thought that the beautiful young man 
on the back of the winged horse must have come down out of the sky. A thousand miles a day was no more than an easy space for the fleet Pegasus to pass over. Bellerophon was delighted with this kind of life, and would have liked nothing better than to live always in the same way, aloft in the clear atmosphere, for it was always sunny weather up there, however cheerless and rainy it might be in the lower region. But he could not forget the horrible chimera, which he had promised King Iabates to slay. So at last, when he had become well accustomed to feats of horsemanship in the air, and could manage Pegasus with the least motion of his hand, and had taught him to obey his voice, he determined to attempt the performance of this perilous adventure. At daybreak, therefore, as soon as he unclosed his eyes, he gently pinched the winged horse's ear in order to arouse him. Pegasus immediately started from the ground and pranced about a quarter of a mile aloft, and made a grand sweep around the mountain top, by way of showing that he was wide awake, and ready for any kind of an excursion. During the whole of this little flight, he uttered a loud, brisk, and melodious neigh, and finally came down at Bellerophon's side, as lightly as ever you saw a sparrow hop upon a twig. Well done, dear Pegasus. Well done, my sky skimmer, cried Bellerophon, fondly stroking the horse's neck. And now, my fleet and beautiful friend, we must break our fast. Today we are to fight the terrible Chimera. As soon as they had eaten their morning meal and drank some sparkling water from a spring called Hippocrene, Pegasus held out his head of his own accord, so that his master might put on the bridle. Then, with a great many playful leaps and airy caperings, he showed his impatience to be gone, while Bellerophon was girding on his sword and hanging his shield about his neck, and preparing himself for battle. When everything was ready, the rider mounted, and, as was his custom when going a long distance, ascended five miles perpendicularly, so as the better to see whether he was directing his course. He then turned the head of Pegasus toward the east, and set out for Lycia. In their flight they overtook an eagle, and came so nigh him, before he could get out of their way, that Bellerophon might easily have caught him by the leg. Hastening onward at this rate, it was still early in the forenoon when they beheld the lofty mountains of Lycia with their deep and shaggy valleys. If Bellerophon had been told truly, it was in one of those dismal valleys that the hideous Chimera had taken up its abode. Being now so near their journey's end, the winged horse gradually descended with his rider, and they took advantage of some clouds that were floating over the mountain tops, in order to conceal themselves. Hovering on the upper surface of a cloud, and peeping over its edge, Bellerophon had a pretty distinct view of the mountainous part of Lycia, and could look into all its shadowy vales at once. At first there appeared to be nothing remarkable. It was a wild, savage, and rocky tract of high and precipitous hills, in the more level part of the country, there were the ruins of houses that had been burnt, and here and there the carcasses of dead cattle, strewn about the pastures where they had been feeding. The chimera must have done this mischief, thought Bellerophon, but where can the monster be? As I have already said, there was nothing remarkable to be detected at first sight in any of the valleys and dells that lay among the precipitous heights of the mountains. Nothing at all, unless indeed it were three spires of black smoke, which issued from what seemed to be the mouth of a cavern, and clambered sullenly into the atmosphere. Before reaching the mountain top, 
these three black smoke wreaths mingled themselves into one. The cavern was almost directly beneath the winged horse and his rider, at the distance of about a thousand feet. The smoke, as it crept heavily upward, had an ugly, sulfurous, stifling scent, which caused Pegasus to snort and Bellerophon to sneeze. So disagreeable was it to the marvelous steed, who was accustomed to breathe only the purest air, that he waved his wings and shot half a mile out of the range of this offensive vapor. But on looking behind him, Bellerophon saw something that induced him first to draw the bridle and then to turn Pegasus about. He made a sign which the winged horse understood and sunk slowly through the air until his hoofs were scarcely more than a man's height above the rocky bottom of the valley. In front, as far off as you could throw a stone, was the cavern's mouth, with the three smoke wreaths oozing out of it. And what else did Bellerophon behold there? There seemed to be a heap of strange and terrible creatures curled up within the cavern. Their bodies lay so close together that Bellerophon could not distinguish them apart. But, judging by their heads, one of these creatures was a huge snake, the second a fierce lion, and the third an ugly goat. The lion and the goat were asleep. The snake was broad awake and kept staring around him with a great pair of fiery eyes. But, and this was the most wonderful part of the matter. The three spires of smoke evidently issued from the nostrils of these three heads. So strange was the spectacle that, though Bellerophon had been all along expecting it, the truth did not immediately occur to him that here was the terrible three-headed chimera. He had found out the chimera's cavern, the snake, the lion and the goat, as he supposed them to be, were not three separate creatures, but one monster. The wicked, hateful thing, slumbering as two-thirds of it were, it still held in its abominable claws the remnant of an unfortunate lamb, or possibly, but I hate to think so, it was a dear little boy which its three mouths had been gnawing, before two of them fell asleep. All at once Bellerophon started as from a dream, and knew it to be the chimera. Pegasus seemed to know it at the same instant, and sent forth a neigh that sounded like the call of a trumpet to battle. At this sound the three heads reared themselves erect, and belched out great flashes of flame. Before Bellerophon had time to consider what to do next, the monster flung itself out of the cavern and sprung straight toward him with its immense claws extended and its snaky tail twisting itself venomously behind. If Pegasus had not been as nimble as a bird, both he and his rider would have been overthrown by the chimera's headlong rush, and thus the battle have been ended before it was well begun. But the winged horse was not to be caught so. In the twinkling of an eye he was up aloft, half way to the clouds, but with utter disgust at the loathsomeness of this poisonous thing with three heads. The chimera, on the other hand, raised itself up so as to stand absolutely on the tip end of its tail, with its talons pawing fiercely in the air, and its three heads sputtering fire at Pegasus and his rider. My stars how it roared and hissed and bellowed! Bellerophon, meanwhile, was fitting his shield on his arm and drawing his sword. Now, my beloved Pegasus, he whispered in the winged horse's ear, thou must help me to slay this insufferable monster or else thou shalt fly back to thy solitary mountain peak without thy friend Bellerophon. For either 
the chimera dies, or its three mouths shall gnaw this head of mine, which has slumbered upon thy neck. Pegasus whinnied, and turning back his head, rubbed his nose tenderly against his rider's cheek. It was his way of telling him that, though he had wings and was an immortal horse, yet he would perish, if it were possible for immortality to perish, rather than leave Bellerophon behind. I thank you, Pegasus, answered Bellerophon. Now then, let us make a dash at the monster. Uttering these words, he shook the bridle, and Pegasus darted down a slant, as swift as the flight of an arrow, right toward the chimera's threefold head, which, all this time, was poking itself as high as it could into the air. As he came within arm's length, Bellerophon made a cut at the monster, but was carried onward by his steed, before he could see whether the blow had been successful. Pegasus continued his course, but soon wheeled round at about the same distance from the chimera as before. Bellerophon then perceived that he had cut the goat's head of the monster almost off, so that it dangled downward by the skin, and seemed quite dead. But to make amends, the snake's head and the lion's head had taken all the fierceness of the dead one into themselves, and spit flame, and hissed, and roared with a vast deal more fury than before. Never mind, my brave Pegasus, cried Bellerophon, with another stroke like that, we will stop either its hissing or its roaring. And again he shook the bridle. Dashing aslantwise as before, the winged horse made another arrow flight toward the chimera, and Bellerophon aimed another downright stroke at one of the two remaining heads as he shot by. But this time neither he nor Pegasus escaped so well as at first. With one of its claws, the chimera had given the young man a deep scratch in his shoulder, and had slightly damaged the left wing of the flying steed with the other. On his part, Bellerophon had mortally wounded the lion's head of the monster, insomuch that it now hung downward, with its fire almost extinguished, and sending out gasps of thick black smoke. The snake's head, however, which was the only one now left, was twice as fierce and venomous as ever before. It belched forth shoots of fire five hundred yards long, and emitted hisses so loud, so harsh, and so ear-piercing, that King Iobates heard them fifty miles off, and trembled till the throne shook under him. Well a day, thought the poor king, the chimera is certainly coming to devour me. Meanwhile, Pegasus had again paused in the air, and neighed angrily, while sparkles of a pure crystal flame darted out of his eyes. How unlike the lurid fire of the chimera! The aerial steed's spirit was all aroused, and so was that of Bellerophon. Dost thou bleed, my immortal horse? cried the young man caring less for his own hurt than for the anguish of this glorious creature that ought never to have tasted pain. The execrable chimera shall pay for this mischief with his last head. Then he shook the bridle, shouted loudly, and guided Pegasus, not a slantwise as before, but straight at the monster's hideous front. So rapid was the onset that it seemed but a dazzle and a flash before Bellerophon was at close grips with his enemy. The chimera by this time, after losing its second head, had got into a red-hot passion of pain and rampant rage. It so flounced about, half on earth and partly in the air, that it was impossible to say which element it rested upon. It opened its snake jaws to such an abominable width, that Pegasus might almost, I was going to say, have flown right down its throat, wings outspread, rider and all. 
At their approach it shot out a tremendous blast of its fiery breath, and enveloped Bellerophon and his steed in a perfect atmosphere of flame, singeing the wings of Pegasus, scorching off one whole side of the young man's golden ringlets, and making them both far hotter than was comfortable from head to foot. But this was nothing to what followed. When the airy rush of the winged horse had brought him within the distance of a hundred yards, the chimera gave a spring and flung its huge, awkward, venomous, and utterly detestable carcass right upon poor Pegasus, clung round him with might and main, and tied up its snaky tail into a knot. Up flew the aerial steed, higher, 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 above the mountain peak, above the clouds, almost out of sight of the solid earth. But still the earth-born monster kept its hold and was borne upward along with the creature of light and air. Bellerophon, meanwhile, turning about, found himself face to face with the ugly grimness of the chimera's visage, and could only avoid being scorched to death or bitten right in twain by holding up his shield. Over the upper edge of the shield he looked sternly into the savage eyes of the monster. But the chimera was so mad and wild with pain that it did not guard itself so well as might else have been the case. Perhaps, after all, the best way to fight a chimera is by getting as close to it as you can. In its efforts to stick its horrible iron claws into its enemy, the creature left its own breast quite exposed, and, perceiving this, Bellerophon thrust his sword up to the hilt into its cruel heart. Immediately the snaky tail untied its knot. The monster let go its hold of Pegasus and fell from that vast height downward while the fire within its bosom, instead of being put out, burned fiercer than ever, and quickly began to consume the dead carcass. Thus it fell out of the sky all aflame, and, it being nightfall before it reached the earth, was mistaken for a shooting star or a comet. But at early sunrise some cottagers were going to their day's labor, and saw to their astonishment that several acres of ground were strewn with black ashes. In the middle of a field there was a heap of whitened bones, a great deal higher than a haystack. Nothing else was ever seen of the dreadful chimera. And when Bellerophon had won the victory, he bent forward and kissed Pegasus, while the tears stood in his eyes. Back now, my beloved steed, said he, back to the fountain of Perini. Pegasus skimmed through the air quicker than ever he did before and reached the fountain in a very short time. And there he found the old man leaning on his staff and the country fellow watering his cow and the pretty maiden filling her pitcher. I remember now, quoth the old man, I saw this winged horse once before when I was quite a lad, but he was ten times handsomer in those days. I own a cart-horse worth three of him, said the country fellow. If this pony were mine, the first thing I should do would be to clip his wings. But the poor maiden said nothing, for she had always the luck to be afraid at the wrong time. So she ran away, and let her pitcher tumble down, and broke it. "'Where is the gentle child?' asked Bellerophon, who used to keep me company, and never lost his faith, and never was weary of gazing into the fountain. "'Here am I, dear Bellerophon,' said the child, softly. For the little boy had spent day after day on the margin of Perini, waiting for his friend to come back, and when he perceived Bellerophon descending through the clouds, mounted on the winged horse, 
he had shrunk back into the shrubbery. He was a delicate and tender child, and dreaded lest the old man and the country fellow should see the tears gushing from his eyes. "'Thou hast won the victory,' said he, joyfully running to the knee of Bellerophon, who still sat on the back of Pegasus. "'I knew thou wouldst.' "'Yes, dear child,' replied Bellerophon, alighting from the winged horse. "'But if thy faith had not helped me, I should never have waited for Pegasus, and never have gone up above the clouds, and never have conquered the terrible Chimera. Thou, my beloved little friend, hast done it all, and now let us give Pegasus his liberty. So he slipped off the enchanted bridle from the head of the marvellous steed. Be free for evermore, my Pegasus, cried he, with a shade of sadness in his tone. Be as free as thou art fleet. But Pegasus rested his head on Bellerophon's shoulder, and would not be persuaded to take flight. Well then, said Bellerophon, caressing the airy horse, thou shalt be with me as long as thou wilt, and we will go together forthwith, and tell King Iabates that the Chimera is destroyed. Then Bellerophon embraced the gentle child, and promised to come to him again, and departed. But in after years that child took higher flights upon the aerial steed than ever did Bellerophon, and achieved more honorable deeds than his friend's victory over the Chimera. For gentle and tender as he was, he grew to be a mighty poet. End of section 7。Section 8 of Myths Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Myths Every Child Should Know, edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section 8. The Golden Touch. Once upon a time there lived a very rich man, and a king besides, whose name was Midas. And he had a little daughter, whom nobody but myself ever heard of, and whose name I either never knew or have entirely forgotten. So, because I love odd names for little girls, I choose to call her Marigold. This King Midas was fonder of gold than of anything else in the world. He valued his royal crown chiefly because it was composed of that precious metal. If he loved anything better or half so well, it was the one little maiden who played so merrily around her father's footstool. But the more Midas loved his daughter, the more did he desire and seek for wealth. He thought, foolish man, that the best thing he could possibly do for this dear child would be to bequeath her the immensest pile of yellow glistening coin that had ever been heaped together since the world was made. Thus he gave all his thoughts and all his time to this one purpose. If ever he happened to gaze for an instant at the gold-tinted clouds of sunset, he wished that they were real gold, and that they could be squeezed safely into his strong box. When little Marigold ran to meet him with a bunch of buttercups and dandelions, he used to say, Pa, pa, child, if these flowers were as golden as they look, they would be worth the plucking. And yet in his earlier days, before he was so entirely possessed of this insane desire for riches, King Midas had shown a great taste for flowers. He had planted a garden in which grew the biggest and beautifulest and sweetest roses that any mortal ever saw or smelt. These roses were still growing in the garden, as large, as lovely, and as fragrant as when Midas used to pass whole hours in gazing at them and inhaling their perfume. 
But now, if he looked at them at all, it was only to calculate how much the garden would be worth if each of the innumerable rose petals were a thin plate of gold. And though he once was fond of music, in spite of an idle story about his ears, which were said to resemble those of an ass, the only music for poor Midas now was the chink of one coin against another. At length, as people always grow more and more foolish unless they take care to grow wiser and wiser, Midas had got to be so exceedingly unreasonable that he could scarcely bear to see or touch any object that was not gold. He made it his custom, therefore, to pass a large portion of every day in a dark and dreary apartment underground at the basement of his palace. It was here that he kept his wealth, to this dismal hole, for it was little better than a dungeon, Midas betook himself whenever he wanted to be particularly happy here after carefully locking the door he would take a bag of gold coin or a gold cup as big as a wash bowl or a heavy golden bar or a peck measure of gold dust and bring them from the obscure corners of the room into the one bright and narrow sunbeam that fell from the dungeon-like window he valued the sunbeam for no other reason but that his treasure would not shine without its help and then would he reckon over the coins in the bag, toss up the bar, and catch it as it came down, sift the gold dust through his fingers, look at the funny image of his own face as reflected in the burnished circumference of the cup, and whisper to himself, Oh, Midas, rich King Midas, what a happy man art thou! But it was laughable to see how the image of his face kept grinning at him, out of the polished surface of the cup. It seemed to be aware of his foolish behavior, and to have a naughty inclination to make fun of him. Midas called himself a happy man, but felt that he was not yet quite so happy as he might be. The very tip-top of enjoyment would never be reached unless the whole world were to become his treasure room, and be filled with yellow metal which should be all his own. Now I need hardly remind such wise little people as you are, that in the old, old times, when King Midas was alive, a great many things came to pass, which we should consider wonderful if they were to happen in our own day and country. And on the other hand, a great many things take place nowadays which seem not only wonderful to us, but at which the people of old times would have stared their eyes out. On the whole, I regard our own times as the strangest of the two, but however that may be, I must go on with my story. Midas was enjoying himself in his treasure room one day, as usual, when he perceived a shadow fall over the heaps of gold, and looking suddenly up, what should he behold but the figure of a stranger, standing in the bright and narrow sunbeam? It was a young man, with a cheerful and ruddy face. Whether it was that the imagination of King Midas threw a yellow tinge over everything, or whatever the cause might be, he could not help fancying that the smile with which the stranger regarded him had a kind of golden radiance in it. Certainly, although his figure intercepted the sunshine, there was now a brighter gleam upon all the piled-up treasures than before. Even the remotest corners had their share of it and were lighted up when the stranger smiled, as with tips of flame and sparkles of fire. As Midas knew that he had carefully turned the key in the lock, and that no mortal strength could possibly break into his treasure room, he of course concluded that his visitor must be something more than mortal. Now it is no matter about telling you who he was. In those days, when the earth was comparatively a new affair, it was supposed to be often the resort of beings endowed with supernatural power, and who used to interest themselves in the joys and sorrows of men, women, and children, half playfully and half seriously. Midas had met such beings before now, and was not sorry to meet one of them again. The stranger's aspect, indeed, was so good-humoured and kindly, if not beneficent, that it would have been unreasonable to suspect him of intending any mischief. It was far more probable that he came to do Midas a favor, and what could that favor be, unless to multiply his heaps of treasure? The stranger gazed about the room. 
and when his lustrous smile had glistened upon all the golden objects that were there, he turned again to Midas. "'You are a wealthy man, friend Midas,' he observed. "'I doubt whether any other four walls on earth contain so much gold as you have contrived to pile up in this room.' "'I have done pretty well, pretty well,' answered Midas, in a discontented tone. "'But after all, it is but a trifle, when you consider that it has taken me my whole life to get it together. If one could live a thousand years, he might have time to grow rich.' "'What?' exclaimed the stranger. "'Then you are not satisfied?' Midas shook his head. "'And pray, what would satisfy you?' asked the stranger. Merely for the curiosity of the thing, I should be glad to know. Midas paused and meditated. He felt a presentiment that this stranger, with such a golden luster in his good-humoured smile, had come hither with both the power and the purpose of gratifying his utmost wishes. Now, therefore, was the fortunate moment when he had but to speak and obtain whatever possible or seemingly impossible thing it might come into his head to ask. And so he thought, and thought, and thought, and heaped up one golden mountain upon another in his imagination, without being able to imagine them big enough. At last a bright idea occurred to King Midas. It seemed really as bright as the glistening metal which he loved so much. Raising his head, he looked the lustrous stranger in the face. "'Well, Midas,' observed his visitor, "'I see that you have at length hit upon something that will satisfy you. Tell me your wish.' "'It is only this,' replied Midas. "'I am weary of collecting my treasures with so much trouble, and beholding the heap so diminutive after I have done my best. I wish everything that I touch to be changed to gold.' The stranger's smile grew so very broad that it seemed to fill the room like an outburst of the sun, gleaming into a shadowy dell where the yellow autumnal leaves, for so look the lumps and particles of gold, lie strewn in the glow of light. "'The golden touch!' exclaimed he. "'You certainly deserve credit, friend Midas, for striking out so brilliant a conception. But are you quite sure that this will satisfy you? How could it fail?' said Midas. And will you never regret the possession of it? What could induce me? asked Midas. I ask nothing else to render me perfectly happy. Be it as you wish, then, replied the stranger, waving his hand in token of farewell. Tomorrow at sunrise you will find yourself gifted with a golden touch. The figure of the stranger then became exceedingly bright, and Midas involuntarily closed his eyes. On opening them again, he beheld only one yellow sunbeam in the room, and all around him the glistening of the precious metal which he had spent his life in hoarding up. Whether Midas slept as usual that night, the story does not say. Asleep or awake, however, his mind was probably in the state of a child's to whom a beautiful new plaything had been promised in the morning. At any rate, Day had hardly peeped over the hills when King Midas was brought awake, and stretching his arms out of bed, began to touch the objects that were within reach. He was anxious to prove whether the golden touch had really come according to the stranger's promise, and so he laid his finger on a chair by the bedside, and on various other things, but was grievously disappointed to perceive that they remained of exactly the same substance as before. Indeed, he felt very much afraid that he had only dreamed about the lustrous stranger, or else that the latter had been making game of him. And what a miserable affair would it be, after all his hopes! Midas must content himself with what little gold he could scrape together by ordinary means, instead of creating it by a touch. All this while it was only the grey of the morning, with but a streak of brightness along the edge of the sky where Midas could not see it. He lay in a very disconsolate mood, regretting the downfall of his hopes, and kept growing sadder and sadder until the earliest sunbeam shone through the window and gilded the ceiling over his head. It seemed to Midas that this bright yellow sunbeam was reflected in rather a singular way on the white covering of the bed. Looking more closely, 
what was his astonishment and delight when he found that this linen fabric had been transmuted to what seemed a woven texture of the purest and brightest gold the golden touch had come to him with the first sunbeam midas started up in a kind of joyful frenzy and ran about the room grasping at everything that happened to be in his way he seized one of the bedposts and it became immediately a fluted golden pillar he pulled aside a window curtain in order to admit a clear spectacle of the wonders which he was performing and the tassel grew heavy in his hand a mass of gold he took up a book from the table at his first touch it assumed the appearance of such a splendidly bound and gilt-edged volume as one often meets with nowadays but on running his fingers through the leaves behold it was a bundle of thin golden plates in which all the wisdom of the book had grown illegible he hurriedly put on his clothes and was enraptured to see himself in a magnificent suit of gold cloth which retained its flexibility and softness although it burdened him a little with its weight he drew out his handkerchief which little marigold had hemmed for him that was likewise gold with the dear child's neat and pretty stitches running all along the border in gold thread somehow or other this last transformation did not quite please king midas he would rather that his little daughter's handiwork should have remained just the same as it was when she climbed his knee and put it into his hand but it was not worth while to vex himself about a trifle midas now took his spectacles from his pocket and put them on his nose in order that he might see more distinctly what he was about in those days spectacles for common people had not been invented but were already worn by kings else how could midas have had any to his great perplexity however excellent as the glasses were he discovered that he could not possibly see through them but this was the most natural thing in the world for on taking them off the transparent crystals turned out to be plates of yellow metal and of course were worthless as spectacles although valuable as gold it struck midas as rather inconvenient that with all his wealth he could never again be rich enough to own a pair of serviceable spectacles it's no great matter nevertheless said he to himself very philosophically we cannot expect any great good without its being accompanied with some small inconvenience the golden touch is worth the sacrifice of a pair of spectacles at least if not of one's very eyesight my own eyes will serve for ordinary purposes and little marigold will soon be old enough to read to me wise king midas was so exalted by his good fortune that the palace seemed not sufficiently spacious to contain him he therefore went downstairs and smiled on observing that the balustrade of the staircase became a bar of burnished gold as his hand passed over it in his descent he lifted the door latch it was brass only a moment ago but golden when his fingers quitted it and emerged into the garden here as it happened he found a great number of beautiful roses in full bloom and others in all the stages of lovely bud and blossom very delicious was their fragrance in the morning breeze their delicate blush was one of the fairest sights in the world so gentle so modest and so full of sweet tranquillity did these roses seem to be but midas knew a way to make them far more precious according to his way of thinking than roses had ever been before so he took great pains in going from bush to bush and exercised his magic touch almost indefatigably until every individual flower and bud and even the worms at the heart of some of them were changed to gold by this time this good work was completed king midas was summoned to breakfast and as the morning air had given him an excellent appetite he made haste back to the palace what was usually a king's breakfast in the days of midas i really do not know and cannot stop now to investigate to the best of my belief however on this particular morning the breakfast consisted of hot cakes some nice little brook trout roasted potatoes fresh boiled eggs and coffee for king midas himself and a bowl of bread and milk for his daughter marigold at all events 
This is a breakfast fit to set before a king, and whether he had it or not, King Midas could not have had a better. Little Marigold had not yet made her appearance. Her father ordered her to be called, and seating himself at table, awaited the child's coming in order to begin his own breakfast. To do Midas justice, he really loved his daughter, and loved her so much the more this morning on account of the good fortune which had befallen him. It was not a great while before he heard her coming along the passageway, crying bitterly. This circumstance surprised him, because Marigold was one of the cheerfulest little people whom you would see in a summer's day, and hardly shed a thimbleful of tears in a twelve-month. When Midas heard her sobs, he determined to put little Marigold into better spirits by an agreeable surprise. So, leaning across the table, he touched his daughter's bowl, which was a china one, with pretty figures all around it, and transmuted it to gleaming gold. Meanwhile, Marigold slowly and disconsolately opened the door, and showed herself with her apron at her eyes, still sobbing as if her heart would break. "'Here now, my little lady,' cried Midas, "'pray, what is the matter with you this bright morning?' Marigold, without taking the apron from her eyes, held out her hand, in which was one of the roses which Midas had so recently transmuted. "'Beautiful!' exclaimed her father. "'And what is there in this magnificent golden rose to make you cry?' "'Ah, dear father,' answered the child, as well as her sobs would let her, "'it is not beautiful, but the ugliest flower that ever grew. "'As soon as I was dressed, I ran into the garden to gather some roses for you, "'because I know you like them, and like them the better when gathered by your little daughter. "'But, oh, dear, dear me, what do you think has happened? "'Such a misfortune! "'All the beautiful roses that smelled so sweetly, and had so many lovely blushes, are blighted and spoiled. They are grown quite yellow, as you can see this one, and have no longer any fragrance. What can have been the matter with them? Oh, my dear little girl, pray don't cry about it, said Midas, who was ashamed to confess that he himself had wrought the change which so greatly afflicted her. Sit down and eat your bread and milk. You will find it easy enough to exchange a golden rose like that which will last hundreds of years, for an ordinary one which would wither in a day. I don't care for such roses as this, cried Marigold, tossing it contemptuously away. It has no smell, and the hard petals prick my nose. The child now sat down to table, but was so occupied with her grief for the blighted roses that she did not even notice the wonderful transmutation of her china bowl. Perhaps this was all the better, for Marigold was accustomed to take pleasure in looking at the queer figures and strange trees and houses that were painted on the circumference of the bowl, and these ornaments were now entirely lost in the yellow hue of the metal. Midas, meanwhile, had poured out a cup of coffee, and, as a matter of course, the coffee-pot, whatever metal it may have been when he took it up, was gold when he set it down. He thought to himself, that it was rather an extravagant style of splendor in a king of his simple habits to breakfast off a service of gold, and began to be puzzled with the difficulty of keeping his treasure safe. The cupboard and the kitchen would no longer be a secure place of deposit for articles so valuable as gold in bowls and coffee pots. Amid these thoughts he lifted a spoonful of coffee to his lips, and sipping it, was astonished to perceive that the instant his lips touched the liquid it became molten gold and the next moment hardened into a lump ha exclaimed midas rather aghast what is the matter father asked little marigold gazing at it with the tears still standing in her eyes nothing child nothing said midas eat your milk before it gets quite cold he took one of the nice little trouts on his plate and by way of experiment touched its tail with his finger, and to his horror it was immediately transmuted from an admirably fried brook trout into a goldfish, though not one of those goldfishes which people often keep in glass globes as ornaments for the parlor, no, but it was really a metallic fish, and looked as if it had been very cunningly made by the nicest goldsmith in the world. Its little bones were now golden wires, 
Its fins and tail were thin plates of gold, and there were the marks of the fork in it, and all the delicate frothy appearance of a nicely fried fish, exactly imitated in metal. A very pretty piece of work, as you may suppose, only King Midas just at that moment would much rather have had a real trout in his dish than this elaborate and valuable imitation of one. I don't quite see, thought he to himself, how I'm to get any breakfast. He took one of the smoking hot cakes, and had scarcely broken it, when to his cruel mortification, though a moment before it had been of the whitest wheat, it assumed the yellow hue of Indian meal. To say the truth, if it had really been a hot Indian cake, Midas would have prized it a good deal more than he now did, when its solidity and increased weight made him too bitterly sensible that it was gold. Almost in despair, he helped himself to a boiled egg, which immediately underwent a change similar to that of the trout and the cake. The egg, indeed, might have been mistaken for one of those which the famous goose in the storybook was in the habit of laying. But King Midas was the only goose that had had anything to do with the matter. Well, this is a quandary, thought he, leaning back in his chair, and looking quite enviously at little Marigold, who was now eating a bread and milk with great satisfaction. Such a costly breakfast before me, and nothing that can be eaten? Hoping that by dint of great dispatch he might avoid what he now felt to be a considerable inconvenience. King Midas next snatched a hot potato and attempted to cram it into his mouth and swallow it in a hurry. But the golden touch was too nimble for him. He found his mouth full, not of mealy potato, but of solid metal, which so burnt his tongue that he roared aloud, and jumping up from the table, began to dance and stamp about the room, both with pain and affright. "'Father, dear father!' cried little Marigold, who was a very affectionate child. "'Pray, what is the matter? Have you burnt your mouth?' "'Ah, dear child,' groaned Midas dolefully, "'I don't know what is to become of your poor father.' And truly, my dear little folks, did you ever hear of such a pitiable case in all your lives? Here was literally the richest breakfast that could be set before a king, and its very richness made it absolutely good for nothing. The poorest laborer, sitting down to his crust of bread and cup of water, was far better off than King Midas, whose delicate food was really worth its weight in gold. And what was to be done? Already at breakfast, Midas was excessively hungry. Would he be less so by dinner-time? And how ravenous would his appetite for supper, which must undoubtedly consist of the same sort of indigestible dishes as those now before him? How many days, think you, would he survive a continuance of this rich fare? These reflections so troubled wise King Midas, that he began to doubt whether, after all, riches are the one desirable thing in the world, or even the most desirable. But this was only a passing thought. So fascinated was Midas with the glitter of the yellow metal that he would still have refused to give up the golden touch for so paltry a consideration as a breakfast. Just imagine what a price for one's meal's victuals. It would have been the same as paying millions and millions of money, and as many millions more as would take forever to reckon up, for some fried trout, an egg, a potato, a hot cake, and a cup of coffee. It would be quite too dear, thought Midas. Nevertheless, so great was his hunger, and the perplexity of his situation, that he again groaned aloud, and very grievously too. Our pretty Marigold could endure it no longer. She sat a moment gazing at her father, and trying with all the might of her little wits to find out what was the matter with him. Then, with a sweet and sorrowful impulse to comfort him, she started from her chair, and running to Midas, threw her arms affectionately about his knees, he bent down and kissed her. He felt that his little daughter's love was worth a thousand times more than he had gained by the golden touch. "'My precious, precious Marigold!' cried he. But Marigold made no answer. Alas, what had he done? How fatal was the gift which the stranger bestowed! The moment the lips of Midas touched Marigold's forehead, a change had taken place. Her sweet rosy face, so full of affection as it had been, 
assumed a glittering yellow color with yellow teardrops congealing on her cheeks her beautiful brown ringlets took the same tint her soft and tender little form grew hard and inflexible within her father's encircling arms oh terrible misfortune the victim of his insatiable desire for wealth little marigold was a human child no longer but a golden statue yes there she was with a questioning look of love grief and pity hardened into her face it was the prettiest and most woeful sight that ever mortal saw all the features and tokens of marigold were there even the beloved little dimple remained in her golden chin but the more perfect was the resemblance the greater was the father's agony at beholding this golden image which was after all that was left him of a daughter it had been a favorite phrase of midas whenever he felt particularly fond of the child to say that she was worth her weight in gold and now the phrase had become literally true and now at last when it was too late he felt how infinitely a warm and tender heart that loved him exceeded in value all the wealth that could be piled up betwixt the earth and sky it would be too sad a story if i were to tell you how midas in the fullness of all his gratified desires began to wring his hands and bemoan himself and how he could neither bear to look at marigold nor yet to look away from her except when his eyes were fixed on the image he could not possibly believe that she was changed to gold but stealing another glance there was the precious little figure with a yellow teardrop on its yellow cheek and a look so piteous and tender that it seemed as if that very expression must needs soften the gold and make it flesh again this however could not be so midas had only to wring his hands and to wish that he were the poorest man in the wide world if the loss of all his wealth might bring back the faintest rose color to his dear child's face while he was in this tumult of despair he suddenly beheld a stranger standing near the door midas bent down his head without speaking for he recognized the same figure which had appeared to him the day before in the treasure room and had bestowed on him this disastrous faculty of the golden touch the stranger's countenance still wore a smile which seemed to shed a yellow luster all about the room and gleamed on little marigold's image and on the other objects that had been transmuted by the touch of midas well friend midas said the stranger pray how do you succeed with the golden touch midas shook his head i am very miserable said he very miserable indeed exclaimed the stranger and how happens that have i not faithfully kept my promise with you have you not everything that your heart desired gold is not everything answered midas and i have lost all that my heart really cared for ah so you have made a discovery since yesterday observed the stranger let us see then which of these two things do you think is really worth the most the gift of the golden touch or one cup of clear cold water oh blessed water exclaimed midas i will never moisten my parched throat again the golden touch continued the stranger or a crust of bread a piece of bread answered midas is worth all the gold on earth the golden touch asked the stranger or your own little marigold warm soft and loving as she was an hour ago oh my child my dear child cried poor midas wringing his hands i would not have given that one small dimple in her chin for the power of changing this whole big earth into a solid lump of gold you are wiser than you were king midas said the stranger looking seriously at him your own heart i perceive has not been entirely changed from flesh to gold were it so your case would indeed be desperate but you appear to be still capable of understanding that the commonest things such as lie within everybody's grasp are more valuable than the riches which so many mortals sigh and struggle after tell me now 
Do you sincerely desire to rid yourself of this golden touch? It is hateful to me, replied Midas. A fly settled on his nose, but immediately fell to the floor, for it too had become gold. Midas shuddered. Go then, said the stranger, and plunge into the river that glides past the bottom of your garden. Take likewise a vase of the same water, and sprinkle it over any object that you may desire to change back again from gold into its former substance. If you do this in earnestness and sincerity, it may possibly repair the mischief which your avarice has occasioned. King Midas bowed low, and when he lifted his head, the lustrous stranger had vanished. You will easily believe that Midas lost no time in snatching up a great earthen pitcher, but alas me, it was no longer earthen after he touched it, and hastened to the riverside. As he scampered along and forced his way through the shrubbery, it was positively marvelous to see how the foliage turned yellow behind him, as if the autumn had been there and nowhere else. On reaching the river's brink, he plunged headlong in, without waiting so much as to pull off his shoes. Puff, 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 snorted King Midas, as his head emerged out of the water. Well, this is a really refreshing bath, and I think it must have quite washed away the golden touch. And now, for filling my pitcher. As he dipped the pitcher into the water, it gladdened his very heart to see it change from gold into the same good, honest earthen vessel which it had been before he touched it. He was conscious also of a change within himself. A cold, hard, and heavy weight seemed to have gone out of his bosom. No doubt his heart had been gradually losing its human substance and transmuting itself into insensible metal but had now softened back again into flesh. Perceiving a violet that grew on the bank of the river, Midas touched it with his finger, and was overjoyed to find that the delicate flower retained its purple hue instead of undergoing a yellow blight. The curse of the golden touch had, therefore, really been removed from him. King Midas hastened back to the palace and I suppose the servants knew not what to make of it when they saw their royal master so carefully bringing home an earthen pitcher of water. But that water, which was to undo all the mischief that his folly had wrought, was more precious to Midas than an ocean of molten gold could have been. The first thing he did, as you need hardly be told, was to sprinkle it by the handfuls over the golden figure of little Marigold. No sooner did it fall on her then you would have laughed to see how the rosy color came back to the dear child's cheek. And then she began to sneeze and sputter, and how astonished she was to find herself dripping wet, and her father still throwing more water over her. Pray do not, dear father, cried she, see how you have wet my nice frock, which I put on only this morning. For Marigold did not know that she had been a little golden statue nor could she remember anything that had happened since the moment when she ran with outstretched arms to comfort poor King Midas. Her father did not think it necessary to tell his beloved child how very foolish he had been, but contented himself with showing how much wiser he had now grown. For this purpose he led little Marigold into the garden, where he sprinkled all the remainder of the water over the rose bushes, and with such good effect that above five thousand roses recovered their beautiful bloom. There were two circumstances, however, which as long as he lived used to put King Midas in mind of the golden touch. One was that the sands of the river sparkled like gold. The other, that little Marigold's hair had now a golden tinge, which he had never observed in it before she had been transmuted by the effect of his kiss. This change of hue was really an improvement, and made Marigold's hair richer than in her babyhood. When King Midas had grown quite an old man, and used to trot Marigold's children on his knee, he was fond of telling them this marvellous story, pretty much as I have now told it to you. And then would he stroke their glossy ringlets, and tell them that their hair likewise had a rich shade of gold which they had inherited from their mother. And to tell you the truth, my precious little folks, quoth King Midas, diligently trotting the children all the while, ever since that morning 
I have hated the very sight of all other gold save this. End of section 8. Section 9 of Myths Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Susan Seibel. Myths Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section 9. The Gorgon's Head, Part 1. Perseus was the son of Danae, who was the daughter of a king. And when Perseus was a very little boy, some wicked people put his mother and himself into a chest and set them afloat upon the sea. The wind blew freshly and drove the chest away from the shore, and the uneasy billows tossed it up and down, while Danae clasped her child closely to her bosom and dreaded that some big wave would dash its foamy crest over them both. The chest sailed on, however, and neither sank nor was upset until, when night was coming, it floated so near an island that it got entangled in a fisherman's nets and was drawn out high and dry upon the sand. The island was called Seraphus, and it was reigned over by King Polydectes, who happened to be the fisherman's brother. This fisherman, I am glad to tell you, was an exceedingly humane and upright man. He showed great kindness to Danae and her little boy, and continued to befriend them, until Perseus had grown to be a handsome youth, very strong and active, and skillful in the use of arms. Long before this time, King Polydectus had seen the two strangers, the mother and her child, who had come to his dominions in a floating chest. As he was not good and kind like his brother the fisherman, but extremely wicked, he resolved to send Perseus on a dangerous enterprise in which he would probably be killed, and then to do some great mischief to Danae herself. So this bad-hearted king spent a long while in considering what was the most dangerous thing that a young man could possibly undertake to perform. At last, having hit upon an enterprise that promised to turn out as fatally as he desired, he sent for the youthful Perseus. The young man came to the palace and found the king sitting upon his throne. Perseus, said King Polydectes, smiling craftily upon him, you are grown up a fine young man. You and your good mother have received a great deal of kindness from myself, as well as from my worthy brother the fisherman, and I suppose you will not be sorry to repay some of it. Please, your majesty, answered Perseus, I would willingly risk my life to do so. Well then, continued the king, still with a cunning smile on his lips, I have a little adventure to propose to you, and, as you are a brave and enterprising youth, you will doubtless look upon it as a great piece of good luck to have so rare an opportunity of distinguishing yourself. You must know, my good Perseus, I think of getting married to the beautiful princess Hippodamia, and it is customary on these occasions to make the bride a present of some far-fetched and elegant curiosity. I have been a little perplexed, I must honestly confess, where to obtain anything likely to please a princess of her exquisite taste. But this morning, I flatter myself, I have thought of precisely the article. And can I assist your majesty in obtaining it? cried Perseus eagerly. You can, if you are as brave a youth as I believe you to be, replied King Polydectes, with the utmost graciousness of manner. The bridal gift which I have set my heart on presenting to the beautiful Hippodamia is the head of the Gorgon Medusa, with the snaky locks, and I depend on you, my dear Perseus, to bring it to me. So, as I am anxious to settle affairs with the princess, the sooner you go in quest of the Gorgon, the better I shall be pleased. I will set out to-morrow morning, answered Perseus. Pray do so, my gallant youth, rejoined the king. And Perseus, in cutting off the gorgon's head, be careful to make a clean stroke so as not to injure its appearance. You must bring it home in the very best condition in order to suit the exquisite taste of the beautiful princess Hippodamia. Perseus left the palace, but was scarcely out of hearing before Polydectes burst into a laugh, being greatly amused, wicked king that he was, to find how readily the young man fell into the snare. The news quickly spread abroad that Perseus had undertaken to cut off the head of Medusa with the snaky locks. Everybody was rejoiced, for most of the inhabitants of the island were as wicked as the king himself, 
and would have liked nothing better than to see some enormous mischief happen to Danae and her son. The only good man in this unfortunate island of Seraphis appears to have been the fisherman. As Perseus walked along, therefore, the people pointed after him and made mouths, and winked to one another, and ridiculed him as loudly as they dared. Ho, ho! cried they, Medusa's snakes will sting him soundly. Now there were three gorgons alive at that period, and they were the most strange and terrible monsters that had ever been since the world was made, or that have been seen in the after days, or that are likely to be seen in all time to come. I hardly know what sort of creature or hobgoblin to call them. They were three sisters, and seemed to have borne some distant resemblance to women, but were really a very frightful and mischievous species of dragon. It is indeed difficult to imagine what hideous beings these three sisters were, why instead of locks of hair, if you can believe me, they had each of them a hundred enormous snakes growing on their heads, all alive, twisting, wriggling, curling, and thrusting out their venomous tongues with forked stings at the end. The teeth of the gorgons were terribly long tusks. Their hands were made of brass, and their bodies were all over scales, which, if not iron, were something as hard and impenetrable. They had wings, too, and exceedingly splendid ones, I can assure you, for every feather in them was pure, bright, glittering, burnished gold, and they looked very dazzling, no doubt, when the gorgons were flying about in the sunshine. But when people happened to catch a glimpse of their glittering brightness aloft in the air, they seldom stopped to gaze but ran and hid themselves as speedily as they could. You will think, perhaps, that they were afraid of being stung by the serpents that served the gorgons instead of hair, or of having their heads bitten off by their ugly tusks, or of being all torn to pieces by their brazen claws. Well, to be sure, these were some of the dangers, but by no means the greatest, nor the most difficult to avoid. For the worst thing about these abominable gorgons was that, if once a poor mortal fixed his eyes full upon one of their faces, he was certain, that very instant, to be changed from warm flesh and blood into cold and lifeless stone. Thus, as you will easily perceive, it was a very dangerous adventure that the wicked King Polydectus had contrived for this innocent young man, Perseus himself, when he had thought over the matter, could not help seeing that he had very little chance of coming safely through it, and that he was far more likely to become a stone image than to bring back the head of Medusa with the snaky locks. For, not to speak of the other difficulties, there was the one which it would have puzzled an older man than Perseus to get over. Not only must he fight with and slay this golden-winged, iron-scaled, long-tusked, brazen-clawed, snaky-haired monster, but he must do it with his eyes shut or at least without so much as a glance at the enemy with whom he was contending. Else, while his arm was lifted to strike, he would stiffen into stone and stand with that uplifted arm for centuries, until time and the wind and weather should crumble him quite away. This would be a very sad thing to befall a young man who wanted to perform a great many brave deeds, and to enjoy a great deal of happiness in this bright and beautiful world. So disconsolate did these thoughts make him that Perseus could not bear to tell his mother what he had undertaken to do. He therefore took his shield, girded on his sword, and crossed over from the island to the mainland, where he sat down in a solitary place and hardly refrained from shedding tears. But while he was in this sorrowful mood, he heard a voice close beside him. Perseus, said the voice, why are you sad? He lifted his head from his hands in which he had hidden it, and behold, all alone, as Perseus had supposed himself to be, there was a stranger in the solitary place. It was a brisk, intelligent, and remarkably shrewd-looking young man with a cloak over his shoulders, an odd sort of cap on his head, a strangely twisted staff in his hand, and a short and very crooked sword hanging by his side. He was exceedingly light and active in his figure, like a person much accustomed to gymnastic exercises and well able to leap or run. Above all, the stranger had such a cheerful, knowing, and helpful aspect, though it was certainly a little mischievous into the bargain, that Perseus could not help feeling his spirits grow livelier as he gazed at him. Besides, being really a courageous youth, he felt greatly ashamed that anybody should have found him with tears in his eyes like a timid little schoolboy, when, after all, there might be no occasion for despair. So Perseus wiped his eyes and answered the stranger pretty briskly, putting on as brave a look as he could. 
I am not so very sad, he said, only thoughtful about an adventure that I have undertaken. Oh-ho, answered the stranger. Well, tell me all about it, and possibly I may be of service to you. I have helped a good many young men through adventures that looked difficult enough beforehand. Perhaps you may have heard of me. I have more names than one, but the name of Quicksilver suits me as well as any other. Tell me what the trouble is, and we will talk the matter over and see what can be done. The stranger's words and manners put Perseus into quite a different mood from his former one. He resolved to tell this Quicksilver all his difficulties, since he could not easily be worse off than he already was, and very possibly his new friend might give him some advice that would turn out well in the end. So he let the stranger know, in few words, precisely what the case was, how that King Polydectes wanted the head of Medusa with the snaky locks as a bridal gift for the beautiful Princess Hippodamia, and how he had undertaken to get it for him, but was afraid of being turned into stone. "'Ah, that would be a great pity,' said Quicksilver, with his mischievous smile. "'You would make a very handsome marble statue, it is true, and it would be a considerable number of centuries before you crumbled away. But on the whole, one would rather be a young man for a few years than a stone image for a great many.' "'Oh, far rather!' exclaimed Perseus, with the tears again standing in his eyes. "'And besides, what would my dear mother do if her beloved son were turned into a stone?' "'Well, well, let us hope that the affair will not turn out so very badly,' replied Quicksilver in an encouraging tone. "'I am the very person to help you, if anybody can. My sister and myself will do our utmost to bring you safe through the adventure, ugly as it now looks.' "'Your sister,' repeated Perseus. "'Yes, my sister,' said the stranger, "'she is very wise, I promise you, and as for myself, I generally have all my wits about me, such as they are. If you show yourself bold and cautious, and follow our advice, you need not fear being a stone image yet a while. But, first of all, you must polish your shield till you can see your face in it as distinctly as in a mirror.' This seemed to Perseus a rather odd beginning of the adventure for he thought it of far more consequence that this shield should be strong enough to defend him from the gorgon's brazen claws than that it should be bright enough to show him the reflection of his face. However, concluding that Quicksilver knew better than himself, he immediately set to work and scrubbed the shield with so much diligence and goodwill that it very quickly shone like the moon at harvest time. Quicksilver looked at it with a smile and nodded his approbation. Then, taking off his own short and crooked sword, he girded it about Perseus, instead of the one which he had before worn. "'No sword but mine will answer your purpose,' observed he. "'The blade has a most excellent temper, and will cut through iron and brass as easily as through the slenderest twig, and now we will set out. The next thing is to find the three grey women, who will tell us where to find the nymphs.' "'The three grey women?' cried Perseus, to whom this seemed only a new difficulty in the path of his adventure. "'Pray, who may the three grey women be? I've never heard of them before.' "'They are three very strange old ladies,' said Quicksilver, laughing. "'They have but one eye among them, and only one tooth. Moreover, you must find them out by starlight or in the dusk of the evening, for they never show themselves by light either of the sun or moon.' But, said Perseus, why should I waste my time with these three grey women? Would it not be better to set out at once in search of the terrible Gorgons? No, no, answered his friend. There are other things to be done before you can find your way to the Gorgons. There is nothing for it but to hunt up these old ladies, and when we meet with them, you may be sure that the Gorgons are not a great way off. Come, let's be stirring. Perseus, by this time, felt so much confidence in his companion's sagacity that he made no more objections, and professed himself ready to begin the adventure immediately. They accordingly set out, and walked at a pretty brisk pace, so brisk, indeed, that Perseus found it rather difficult to keep up with his nimble friend Quicksilver. To say the truth, he had a singular idea that Quicksilver was furnished with a pair of winged shoes which, of course, helped him along marvelously. And then, too, when Perseus looked sideways at him out of the corner of his eye, he seemed to see wings on the side of his head, although if he turned a full gaze there were no such things to be perceived but only an odd kind of cap. But at all events the twisted staff was evidently a great convenience to Quicksilver and enabled him to proceed so fast that Perseus, though a remarkably active young man, began to be out of breath. "'Here!' cried Quicksilver at last, for he knew well enough, rogue that he was, how hard Perseus found it to keep pace with him. "'Take you the staff, for you need it a great deal more than I. 
Are there no better walkers than yourself in the island of Seraphus? I could walk pretty well, said Perseus, glancing slyly at the companion's feet. If I had only a pair of winged shoes. We must see about getting you a pair, answered Quicksilver. But the staff helped Perseus along so bravely that he no longer felt the slightest weariness. In fact, the stick seemed to be alive in his hand, and to lend some of its life to Perseus. He and Quicksilver now walked onward at their ease, talking very sociably together, and Quicksilver told so many pleasant stories about his former adventures, and how well his wits had served him on various occasions, that Perseus began to think him a very wonderful person. He evidently knew the world, and nobody is so charming to a young man as a friend who has that kind of knowledge. Perseus listened more eagerly in the hope of brightening his own wits by what he heard. At last he happened to recollect that Quicksilver had spoken of a sister, who was to lend her assistance in the adventure which they were now bound upon. "'Where is she?' he inquired. "'Shall we not meet her soon?' "'All at the proper time,' said his companion. "'But this sister of mine, you must understand, is quite a different sort of character from myself. She is very grave and prudent, seldom smiles, never laughs, and makes it a rule not to utter a word unless she has something particularly profound to say. Neither will she listen to any but the wisest conversation. Dear me, ejaculated Perseus, I shall be afraid to say a syllable. She is a very accomplished person, I assure you, continued Quicksilver, and has all the arts and sciences at her fingers' ends. In short, she is so immoderately wise that many people call her wisdom personified. But to tell you the truth, she has hardly vivacity enough for my taste, and I think you would scarcely find her so pleasant a travelling companion as myself. She has her good points, nevertheless, but you will find the benefit of them in your encounter with the Gorgons. By this time it had grown quite dusk. They were now come to a very wild and desert place, overgrown with shaggy bushes, and so silent and solitary that nobody seemed ever to have dwelt or journeyed there. All was waste and desolate in the grey twilight, which grew every moment more obscure. Perseus looked about him rather disconsolately, and asked Quicksilver whether they had a great deal farther to go. "'Hist, hist!' whispered his companion. "'Make no noise. This is just the time and place to meet the three grey women.' Be careful that they do not see you before you see them, for, though they have but a single eye among the three, it is as sharp-sighted as half a dozen common eyes. But what must I do? asked Perseus, when we meet them. Quicksilver explained to Perseus how the three grey women managed with their one eye. They were in the habit, it seems, of changing it from one to the other, as if it had been a pair of spectacles or, which would have better suited them, a quizzing-glass. When one of the three had kept the eye a certain time, she took it out of the socket and passed it to one of her sisters, whose turn it might happen to be, and who immediately clapped it into her own head and enjoyed a peep at the visible world. Thus it will easily be understood that only one of the three grey women could see, while the other two were in utter darkness, and, moreover, at the instant when the eye was passed from hand to hand, neither of the poor old ladies was able to see a wink. I have heard of a great many strange things in my day, and have witnessed not a few, but none, it seems to me, can compare with the oddity of these three grey women, all peeping through a single eye. So thought Perseus likewise, and was so astonished that he almost fancied his companion was joking with him, and that there were no such old women in the world. You will soon find whether I tell the truth or no, observed Quicksilver. Hark! Hush! Hist! Hist! There they come now! Perseus looked earnestly through the dusk of the evening, and there, sure enough, at no great distance off, he descried the three grey women, the light being so faint that he could not well make out what sort of figures they were. Only he discovered that they had long grey hair, and, as they came nearer, he saw that two of them had but the empty socket of an eye in the middle of their foreheads. But in the middle of the third sister's forehead there was a very large, bright, and piercing eye which sparkled like a great diamond in a ring and so penetrating did it seem to be that perseus could not help thinking it must possess the gift of seeing in the darkest midnight just as perfectly as at noonday the sight of three persons eyes was melted and collected into that single one end of section nine section ten of myths every child should know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Myths Every Child Should Know Edited by Hamilton Wright Mabby The Gorgon's Head, Part Two Thus the three old dames got along about as comfortably, upon the whole, as if they could all see at once. She, who chanced to have the eye in her forehead, led the other two by the hands, peeping sharply about her all the while, insomuch that Perseus dreaded lest she should see right through the thick clump of bushes behind which he and Quicksilver had hidden themselves. My stars! It was positively terrible to be within reach of so very sharp an eye. But before they reached the clump of bushes, one of the three gray women spoke. Sister, sister Scarecrow, cried she, you have had the eye long enough. It is my turn now. Let me keep it a moment longer, sister Nightmare, answered Scarecrow. I thought I had a glimpse of something behind that thick bush. Well, and what of that? retorted Nightmare peevishly. Can't I see into a thick bush as easily as yourself? The eye is mine as well as yours, and I know the use of it as well as you, or maybe a little better. I insist upon taking a peep immediately. But here the third sister, whose name was Shake Joint, began to complain and said that it was her turn to have the eye, and that Scarecrow and Nightmare wanted to keep it all to themselves. To end the dispute, old Dame Scarecrow took the eye out of her forehead and held it forth in her hand. "'Take it, one of you,' cried she, "'and quit this foolish quarreling. For my part I shall be glad of a little thick darkness. Take it quickly, however, or I must clap it into my own head again.' Accordingly, both Nightmare and Shake Joint put out their hands, groping eagerly to snatch the eye out of the hand of Scarecrow, but, being both alike blind, they could not easily find where Scarecrow's hand was, and Scarecrow, being now just as much in the dark as Shake Joint and Nightmare, could not at once meet either of their hands, in order to put the eye into it. Thus, as you will see with half an eye, my wise little auditors, these good old dames had fallen into a strange perplexity, for though the eye shone and glistened like a star as Scarecrow held it out, yet the gray women caught not the least glimpse of its light, and were all three in utter darkness, from too impatient a desire to see. Quicksilver was so much tickled at beholding Shakejoint and Nightmare, both groping for the eye, and each finding fault with Scarecrow and one another, that he could scarcely help laughing aloud. "'Now is your time,' he whispered to Perseus. "'Quick, quick, before they can clap the eye into either of their heads, rush out upon the old ladies, and snatch it from Scarecrow's hand.' In an instant, while the three gray women were still scolding each other, Perseus leaped from behind the clump of bushes and made himself master of the prize. The marvelous eye, as he held it in his hand, shone very brightly and seemed to look up into his face with a knowing air and an expression as if it would have winked had it been provided with a pair of eyelids for that purpose. But the gray women knew nothing of what had happened, and each supposing that one of her sisters was in possession of the eye, they began their quarrel anew. At last, as Perseus did not wish to put these respectable dames to greater inconvenience than was really necessary, he thought it right to explain the matter. "'My good ladies,' said he, "'pray do not be angry with one another. If anybody is in fault, it is myself.' for I have the honor to hold your very brilliant and excellent eye in my own hand. You, you have our eye, and who are you? screamed the three gray women, all in a breath, for they were terribly frightened, of course, 
shocked at hearing a strange voice, and discovering that their eyesight had got into the hands of they could not guess whom. Oh, what shall we do, sisters, what shall we do? We are all in the dark. Give us our eye, give us our one precious solitary eye. You have two of your own, give us our eye. Tell them, whispered Quicksilver to Perseus, that they shall have back the eye as soon as they direct you where to find the nymphs who have the flying slippers, the magic wallet, and the helmet of darkness. My dear, good, admirable old ladies, said Perseus, addressing the grey women, there is no occasion for putting yourselves into such a fright. I am by no means a bad young man. You shall have back your eye, safe and sound, and as bright as ever, the moment you tell me where to find the nymphs. The nymphs? Goodness me, sisters, what nymphs does he mean? screamed Scarecrow. There are a great many nymphs, people say, some that go a-hunting in the woods, and some that live inside of trees, and some that have a comfortable home in fountains of water. We know nothing at all about them. We are three unfortunate old souls that go wandering about in the dusk, and never had but one eye amongst us, and that one you have stolen away. Oh, give it back, good stranger. Whoever you are, give it back. All this while, the three gray women were groping with their outstretched hands and trying their utmost to get hold of Perseus. But he took good care to keep out of their reach. My respectable dames, said he, for his mother had taught him always to use the greatest civility. I hold your eye fast in my hand, and shall keep it safely for you, until you please to tell me where to find these nymphs. The nymphs, I mean, who keep the enchanted wallet, the flying slippers, and the, what is it, the helmet of invisibility. Mercy on us, sisters! What is the young man talking about? exclaimed Scarecrow, Nightmare and Shake Joint, one to another, with great appearance of astonishment. A pair of flying slippers, quoth he. His heels would quickly fly higher than his head if he was silly enough to put them on. And a helmet of invisibility. How could a helmet make him invisible, unless it were big enough for him to hide under it? And an enchanted wallet. What sort of a contrivance may that be, I wonder? No, no, good stranger, we can tell you nothing of these marvelous things. You have two eyes of your own, and we have but a single one amongst us three. You can find out such wonders better than three blind old creatures like us. Perseus, hearing them talk in this way, began really to think that the gray women knew nothing of the matter, and as it grieved him to have put them to so much trouble, he was just on the point of restoring their eye and asking pardon for his rudeness in snatching it away. But Quicksilver caught his hand. Don't let them make a fool of you, said he. These three gray women are the only persons in the world that can tell you where to find the nymphs. And unless you get that information, you will never succeed in cutting off the head of Medusa with the snaky locks. Keep fast hold of the eye, and all will go well. As it turned out, Quicksilver was in the right. There are but few things that people prize so much as they do their eyesight, and the gray women valued their single eye as highly as if it had been half a dozen, which was the number they ought to have had. Finding that there was no other way of recovering it, they at last told Perseus what he wanted to know. No sooner had they done so than he immediately, and with the utmost respect, clapped the eye into the vacant socket in one of their foreheads, thanked them for their kindness, and bade them farewell. Before the young man was out of hearing, however, they had got into a new dispute, because he happened to have given the eye to Scarecrow, who had already taken her turn of it, when their trouble with Perseus commenced. It is greatly to be feared that the three gray women were 
very much in the habit of disturbing their mutual harmony by bickerings of this sort, which was the more pity, as they could not conveniently do without one another, and were evidently intended to be inseparable companions. As a general rule, I would advise all people, whether sisters or brothers, old or young, who chance to have but one eye amongst them, to cultivate forbearance, and not all insist upon peeping through it at once. Quicksilver and Perseus, in the meantime, were making the best of their way in quest of the nymphs. The old dames had given them such particular directions that they were not long in finding them out. They proved to be very different persons from Nightmare, Shakejoint, and Scarecrow, for instead of being old, they were young and beautiful, and instead of one eye amongst the sisterhood, each nymph had two exceedingly bright eyes of her own, with which she looked very kindly at Perseus. They seemed to be acquainted with Quicksilver, and when he told them the adventure which Perseus had undertaken, they made no difficulty about giving him the valuable articles that were in their custody. In the first place, they brought out what appeared to be a small purse made of deer-skin, and curiously embroidered, and bade him be sure and keep it safe. This was the magic wallet. The nymphs next produced a pair of shoes, or slippers, or sandals, with a nice little pair of wings at the heel of each. Put them on, Perseus, said Quicksilver. You will find yourself as light-heeled as you can desire for the remainder of our journey. So Perseus proceeded to put one of the slippers on, while he laid the other on the ground by his side. Unexpectedly, however, this other slipper spread its wings, fluttered up off the ground, and would probably have flown away if Quicksilver had not made a leap, and luckily caught it in the air. Be more careful, said he, as he gave it back to Perseus. It would frighten the birds up aloft, if they should see a flying slipper amongst them. When Perseus had got on both of these wonderful slippers, he was altogether too buoyant to tread on earth. Making a step or two, lo and behold, upward he popped into the air, high above the heads of Quicksilver and the nymphs, and found it very difficult to clamber down again. Winged slippers and all such high-flying contrivances are seldom quite easy to manage until one grows a little accustomed to them. Quicksilver laughed at his companion's involuntary activity and told him that he must not be in so desperate a hurry, but must wait for the invisible helmet. The good-natured nymphs had the helmet with its dark tuft of waving plumes all in readiness to put upon his head. And now there happened about as wonderful an incident as anything that I have yet told you. The instant before the helmet was put on, there stood Perseus, a beautiful young man with golden ringlets and rosy cheeks, the crooked sword by his side, and the brightly polished shield upon his arm, a figure that seemed all made up of courage, sprightliness, and glorious light. But when the helmet had descended over his white brow, there was no longer any Perseus to be seen. Nothing but empty air, even the helmet that covered him with its invisibility, had vanished. "'Where are you, Perseus?' asked Quicksilver. "'Why, here, to be sure,' answered Perseus, very quietly, although his voice seemed to come out of the transparent atmosphere. "'Just where I was a moment ago. Don't you see me?' "'No, indeed,' answered his friend. "'You are hidden under the helmet. But if I cannot see you, neither can the Gorgons. Follow me, therefore, and we will try your dexterity in using the winged slippers.' With these words, Quicksilver's cap spread its wings, as if his head were about to fly away from his shoulders, but his whole figure rose lightly into the air, and Perseus followed. By the time they had ascended a few hundred feet, the young man began to feel what a delightful thing it was to leave the dull earth so far beneath him, and to be able to flit about 
like a bird. It was now deep night. Perseus looked upward and saw the round, bright, silvery moon and thought that he should desire nothing better than to soar up thither and spend his life there. Then he looked downward again and saw the earth with its seas and lakes and the silver courses of its rivers and its snowy mountain peaks and the breadth of its fields and the dark cluster of its woods and its cities of white marble and with the moonshine sleeping over the whole scene it was as beautiful as the moon or any star could be and among other objects he saw the island of seraphis where his dear mother was sometimes he and quicksilver approached a cloud that at a distance looked as if it were made of fleecy silver although when they plunged into it they found themselves chilled and moistened with gray mist so swift was their flight however that in an instant they emerged from the cloud into the moonlight again once a high soaring eagle flew right against the invisible perseus the bravest sights were the meteors that gleamed suddenly out as if a bonfire had been kindled in the sky and made the moonshine pale for as much as a hundred miles around them as the two companions flew onward perseus fancied that he could hear the rustle of a garment close by his side and it was on the side opposite to the one where he beheld quicksilver yet only quicksilver was visible whose garment is this inquired perseus that keeps rustling close beside me in the breeze oh it is my sister's answered quicksilver she is coming along with us as i told you she would we could do nothing without the help of my sister you have no idea how wise she is she has such eyes too why she can see you at this moment just as distinctly as if you were not invisible and i'll venture to say she will be the first to discover the gorgons by this time in their swift voyage through the air they had come within sight of the great ocean and were soon flying over it far beneath them the waves tossed themselves tumultuously in mid-sea or roiled a white surf line upon the long beaches or foamed against the rocky cliffs with a roar that was thunderous in the lower world although it became a gentle murmur like the voice of a baby half asleep before it reached the ears of perseus just then a voice spoke in the air close by him it seemed to be a woman's voice and was melodious though not exactly what might be called sweet but grave and mild perseus said the voice there are the gorgons where exclaimed perseus i cannot see them on the shore of that island beneath you replied the voice a pebble dropped from your hand would strike in the midst of them i told you she would be the first to discover them said quicksilver to perseus and there they are straight downward two or three thousand feet below him perseus perceived a small island with the sea breaking into white foam all around its rocky shore except on one side where there was a beach of snowy sand he descended toward it and looking earnestly at a cluster or heap of brightness at the foot of a precipice of black rocks behold there were the terrible gorgons they lay fast asleep soothed by the thunder of the sea for it required a tumult that would have deafened everybody else to lull such fierce creatures into slumber the moonlight glistened on their steely scales and on their golden wings which drooped idly over the sand their brazen claws horrible to look at were thrust out and clutched the wave-beaten fragments of rock while the sleeping gorgons dreamed of tearing some poor mortal all to pieces the snakes that served them instead of hair seemed likewise to be asleep although 
now and then one would writhe and lift its head and thrust out its forked tongue emitting a drowsy hiss and then let itself subside among its sister snakes the gorgons were more like an awful gigantic kind of insect immense golden-winged beetles or dragonflies or things of that sort at once ugly and beautiful than like anything else only that they were a thousand and a million times as big and with all this there was something partly human about them too luckily for perseus their faces were completely hidden from him by the posture in which they lay for had he but looked one instant at them he would have fallen heavily out of the air an image of senseless stone now whispered quicksilver as he hovered by the side of perseus now is your time to do the deed be quick for if one of the gorgons should awake you are too late which shall i strike at asked perseus drawing his sword and descending a little lower they all three look alike all three have snaky locks which of the three is medusa it must be understood that medusa was the only one of these dragon monsters whose head perseus could possibly cut off as for the other two let him have the sharpest sword that ever was forged and he might have hacked away by the hour together without doing them the least harm be cautious said the calm voice which had before spoken to him one of the gorgons is staring in her sleep and is just about to turn over that is medusa do not look at her the sight would turn you to stone look at the reflection of her face and figure in the bright mirror of your shield perseus now understood quicksilver's motive for so earnestly exhorting him to polish his shield in its surface he could safely look at the reflection of the gorgon's face and there it was that terrible countenance mirrored in the brightness of the shield with the moonlight falling over it and displaying all its horror the snakes whose venomous natures could not altogether sleep kept twisting themselves over the forehead it was the fiercest and most horrible face that ever was seen or imagined and yet with a strange fearful and savage kind of beauty in it the eyes were closed and the gorgon was still in a deep slumber but there was an unquiet expression disturbing her features as if the monster was troubled with an ugly dream she gnashed her white tusks and dug into the sand with her brazen claws the snakes too seemed to feel medusa's dream and to be made more restless by it they twined themselves into tumultuous knots writhed fiercely and uplifted a hundred hissing heads without opening their eyes now now whispered quicksilver who was growing impatient make a dash at the monster but be calm said the grave melodious voice at the young man's side look in your shield as you fly downward and take care that you do not miss your first stroke perseus flew cautiously downward still keeping his eyes on medusa's face as reflected in his shield the nearer he came the more terrible did the snaky visage and metallic body of the monster grow at last when he found himself hovering over her within arm's length perseus uplifted his sword while at the same instant each separate snake upon the gorgon's head stretched threateningly upward and medusa unclosed her eyes but she awoke too late the sword was sharp the stroke fell like a lightning flash and the head of the wicked medusa tumbled from her body 
admirably done, cried Quicksilver. Make haste and clap the head into your magic wallet. To the astonishment of Perseus, the small embroidered wallet which he had hung about his neck and which had hitherto been no bigger than a purse grew all at once large enough to contain Medusa's head. As quick as thought, he snatched it up with the snakes still writhing upon it and thrust it in. Your task is done, said the calm voice. Now fly, for the other Gorgons will do their utmost to take vengeance for Medusa's death. It was indeed necessary to take flight, for Perseus had not done the deed so quietly but that the clash of his sword and the hissing of the snakes and the thump of Medusa's head as it tumbled upon the sea-beaten sand awoke the other two monsters. There they sat, for an instant, sleepily rubbing their eyes with their brazen fingers, while all the snakes on their heads reared themselves on end with surprise and with venomous malice against they knew not what. But when the Gorgons saw the scaly carcass of Medusa, headless, and her golden wings all ruffled and half spread out on the sand, it was really awful to hear what yells and screeches they set up. And then the snakes, they sent forth a hundredfold hiss with one consent, and Medusa's snakes answered them out of the magic wallet. No sooner were the Gorgons broad awake than they hurtled upward into the air, brandishing their brass talons, gnashing their horrible tusks, and flapping their huge wings so wildly that some of the golden feathers were shaken out and floated down upon the shore. And there, perhaps, those very feathers lie scattered till this day. Up rose the Gorgons, as I tell you, staring horribly about in hopes of turning somebody to stone. Had Perseus looked them in the face, or had he fallen into their clutches, his poor mother would never have kissed her boy again. But he took good care to turn his eyes another way, and as he wore the helmet of invisibility, the Gorgons knew not in what direction to follow him, nor did he fail to make the best use of the winged slippers by soaring upward a perpendicular mile or so. At that height, when the screams of those abominable creatures sounded faintly beneath him, he made a straight course for the island of Seraphis in order to carry Medusa's head to King Polydectes. I have no time to tell you of several marvelous things that befell Perseus on his way homeward, such as his killing a hideous sea monster just as it was on the point of devouring a beautiful maiden nor how he changed an enormous giant into a mountain of stone, merely by showing him the head of the Gorgon. If you doubt this latter story, you may make a voyage to Africa some day or other, and see the very mountain which is still known by the ancient giant's name. Finally, our brave Perseus arrived at the island where he expected to see his dear mother. But during his absence the wicked king had treated Danae so very ill that she was compelled to make her escape and had taken refuge in a temple where some good old priests were extremely kind to her. These praiseworthy priests and the kind-hearted fishermen who had first shown hospitality to Danae and little Perseus when he found them afloat in the chest seemed to have been the only persons on the island who cared about doing right. All the rest of the people, as well as King Polydectes himself, were remarkably ill-behaved, and deserved no better destiny than that which was now to happen. Not finding his mother at home, Perseus went straight to the palace, and was immediately ushered into the presence of the king. Polydectes was by no means rejoiced to see him, 
for he had felt almost certain in his own evil mind that the gorgons would have torn the poor young man to pieces and have eaten him up out of the way however seeing him safely returned he put the best face he could upon the matter and asked perseus how he had succeeded have you performed your promise inquired he have you brought me the head of medusa with the snaky locks if not young man it will cost you dear for i must have a bridal present for the beautiful princess hippodamia and there is nothing else that she would admire so much yes please your majesty answered perseus in a quiet way as if it were no very wonderful deed for such a young man as he to perform i have brought you the gorgon's head snaky locks and all indeed pray let me see it quoth king polydectes it must be a very curious spectacle if all that travellers tell about it be true your majesty is in the right replied perseus it is really an object that will be pretty certain to fix the regards of all who look at it and if your majesty think fit i would suggest that a holiday be proclaimed and that all your majesty's subjects be summoned to behold this wonderful curiosity few of them i imagine have seen a gorgon's head before and perhaps never may again the king well knew that his subjects were an idle set of reprobates and very fond of sight-seeing as idle persons usually are so he took the young man's advice and sent out heralds and messengers in all directions to blow the trumpet at the street corners and in the market places and wherever two roads met and summon everybody to court thither accordingly came a great multitude of good-for-nothing vagabonds all of whom out of pure love of mischief would have been glad if perseus had met with some ill hap in his encounter with the gorgons if there were any better people in the island as i really hope there may have been although the story tells nothing about any such they stayed quietly at home minding their business and taking care of their little children most of the inhabitants at all events ran as fast as they could to the palace and shoved and pushed and elbowed one another in their eagerness to get near a balcony on which perseus showed himself holding the embroidered wallet in his hand on a platform within full view of the balcony sat the mighty king polydectes amid his evil counsellors and with his flattering courtiers in a semicircle round about him monarch counsellors courtiers and subjects all gazed eagerly toward perseus show us the head show us the head shouted the people and there was a fierceness in their cry as if they would tear perseus to pieces unless he should satisfy them with what he had to show show us the head of medusa with the snaky locks a feeling of sorrow and pity came over the youthful perseus o king polydectes cried he and ye many people i am very loath to show you the gorgon's head ah the villain and coward yelled the people more fiercely than before he is making game of us he has no gorgon's head show us the head if you have it or we will take your own head for a football the evil counsellors whispered bad advice in the king's ear the courtiers murmured with one consent that perseus had shown disrespect to their royal lord and master and the great king polydectes himself waved his hand and ordered him with the stern deep voice of authority on his peril to produce the head show me the gorgon's head or i will cut off your own and perseus sighed this 
instant, repeated Polydectes, or you die. Behold it, then, cried Perseus, in a voice like the blast of a trumpet. And suddenly, holding up the head, not an eyelid had time to wink before the wicked King Polydectes, his evil counselors, and all his fierce subjects were no longer anything but the mere images of a monarch and his people. They were all fixed forever in the look and attitude of that moment, at the first glimpse of the terrible head of Medusa, they whitened into marble, and Perseus thrust the head back into his wallet and went to tell his dear mother that she need no longer be afraid of the wicked king Polydectes. End of section 10「Section 11 of Myths Every Child Should Know」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Geller Myths Every Child Should Know Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe Section 11 The Dragon's Teeth Part 1 Chapter 6 The Dragon's Teeth Cadmus, Phoenix, and Cilix, the three sons of King Agenor, and their little sister Europa, who was a very beautiful child, were at play together near the seashore in their father's kingdom of Phoenicia. They had rambled to some distance from the palace where the parents dwelt, and were now in a verdant meadow, on one side of which lay the sea, all sparkling and dimpling in the sunshine, and murmuring gently against the beach. The three boys were very happy, gathering flowers and twining them into garlands, with which they adorned the little Europa. Seated on the grass, the child was almost hidden under an abundance of buds and blossoms, whence her rosy face peeped merrily out, and, as Cadmus said, was the prettiest of all the flowers. Just then there came a splendid butterfly fluttering along the meadow, and Cadmus, Phoenix, and Cilix set off in pursuit of it, crying out that it was a flower with wings. Europa, who was a little wearied with playing all day long, did not chase the butterfly with her brothers, but sat still where they had left her, and closed her eyes. For a while she listened to the pleasant murmur of the sea, which was like a voice saying, Hush! and bidding her to go to sleep. But the pretty child, if she slept at all, could not have slept more than a moment when she heard something trample on the grass, not far from her, and peeping out from the heap of flowers, beheld a snow-white bull. And whence could this bull have come? Europa and her brothers had been a long time playing in the meadow, and had seen no cattle nor other living thing, either there or on the neighboring hills. "'Brother Cadmus!' cried Europa, starting up out of the midst of the roses and lilies. "'Phoenix! Silix! Where are you all? Help! Help! Come and drive away this bull!' But her brothers were too far off to hear, especially as the fright took away Europa's voice and hindered her from calling very loudly. So there she stood, with her pretty mouth wide open, as pale as the white lilies that were twisted among the other flowers in her garlands. Nevertheless, it was the suddenness with which she had perceived the bull, rather than anything frightful in his appearance, that caused Europa so much alarm. On looking at him more attentively, she began to see that he was a beautiful animal, and even fancied a particularly amiable expression in his face. As for his breath, the breath of cattle, you know, is always sweet, it was as fragrant as if he had been grazing on no other food than rosebuds, or, at least, the most delicate of clover blossoms. Never before did a bull have such bright and tender eyes, and such smooth horns of ivory as this one. And the bull ran little races and capered sportively about the child, so that she quite forgot how big and strong he was, from the gentleness and playfulness of his actions, soon came to consider him as innocent a creature as a pet lamb. Thus, frightened as she at first was, 
You might by and by have seen Europa stroking the bull's forehead with her small white hand, and taking the garlands off her own head to hang them on his neck and ivory horns. Then she pulled up some blades of grass, and he ate them out of her hand, not as if he were hungry, but because he wanted to be friends with the child, and took pleasure in eating what she had touched. Well, my stars, was there ever such a gentle, sweet, pretty, and amiable creature as this bull, and ever such a nice playmate for a little girl? When the animal saw, for the bull had so much intelligence that it is really wonderful to think of, when he saw that Europa was no longer afraid of him, he grew overjoyed and could hardly contain himself for delight. He frisked about the meadow, now here, now there, making sprightly leaps, with as little effort as a bird expends in hopping from twig to twig. Indeed, his motion was as light as if he were flying through the air, and his hoofs seemed hardly to leave their print in the grassy soil over which he trod. With his spotless hue he resembled a snowdrift wafted along by the wind. Once he galloped so far away that Europa feared lest she might never see him again. So, setting up her childish voice, she called him back. "'Come back, pretty creature,' she cried. "'Here is a nice clover blossom.' And then it was delightful to witness the gratitude of this amiable bull, and how he was so full of joy and thankfulness that he capered higher than ever. He came running and bowed his head before Europa, as if he knew her to be a king's daughter, or else recognized the important truth that a little girl is everybody's queen. And not only did the bull bend his neck, he absolutely knelt down at her feet, and made such intelligent nods and other inviting gestures that Europa understood what he meant just as well as if he had put it in so many words. "'Come, dear child,' was what he wanted to say. "'Let me give you a ride on my back.' At the first thought of such a thing, Europa drew back. But then she considered in her wise little head that there could be no possible harm in taking just one gallop on the back of this docile and friendly animal, who would certainly set her down the very instant she desired it, and how it would surprise her brothers to see her riding across the green meadow, and what merry times they might have, either taking turns for a gallop, or clambering on the gentle creature, all four children together, and careening round the field with shouts of laughter that would be heard as far off as King Agenor's palace. "'I think I will do it,' said the child to herself. "'And indeed, why not?' She cast a glance around, and caught a glimpse of Cadmus, Phoenix, and Silix, who were still in pursuit of the butterfly almost at the other end of the meadow. It would be the quickest way of rejoining them to get upon the white bull's back. She came a step nearer to him, therefore, and, sociable creature that he was, he showed so much joy at this mark of her confidence that the child could not find it in her heart to hesitate any longer. Making one bound, for this little princess was as active as a squirrel, there sat Europa on the beautiful bull, holding an ivory horn in each hand lest she should fall off. "'Softly, pretty bull, softly,' she said rather frightened at what she had done. Do not gallop too fast. Having got the child on his back, the animal gave a leap into the air and came down so like a feather that Europa did not know when his hoofs touched the ground. He then began to race to that part of the flowery plain where her three brothers were and where they had just caught their splendid butterfly. Europa screamed with delight and Phoenix, Silix, and Cadmus stood gaping at the spectacle of their sister mounted on a white bull, not knowing whether to be frightened or to wish the same good luck for themselves. The gentle and innocent creature, for who could possibly doubt that he was so, pranced round among the children as sportively as a kitten. Europa all the while looked down upon her brothers, nodding and laughing, but yet with a sort of stateliness in her rosy little face. As the bull wheeled about to take another gallop across the meadow, the child waved her hand and said, "Goodbye," playfully pretending that she was now bound on a distant journey, and might not see her brothers again, for nobody could tell how long. "Goodbye," shouted Cadmus, Phoenix, and Silix, all in one breath. But together with her enjoyment of the sport, there was still a little remnant of fear in the child's heart, so that her last look at the three boys was a troubled one, 
and made them feel as if their dear sister were really leaving them forever. And what do you think the snowy bull did next? Why, he set off, as swift as the wind, straight down to the seashore, scampered across the sand, took an airy leap, and plunged right in among the foaming billows. The white spray rose in a shower over him and little Europa, and fell spattering down upon the water. Then what a scream of terror did the poor child send forth! The three brothers screamed manfully likewise and ran to the shore as fast as their legs would carry them, with Cadmus at their head. But it was too late. When they reached the margin of the sand, the treacherous animal was already far away in the wide blue sea, with only his snowy head and tail emerging, and poor little Europa between them, stretching out one hand toward her dear brothers, while she grasped the bull's ivory horn with the other. And there stood Cadmus, Phoenix, and Cilix, gazing at this sad spectacle through their tears, until they could no longer distinguish the bull's snowy head from the white-capped billows that seemed to boil up out of the sea's depths around him. Nothing more was ever seen of the white bull, nothing more of the beautiful child. This was a mournful story, as you may well think, for the three boys to carry home to their parents. King Agenor, their father, was the ruler of the whole country, but he loved his little daughter Europa better than his kingdom, or than all his other children, or than anything else in the world. Therefore, when Cadmus and his two brothers came crying home, and told him how that a white bull had carried off their sister, and swam with her over the sea, the king was quite beside himself with grief and rage. Although it was now twilight and fast growing dark, he bade them set out instantly in search of her. "'Never shall you see my face again,' he cried, "'unless you bring me back my little Europa, to gladden me with her smiles and her pretty ways. Be gone, and enter my presence no more, till you come leading her by the hand.' As King Agenor said this, his eyes flashed fire, for he was a very passionate king, and he looked so terribly angry that the poor boys did not even venture to ask for their suppers, but slunk away out of the palace, and only paused on the steps a moment to consult whither they should go first. While they were standing there all in dismay, their mother, Queen Telephassa, who happened not to be by when they told the story to the king, came hurrying after them, and said that she, too, would go in quest of her daughter. "'Oh, no, mother!' cried the boys. "'The night is dark, and there is no knowing what troubles and perils we may meet with.' "'Alas, my dear children,' answered poor Queen Telephassa, weeping bitterly, "'that is only another reason why I should go with you. If I should lose you too, as well as my little Europa, what would become of me?' And let me go likewise, said their playfellow Thassus, who came running to join them. Thassus was the son of a seafaring person in the neighborhood. He had been brought up with the young princess, and was their intimate friend, and loved Europa very much, so they consented that he should accompany them. The whole party, therefore, set forth together. Cadmus, Phoenix, Cilix, and Thassus clustered around Queen Telephassa, grasping her skirts, and begging her to lean upon their shoulders whenever she felt weary. In this manner they went down the palace steps, and began a journey which turned out to be a great deal longer than they dreamed of. The last that they saw of King Agenor he came to the door, with a servant holding a torch beside him, and called after them into the gathering darkness. Remember! Never ascend these steps again without the child. Never, sobbed Queen Telephassa. And the three brothers in Thassus answered, Never, 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 never. And they kept their word. Year after year King Agenor sat in the solitude of his beautiful palace, listening in vain for their returning footsteps, hoping to hear the familiar voice of the queen and the cheerful talk of his sons and their playfellow Thassus entering the door together, and the sweet childish accents of little Europa in the midst of them. But so long a time went by that at last, if they had really come, the king would not have known that this was the voice of Telephassa, 
and these the younger voices that used to make such joyful echoes when the children were playing about the palace. We must now leave King Agenor to sit on his throne, and must go along with Queen Telephassa and her four youthful companions. They went on and on, and travelled a long way, and passed over mountains and rivers, and sailed over seas. Here and there and everywhere they made continual inquiry if any person could tell them what had become of Europa. The rustic people of whom they asked this question paused a little while from their labours in the field and looked very much surprised. They thought it strange to behold a woman in the garb of a queen, for Telephassa in her haste had forgotten to take off her crown and her royal robes, roaming about the country with four lads around her on such an errand as this seemed to be. But nobody could give them any tidings of Europa. Nobody had seen a little girl dressed like a princess, and mounted on a snow-white bull, which galloped as swiftly as the wind. I cannot tell you how long Queen Telephassa, and Cadmus, Phoenix, and Cilix, her three sons, and Thassus, their playfellow, went wandering along the highways and bypaths, or through the pathless wilderness of the earth in this manner. But certain it is that, before they reached any place of rest, their splendid garments were quite worn out. They all looked very much travel-stained, and would have had the dust of many countries on their shoes if the streams through which they had waded had not washed it all away. When they had been gone a year, Telephassa threw away her crown, because it chafed her forehead. "'It has given me many a headache,' said the poor queen, "'and it cannot cure my heartache.' As fast as their princely robes got torn and tattered, they exchanged them for such mean attire as ordinary people wore. By and by they came to have a wild and homeless aspect, so that you would much sooner have taken them for a gypsy family than a queen and three princes and a young nobleman, who had once a palace for their home, and a train of servants to do their bidding. The four boys grew up to be tall young men, with sunburnt faces. Each of them girded on a sword to defend themselves against the perils of the way. When the husbandmen, at whose farmhouses they sought hospitality, needed their assistance in the harvest field, they gave it willingly, and Queen Telephassa, who had done no work in her palace save to braid silk threads with golden ones, came behind them to bind the sheaves. If payment was offered, they shook their heads, and only asked for tidings of Europa. "'There are bulls enough in my pasture,' the old farmers would reply. "'But I never heard of one like this you tell me of. "'A snow-white bull with a little princess on his back? "'Ha! Huh. I ask your pardon, good folks, "'but there never was such a sight seen hereabouts.' "'At last, when his upper lip began to have the down on it, "'Phoenix grew weary of rambling hither and thither to no purpose. "'So one day,' When they happened to be passing through a pleasant and solitary tract of country, he sat himself down on a heap of moss. "'I can go no farther,' said Phoenix. "'It is a mere foolish waste of life to spend it, as we do, in always wandering up and down, and never coming to any home at nightfall. Our sister is lost, and never will be found. She probably perished in the sea.' or to whatever shore the white bull may have carried her. It is now so many years ago that there would be neither love nor acquaintance between us should we meet again. My father has forbidden us to return to his palace, so I shall build me a hut of branches and dwell here. Well, son Phoenix, said Telephassa sorrowfully, you have grown to be a man and must do as you judge best but for my part I will still go in quest of my poor child. And we three will go along with you, cried Cadmus and Cilix and their faithful friend Thassus. But before setting out, they all helped Phoenix to build a habitation. When completed, it was a sweet rural bower, roofed overhead with an arch of living boughs. Inside there were two pleasant rooms, one of which held a soft heap of moss for a bed, while the other was furnished with a rustic seat or two, curiously fashioned out of the crooked roots of trees. So comfortable and homelike did it seem that Telephassa and her three companions could not help sighing to think that they must still roam about the world, 
instead of spending the remainder of their lives in some such cheerful abode as they had here built for Phoenix. But when they bade him farewell, Phoenix shed tears and probably regretted that he was no longer to keep them company. However, he had fixed upon an admirable place to dwell in, and by and by there came other people who chanced to have no homes, and seeing how pleasant a spot it was, they built themselves huts in the neighborhood of Phoenix's habitation. Thus, before many years went by, a city had grown up there, in the center of which was seen a stately palace of marble, wherein dwelt Phoenix, clothed in a purple robe, and wearing a golden crown upon his head. For the inhabitants of the new city, finding that he had royal blood in his veins, had chosen him to be their king. The very first decree of state which King Phoenix issued was, that if a maiden happened to arrive in the kingdom mounted on a snow-white bull and calling herself Europa, his subjects should treat her with the greatest kindness and respect, and immediately bring her to the palace. You may see by this that Phoenix's conscience never quite ceased to trouble him, for giving up the quest of his dear sister, and sitting himself down to be comfortable while his mother and her companions went onward. But often and often, at the close of a weary day's journey, did Telephassa and Cadmus, Silex and Thassus, remember the pleasant spot in which they had left Phoenix. It was a sorrowful prospect for these wanderers, that on the morrow they must again set forth, and that, after many nightfalls, they would perhaps be no nearer the close of their toilsome pilgrimage than now. These thoughts made them all melancholy at times, but appeared to torment Silex more than the rest of the party. At length one morning, when they were taking their staffs in hand to set out, he thus addressed them. "'My dear mother, and you, good brother Cadmus, and my friend Thassus, methinks we are like people in a dream. There is no substance in the life which we are leading. It is such a dreary length of time since the white bull carried off my sister Europa that I have quite forgotten how she looked.' and the tones of her voice, and indeed almost doubt whether such a little girl ever lived in the world. And whether she once lived or no, I am convinced that she no longer survives, and that therefore it is the merest folly to waste our own lives and happiness in seeking her. Were we to find her, she would now be a woman grown, and would look upon us all as strangers. So to tell you the truth, I have resolved to take up my abode here, and I entreat you, mother, brother, and friend, to follow my example. Not I, for one, said Telephassa, although the poor queen, firmly as she spoke, was so travel-worn that she could hardly put her foot to the ground. Not I, for one. In the depths of my heart, little Europa is still the rosy child who ran to gather flowers so many years ago. She has not grown to womanhood, nor forgotten me. At noon, at night, journeying onward, sitting down to rest, her childish voice is always in my ears, calling, Mother, mother, stop here who may, there is no repose for me. Nor for me, said Cadmus, while my dear mother pleases to go onward. And the faithful Thassus, too, was resolved to bear them company. They remained with Silix a few days, however, and helped him to build a rustic bower, resembling the one which they had formerly built for Phoenix. When they were bidding him farewell, Silix burst into tears, and told his mother that it seemed just as melancholy a dream to stay there in solitude as to go onward. If she really believed that they would ever find Europa, he was willing to continue the search with them even now. But Telephassa bade him remain there and be happy if his own heart would let him. So the pilgrims took their leave of him and departed and were hardly out of sight before some other wandering people came along that way and saw Silix's habitation and were greatly delighted with the appearance of the place. There being abundance of unoccupied ground in the neighborhood, these strangers built huts for themselves and were soon joined by a multitude of new settlers who quickly formed a city. In the middle of it was seen a magnificent palace of colored marble, on the balcony of which, every noontide, appeared Silix in a long purple robe and with a jeweled crown upon his head. 
for the inhabitants, when they found out that he was a king's son, had considered him the fittest of all men to be a king himself. One of the first acts of King Silix's government was to send out an expedition, consisting of a grave ambassador and an escort of bold and hardy young men, with orders to visit the principal kingdoms of the earth, and inquire whether a young maiden had passed through those regions, galloping swiftly on a white bull. It is, therefore, plain to my mind that Silix secretly blamed himself for giving up the search for Europa, as long as he was able to put one foot before the other. As for Telephassa and Cadmus and the good Thassus, it grieves me to think of them still keeping up that weary pilgrimage. The two young men did their best for the poor queen, helping her over the rough places, often carrying her across rivulets in their faithful arms, and seeking to shelter her at nightfall, even when they themselves lay on the ground. Sad, sad it was to hear them asking of every day passer-by if he had seen Europa so long after the white bull had carried her away. But though the grey years thrust themselves between and made the child's figure dim in their remembrance, neither of these true-hearted three ever dreamed of giving up the search. One morning, however, poor Thassus found that he had sprained his ankle and could not possibly go a step farther. After a few days, to be sure, said he mournfully, I might make shift to hobble along with a stick, but that would only delay you and perhaps hinder you from finding dear little Europa after all your pains and trouble. Do you go forward, therefore, my beloved companions, and leave me to follow as I may? Thou hast been a true friend, dear Thassus, said Queen Telephassa, kissing his forehead. Being neither my son nor the brother of our lost Europa, thou hast shown thyself truer to me and her than Phoenix and Silix did, whom we have left behind us. Without thy loving help and that of my son Cadmus, my limbs could not have borne me half so far as this. Now take thy rest and be at peace, for, and it is the first time I have owned it to myself, I begin to question whether we shall ever find my beloved daughter in this world. Saying this, the poor queen shed tears, because it was a grievous trial to the mother's heart to confess that her hopes were growing faint. From that day forward, Cadmus noticed that she never traveled with the same alacrity of spirit that had heretofore supported her. Her weight was heavier upon his arm. Before setting out, Cadmus helped Thassus build a bower, while Telephassa, being too infirm to give any great assistance, advised them how to fit it up and furnish it, so that it might be as comfortable as a hut of branches could. Thassus, however, did not spend all his days in this green bower, for it happened to him, as to Phoenix and Silix, that other homeless people visited the spot and liked it, and built themselves habitations in the neighborhood. So here, in the course of a few years, was another thriving city with a red freestone palace in the center of it where Thassus sat upon a throne doing justice to the people with a purple robe over his shoulders and a scepter in his hand and a crown upon his head. The inhabitants had made him king not for the sake of any royal blood for none was in his veins but because Thassus was an upright true-hearted and courageous man and therefore fit to rule. But when the affairs of his kingdom were all settled, King Thassus laid aside his purple robe and crown and scepter, and bade his worthiest subject distribute justice to the people in his stead. Then, grasping the pilgrim's staff that had supported him so long, he set forth again, hoping still to discover some hoof-mark of the snow-white bull, some trace of the vanished child. He returned, after a lengthened absence, and sat down wearily upon his throne. To his latest hour, nevertheless, King Thassus showed his true-hearted remembrance of Europa by ordering that a fire should always be kept burning in his palace, and a bath steaming hot, and food ready to be served up, and a bed with snow-white sheets, in case the maiden should arrive and require immediate refreshment. And though Europa never came, the good Thassus had the blessings of many a poor traveller, who profited by the food and lodging which were meant for the little playmate of the king's boyhood. 
End of section 11. Recording by Tom Geller, Oberlin, Ohio, TomGeller.com. Section 12 of Myths Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Geller. Myths Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section 12. The Dragon's Teeth. Part 2. Telephassa and Cadmus were now pursuing their weary way, with no companion but each other. The queen leaned heavily upon her son's arm, and could walk only a few miles a day. But for all her weakness and weariness, she would not be persuaded to give up the search. It was enough to bring tears into the eyes of bearded men to hear the melancholy tone with which she inquired of every stranger whether he could tell her any news of the lost child. "'Have you seen a little girl? No, no. I mean a young maiden of full growth. Passing by this way, mounted on a snow-white bull, which gallops as swiftly as the wind?' "'We have seen no such wondrous sight,' the people would reply. And very often, taking Cadmus aside, they whispered to him, "'Is this stately and sad-looking woman your mother?' Surely she is not in her right mind, and you ought to take her home and make her comfortable, and do your best to get this dream out of her fancy. It is no dream, said Cadmus. Everything else is a dream, save that. But one day Telephassa seemed feebler than usual, and leaned almost her whole weight on the arm of Cadmus, and walked more slowly than ever before. At last they reached a solitary spot, where she told her son that she must needs lie down and take a good, long rest. A good, long rest, she repeated, looking Cadmus tenderly in the face. A good, long rest, thou dearest one. As long as you please, dear mother, answered Cadmus. Telephassa bade him sit down on the turf beside her, and then she took his hand. "'My son,' said she, fixing her dim eyes most lovingly upon him, "'this rest that I speak of will be very long indeed. "'You must not wait till it is finished. "'Dear Cadmus, you do not comprehend me. "'You must make a grave here and lay your mother's weary frame into it. "'My pilgrimage is over.' Cadmus burst into tears, and for a long time refused to believe that his dear mother was now to be taken from him. But Telephassa reasoned with him, and kissed him, and at length made him discern that it was better for her spirit to pass away out of the toil, the weariness, the grief, and disappointment which had burdened her on earth ever since the child was lost. He therefore repressed his sorrow, and listened to her last words. "'Dearest Cadmus,' said she, "'thou hadst been the truest son that ever mother had, "'and faithful to the very last. "'Who else would have borne with my infirmities as thou hast? "'It is owing to thy care, thou tenderest child, "'that my grave was not dug long years ago, "'in some valley or on some hillside.' that lies far, far behind us. It is enough. Thou shalt wander no more on this hopeless search. But when thou hast laid thy mother in the earth, then go, my son, to Delphi, and inquire of the oracle what thou shalt do next. O oh, mother, mother, cried Cadmus, couldst thou but have seen my sister before this hour? It matters little now, answered Telephassa, and there was a smile upon her face. I go now to the better world, and, sooner or later, shall find my daughter there. I will not sadden you, my little hearers, with telling how Telephassa died and was buried, but will only say that her dying smile grew brighter instead of vanishing from her dead face.
so that Cadmus felt convinced that, at her very first step into the better world, she had caught Europa in her arms. He planted some flowers on his mother's grave and left them to grow there and make the place beautiful when he should be far away. After performing this last sorrowful duty, he set forth alone and took the road toward the famous oracle of Delphi, as Telephassa had advised him. On his way thither, he still inquired of most people whom he had met whether they had seen Europa, for, to say the truth, Cadmus had grown so accustomed to ask the question that it came to his lips as readily as a remark about the weather. He received various answers. Some told him one thing and some another. Among the rest, a mariner affirmed that many years before, in a distant country, he had heard a rumor about a white bull, which came swimming across the sea with a child on his back dressed up in flowers that were blighted by the sea water. He did not know what had become of the child or the bull, and Cadmus suspected, indeed, by a queer twinkle in the mariner's eyes, that he was putting a joke upon him, and had never really heard anything about the matter. Poor Cadmus found it more wearisome to travel alone than to bear all his dear mother's weight while he, she had kept him company. His heart, you will understand, was now so heavy that it seemed impossible sometimes to carry it any farther. But his limbs were strong and active and well accustomed to exercise. He walked swiftly along, thinking of King Agenor and Queen Telephassa, and his brothers, and the friendly Thassus, all of whom he had left behind him at one point of his pilgrimage or another, and never expected to see them any more. Full of these remembrances, he came within sight of a lofty mountain, which the people thereabouts told him was called Parnassus. On the slope of Mount Parnassus was the famous Delphi, whither Cadmus was going. This Delphi was supposed to be the very midmost spot of the whole world. The place of the oracle was a certain cavity in the mountainside over which, when Cadmus came thither, he found a rude bower of branches. It reminded him of those which he had helped to build for Phoenix and Cilix, and afterward for Thassus. In later times, when multitudes of people came from great distances to put questions to the oracle, a spacious temple of marble was erected over the spot. But in the days of Cadmus, as I have told you, there was only this rustic bower with its abundance of green foliage and a tuft of shrubbery that ran wild over the mysterious hole in the hillside. When Cadmus had thrust a passage through the tangled boughs and made his way into the bower, he did not at first discern the half-hidden cavity, but soon he felt a cold stream of air rushing out of it, with so much force that it shook the ringlets on his cheek. Pulling away the shrubbery which clustered over the hole, he bent forward and spoke in a distinct but reverential tone, as if addressing some unseen personage inside of the mountain. "'Sacred Oracle of Delphi,' said he, Whither shall I go next in quest of my dear sister Europa? There was at first a deep silence, and then a rushing sound, or a noise like a long sigh proceeding out of the interior of the earth. This cavity, you must know, was looked upon as a sort of fountain of truth which sometimes gushed out in audible words, although for the most part these words were such a riddle that they might just as well have stayed at the bottom of the hole. But Cadmus was more fortunate than many others who went to Delphi in search of truth. By and by, the rushing noise began to sound like articulate language. It repeated over and over again the following sentence, which, after all, was so like the vague whistle of a blast of air that Cadmus really did not quite know whether it meant anything or not. Seek her no more. Seek her no more! Seek her no more! What then shall I do? asked Cadmus. For ever since he was a child, you know, it had been the great object of his life to find his sister. From the very hour that he left following the butterfly in the meadow near his father's palace, he had done his best to follow Europa over land and sea. And now, if he must give up the search, he seemed to have no more business in the world. But again 
the sighing gust of air grew into something like a hoarse voice. Follow the cow, it said. Follow the cow! Follow the cow! And when these words had been repeated until Cadmus was tired of hearing them, especially as he could not imagine what cow it was or why he was to follow her, the gusty hole gave vent to another sentence. Where the stray cow lies down, there is your home. These words were pronounced but a single time, and died away into a whisper before Cadmus was fully satisfied that he had caught the meaning. He put other questions, but received no answer. Only the gust of wind sighed continually out of the cavity, and blew the withered leaves rustling along the ground before it. Did there really come any words out of the hole? thought Cadmus. Or have I been dreaming all this while? He turned away from the oracle and thought himself no wiser than when he came thither. Caring little what might happen to him, he took the first path that offered itself, and went along at a sluggish pace. For, having no object in view, nor any reason to go one way more than another, it would certainly have been foolish to make haste. Whenever he met anybody, the old question was at his tongue's end. Have you seen a beautiful maiden, dressed like a king's daughter, and mounted on a snow-white bull that gallops as swiftly as the wind? But remembering what the oracle had said, he only half uttered the words, and then mumbled the rest indistinctly, and from his confusion people must have imagined that this handsome young man had lost his wits. I know not how far Cadmus had gone, nor could he himself have told you, when, at no great distance before him, he beheld a brindled cow. She was lying down by the wayside and quietly chewing her cud, nor did she take any notice of the young man until he had approached pretty nigh. Then, getting leisurely upon her feet and giving her head a gentle toss, she began to move along at a moderate pace, often pausing just long enough to crop a mouthful of grass. Cadmus loitered behind, whistling idly to himself and scarcely noticing the cow, until the thought occurred to him whether this could possibly be the animal which, according to the oracle's response, was to serve him for a guide. But he smiled at himself for fancying such a thing. He could not seriously think that this was the cow, because she went along so quietly, behaving just like any other cow. Evidently she neither knew nor cared so much as a wisp of hay about Cadmus, and was only thinking how to get her living along the wayside, where the herbage was green and fresh. Perhaps she was going home to be milked. "'Cow! Cow! Cow!' cried Cadmus. "'Hey, Brindle! Hey! Stop, my good cow!' He wanted to come up with the cow so as to examine her and see if she would appear to know him, or whether there were any peculiarities to distinguish her from a thousand other cows whose only business is to fill the milk pail and sometimes kick it over. But still the brindled cow trudged on, whisking her tail to keep the flies away, and taking as little notice of Cadmus as she well could. If he walked slowly, so did the cow, and seized the opportunity to graze. If he quickened his pace, the cow went just so much the faster, and once, when Cadmus tried to catch her by running, she threw out her heels, stuck her tail straight on end, and set off at a gallop, looking as queerly as cows generally do while putting themselves to their speed. When Cadmus saw that it was impossible to come up with her, he walked on moderately as before. The cow, too, went leisurely on without looking behind. Wherever the grass was greenest, there she nibbled a mouthful or two. Where a brook glistened brightly across the path, there the cow drank and breathed a comfortable sigh, and drank again, and trudged onward at the pace that best suited herself and Cadmus. I do believe, thought Cadmus, that this may be the cow that was foretold me. If it be the one, I suppose she will lie down somewhere hereabouts. Whether it were the oracular cow or some other one, it did not seem reasonable that she should travel a great way farther. So, whenever they reached a particularly pleasant spot on a breezy hillside, or in a sheltered vale, or flowery meadow, or the shore of a calm lake, or along the bank of a clear stream, Cadmus looked eagerly around to see if the situation would suit him for a home. 
But still, whether he liked the place or no, the brindled cow never offered to lie down. On she went at the quiet pace of a cow going homeward to the barnyard, and every moment Cadmus expected to see a milkmaid approaching with a pail, or a herdsman running to head the stray animal, or turn her back toward the pasture. But no milkmaid came, no herdsman drove her back, and Cadmus followed the stray brindle till he was almost ready to drop down with fatigue. "'Oh, brindled cow!' cried he in a tone of despair. "'Do you never mean to stop?' He had now grown too intent on following her to think of lagging behind, however long the way, and whatever might be his fatigue. Indeed, it seemed as if there were something about the animal that bewitched people. Several persons who happened to see the brindled cow and Cadmus following behind began to trudge after her precisely as he did. Cadmus was glad of somebody to converse with, and therefore talked very freely to these good people. He told them all his adventures, and how he had left King Agenor in his palace, and Phoenix at one place, and Silix at another, and Thassus at a third, and his dear mother, Queen Telephassa, under a flowery sod, so that now he was quite alone, both friendless and homeless. He mentioned likewise that the oracle had bidden him be guided by a cow, and inquired of the strangers whether they supposed that this brindled animal could be the one. "'Why, tis a very wondrous affair,' answered one of his new companions. "'I am pretty well acquainted with the ways of cattle, "'and I never knew a cow of her own accord to go so far without stopping. "'If my legs will let me, I'll never leave following the beast till she lies down.' "'Nor I,' said a second. "'Nor I,' cried a third. "'If she goes a hundred miles farther, I'm determined to see the end of it.' The secret of it was, you must know, that the cow was an enchanted cow, and that without their being conscious of it, she threw some of her enchantment over everybody that took so much as a half-dozen steps behind her. They could not possibly help following her, though, all the time they fancied themselves doing it of their own accord. The cow was by no means very nice in choosing her path so that sometimes they had to scramble over rocks or wade through mud and mire and were all in a terribly bedraggled condition and tired to death and very hungry into the bargain what a weary business it was but still they kept trudging stoutly forward and talking as they went the strangers grew very fond of cadmus and resolved never to leave him but to help him build a city wherever the cow might lie down in the centre of it there should be a noble palace in which Cadmus might dwell and be their king, with a throne, a crown and scepter, a purple robe, and everything else that a king ought to have. For in him there was the royal blood, and the royal heart, and the head that knew how to rule. While they were talking of these schemes, and beguiling the tediousness of the way with laying out the plan of the new city, one of the company happened to look at the cow. "'Joy! Joy!' cried he, clapping his hands. "'Brindle is going to lie down!' They all looked, and sure enough, the cow had stopped and was staring leisurely about her, as other cows do when on the point of lying down. And slowly, slowly did she recline herself on the soft grass, first bending her forelegs and then crouching her hind ones. When Cadmus and his companions came up with her, there was the brindled cow taking her ease, chewing her cud, and looking them quietly in the face, as if this was just the spot she had been seeking for, and as if it were all a matter of course. This, then, said Cadmus, gazing around him, this is to be my home. It was a fertile and lovely plain with great trees flinging their sun-speckled shadows over it, and hills fencing it in from the rough weather. At no great distance they beheld a river gleaming in the sunshine. A home-feeling stole into the heart of poor Cadmus. He was very glad to know that here he might awake in the morning without the necessity of putting on his dusty sandals to travel farther and farther. The days and the years would pass over him and find him still in this pleasant spot. If he could have had his brothers with him and his friend Thassus, and could have seen his dear mother under a roof of his own, 
he might here have been happy after all their disappointments some day or other too his sister europa might have come quietly to the door of his home and smiled round upon the familiar faces but indeed since there was no hope of regaining the friends of his boyhood or ever seeing his dear sister again cadmus resolved to make himself happy with these new companions who had grown so fond of him while following the cow yes my friends said he to them this is to be our home here we will build our habitations the brindled cow which has led us hither will supply us with milk we will cultivate the neighboring soil and lead an innocent and happy life his companions joyfully assented to this plan and in the first place being very hungry and thirsty they looked about them for the means of providing a comfortable meal not far off they saw a tuft of trees which appeared as if there might be a string of water beneath them they went thither to fetch some leaving cadmus stretched on the ground along with the brindled cow for now that he had found a place of rest it seemed as if all the weariness of his pilgrimage ever since he left king agenor's palace had fallen upon him at once but his new friends had not long been gone when he was suddenly startled by cries shouts and screams and the noise of a terrible struggle and in the midst of it all a most awful hissing which went right through his ears like a rough saw running toward the tuft of trees he beheld the head and fiery eyes of an immense serpent or dragon with the widest jaws that ever a dragon had and a vast many rows of horribly sharp teeth before cadmus could reach the spot this pitiless reptile had killed his poor companions and was busily devouring them making but a mouthful of each man it appears that the fountain of water was enchanted and that the dragon had been set to guard it so that no mortal might ever quench his thirst there as the neighboring inhabitants carefully avoided the spot it was now a long time not less than a hundred years or thereabouts since the monster had broken his fast and as was natural enough his appetite had grown to be enormous and was not half satisfied by the poor people whom he had just eaten up when he caught sight of cadmus therefore he set up another abominable hiss and flung back his immense jaws until his mouth looked like a great red cavern at the farther end of which were seen the legs of his last victim whom he had hardly had time to swallow but cadmus was so enraged at the destruction of his friends that he cared neither for the size of the dragon's jaws nor for his hundreds of sharp teeth drawing his sword he rushed at the monster and flung himself right into his cavernous mouth this bold method of attacking him took the dragon by surprise for in fact cadmus had leaped so far down into his throat that the rows of terrible teeth could not close upon him nor do him the least harm in the world thus though the struggle was a tremendous one and though the dragon shattered the tuft of trees into small splinters by the lashing of his tail yet as cadmus was all the while slashing and stabbing at his very vitals and it was not long before the scaly wretch bethought himself of slipping away he had not gone his length however when the brave cadmus gave him a sword thrust that finished the battle and creeping out of the gateway of the creature's jaws there he beheld him still wriggling in his vast bulk although there was no longer life enough in him to harm a little child but do you suppose that it made cadmus sorrowful to think of the melancholy fate which had befallen those poor friendly people who had followed the cow along with him it seemed as if he were doomed to lose everybody whom he loved or to see them perish in one way or another and here he was after all his toils and troubles in a solitary place with not a single human being to help him build a hut what shall i do cried he aloud it were better for me to have been devoured by the dragon as my poor companions were cadmus said a voice but whether it came from above or below him or whether it spoke within his own breast the young man could not tell cadmus pluck out the dragon's teeth and plant them in the earth this was a strange thing to do nor was it very easy i should imagine to dig out all those deep-rooted fangs from the dead dragon's jaws but cadmus toiled and tugged and after pounding the monstrous head almost to pieces with a great stone 
he at last collected as many teeth as might have filled a bushel or two. The next thing was to plant them. This, likewise, was a tedious piece of work, especially as Cadmus was already exhausted with killing the dragon and knocking his head to pieces, and had nothing to dig the earth with, that I know of unless it were his sword-blade. Finally, however, a sufficiently large tract of ground was turned up, and sown with this new kind of seed, although half of the dragon's teeth still remained to be planted some other day. Cadmus, quite out of breath, stood leaning upon his sword, and wondering what was to happen next. He had waited but a few moments when he began to see a sight which was as great a marvel as the most marvelous thing I ever told you about. The sun was shining slantwise over the field, and showed all the moist dark soil just like any other newly planted piece of ground. All at once Cadmus fancied he saw something glisten very brightly, first at one spot, then at another, then at a hundred and a thousand spots together. Soon he perceived them to be the steel heads of spears, sprouting up everywhere like so many stalks of grain, and continually growing taller and taller. Next appeared a vast number of bright sword-blades, thrusting themselves up in the same way. A moment afterward, the whole surface of the ground was broken up by a multitude of polished brass helmets, coming up like a crop of enormous beans. So rapidly did they grow that Cadmus now discerned the fierce countenance of a man beneath every one. In short, before he had time to think what a wonderful affair it was, he beheld an abundant harvest of what looked like human beings, armed with helmets and breastplates, shields, swords, and spears. And before they were well out of the earth, they brandished their weapons and clashed them one against another, seeming to think, little while as they had yet lived, that they had wasted too much of life without a battle. Every tooth of the dragon had produced one of these sons of deadly mischief. Up sprouted also a great many trumpeters, and with the first breath that they drew they put their brazen trumpets to their lips, and sounded a tremendous and ear-shattering blast, so that the whole space, just now so quiet and solitary, reverberated with the clash and clang of arms, the bray of warlike music, and the shouts of angry men. So enraged did they all look that Cadmus fully expected them to put the whole world to the sword. How fortunate would it be for a great conqueror if they could get a bushel of the dragon's teeth to sow! Cadmus, said the same voice which he had before heard, throw a stone into the midst of the armed men. So Cadmus seized a large stone, and flinging it into the middle of the earth army, saw it strike the breastplate of a gigantic and fierce-looking warrior. Immediately on feeling the blow, he seemed to take it for granted that somebody had struck him, and, uplifting his weapon, he smote his next neighbor a blow that cleft his helmet asunder and stretched him on the ground. In an instant, those nearest the fallen warrior began to strike at each other with their swords and stab with their spears. The confusion spread wider and wider. Each man smote down his brother and was himself smitten down before he had time to exult in his victory. The trumpeters all the while blew their blasts shriller and shriller. Each soldier shouted a battle cry and often fell with it on his lips. It was the strangest spectacle of causeless wrath and of mischief for no good end that had ever been witnessed. But, after all, it was neither more foolish nor more wicked than a thousand battles that have since been fought, in which men have slain their brothers with just as little reason as these children of the dragon's teeth. It ought to be considered, too, that the dragon people were made for nothing else, whereas other mortals were born to love and help one another. Well, this memorable battle continued to rage until the ground was strewn with helmeted heads that had been cut off. Of all the thousands that began the fight, there were only five left standing. These now rushed from different parts of the field, and meeting in the middle of it, clashed their swords, and struck at each other's hearts as fiercely as ever. Cadmus, said the voice again, bid those five warriors to sheathe their swords. They will help you to build the city. 
Without hesitating an instant, Cadmus stepped forward with the aspect of a king and a leader, and extending his drawn sword among them, spoke to the warriors in a stern and commanding voice. "'Sheathe your weapons,' said he. And forthwith, feeling themselves bound to obey him, the five remaining sons of the dragon's teeth made him a military salute with their swords, returned them to the scabbards, and stood before Cadmus in a rank, eyeing him as soldiers eye their captain, while awaiting the word of command. These five men had probably strung from the biggest of the dragon's teeth, and were the boldest and strongest of the whole army. They were almost giants indeed, and had good need to be so, else they never could have lived through so terrible a fight. They still had a very furious look, and if Cadmus happened to glance aside, would glare at one another with fire flashing out of their eyes. It was strange, too, to observe how the earth out of which they had so lately grown was encrusted, here and there on their bright breastplates, and even begrimed their faces, just as you may have seen it clinging to beets and carrots when pulled out of their native soil. Cadmus hardly knew whether to consider them as men or some odd kind of vegetable although, on the whole, he concluded that there was human nature in them, because they were so fond of trumpets and weapons, and so ready to shed blood. They looked him earnestly in the face, waiting for his next order, and evidently desiring no other employment than to follow him from one battlefield to another, all over the wide world. But Cadmus was wiser than these earth-born creatures, with the dragon's fierceness in them, and knew better how to use their strength and hardihood. Come, said he, you are sturdy fellows. Make yourselves useful. Quarry some stones with those great swords of yours, and help me to build a city. The five soldiers grumbled a little, and muttered that it was their business to overthrow cities, not to build them up. But Cadmus looked at them with a stern eye, and spoke to them in a tone of authority, so that they knew him for their master, and never again thought of disobeying his commands. They set to work in good earnest, and toiled so diligently that, in a very short time, a city began to make its appearance. At first, to be sure, the workmen showed a quarrelsome disposition. Like savage beasts, they would doubtless have done one another a mischief if Cadmus had not kept watch over them and quelled the fierce old serpent that lurked in their hearts when he saw it gleaming out of their wild eyes. But in the course of time they got accustomed to honest labor, and had sense enough to feel that there was more true enjoyment in living at peace and doing good to one's neighbor than in striking at him with a two-edged sword. It may not be too much to hope that the rest of mankind will by and by grow as wise and peaceable as these five earth-begrimed warriors who sprang from the dragon's teeth. And now that the city was built, and there was a home in it for each of the workmen, but the palace of Cadmus was not yet erected, because they had left it till the last, meaning to introduce all the new improvements of architecture and make it very commodious as well as stately and beautiful. After finishing the rest of their labors, they all went to bed betimes, in order to rise in the gray of the morning, and get at least the foundation of the edifice laid before nightfall. But when Cadmus arose, and took his way toward the site where the palace was to be built, followed by his five sturdy workmen marching all in a row, what do you think he saw? What should it be but the most magnificent palace that had ever been seen in the world? It was built of marble and other beautiful kinds of stone, and rose high in the air, with a splendid dome and a portico along the front, and carved pillars, and everything else that befitted the habitation of a mighty king. It had grown up out of the earth in almost as short a time as it had taken the armed host to spring from the dragon's teeth, and what made the matter more strange, no seed of this stately edifice had ever been planted." When the five workmen beheld the dome with the morning sunshine making it look golden and glorious, they gave a great shout. Long live King Cadmus, they cried, in his beautiful palace. And the new king, 
with his five faithful followers at his heels, shouldering their pickaxes and marching in a rank, for they still had a soldier-like sort of behavior as their nature was, ascended the palace steps. Halting at the entrance, they gazed through a long vista of lofty pillars that were ranged from end to end of a great hall. At the farther extremity of this hall, approaching slowly toward him, Cadmus beheld a female figure, wonderfully beautiful, and adorned with a royal robe, and a crown of diamonds over her golden ringlets, and the richest necklace that ever a queen wore. His heart thrilled with delight. He fancied it his long-lost sister Europa, now grown to womanhood, coming to make him happy and to repay him with her sweet sisterly affection for all those weary wanderings in quest of her since he left King Agenor's palace, for the tears that he had shed on parting with Phoenix and Cilix and Thassus, for the heartbreakings that had made the whole world seem dismal to him over his dear mother's grave. But as Cadmus advanced to meet the beautiful stranger, he saw that her features were unknown to him, although in the little time that it required to tread along the hall, he had already felt a sympathy betwixt himself and her. No, Cadmus, said the same voice that had spoken to him in the field of the armed men, this is not the dear sister Europa whom you have sought so faithfully all over the wide world. This is Harmonia, a daughter of the sky, who has given you instead of sister, and brothers, and friend, and mother, you will find all those dear ones in her alone. So Cadmus dwelt in the palace with his new friend Harmonia, and found a great deal of comfort in his magnificent abode, but would doubtless have found as much, if not more, in the humblest cottage by the wayside. Before many years went by, there was a group of rosy little children, but how they came thither has always been a mystery to me, sporting in the great hall and on the marble steps of the palace, and running joyfully to meet King Cadmus when affairs of state left him at leisure to play with them. They called him father, and Queen Harmonia mother. The five old soldiers of the dragon's teeth grew very fond of these small urchins, and were never weary of showing them how to shoulder sticks, flourish wooden swords, and march in military order, blowing a penny trumpet, or beating an abominable rub-a-dub upon a little drum. But King Cadmus, lest there should be too much of the dragon's tooth in his children's disposition, used to find time from his kingly duties to teach them their ABC, which he invented for their benefit, and for which many little people, I am afraid, are not half so grateful to him as they ought to be. End of section 12. Recording by Tom Geller, Oberlin, Ohio, TomGeller.com. Section 13 of Myths Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lee Smalley. Myths Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Mabby. Section 13. From A Wonder Book for Girls and Boys, 1852. By Nathaniel Hawthorne, 1804 to 1864. The Miraculous Pitcher. One evening, in times long ago, old Philemon and his old wife, Baucis, sat at their cottage door, enjoying the calm and beautiful sunset. They had already eaten their frugal supper, and intended now to spend a quiet hour or two before bedtime. So they talked together about their garden, and their cow, and their bees, and their grapevine, which clambered over the cottage wall, and on which the grapes were beginning to turn purple. But the rude shouts of children and the fierce barking of dogs in the village near at hand grew louder and louder until, at last, it was hardly possible for Baucis and Philemon to hear each other speak. Ah, wife, cried Philemon, I hear some poor traveller is seeking hospitality among our neighbours yonder, and instead of giving him food and lodging, they have set their dogs at him, as their custom is. Well a day, answered old Baucis. I do wish our neighbors felt a little more kindness for their fellow creatures, and only think of bringing up their children in this naughty way, and patting them on the head when they fling stones at strangers. 
Those children will never come to any good, said Philemon, shaking his white head. To tell you the truth, wife, I should not wonder if some terrible thing were to happen to all the people in the village, unless they mend their manners. But as for you and me, so long as Providence affords us a crust of bread, let us be ready to give to any poor, homeless stranger that may come along and need it. That's right, husband, said Baucis. So we will. These old folks, you must know, were quite poor, and had to work pretty hard for a living. Old Philemon toiled diligently in his garden, while Baucis was always busy with her distaff, or making a little butter and cheese with their cow's milk, or doing one thing and another about the cottage. Their food was seldom anything but bread, milk, and vegetables, with sometimes a portion of honey from their beehive, and now and then a bunch of grapes that had ripened against the cottage wall. But they were two of the kindest old people in the world, and would cheerfully have gone without their dinners any day, rather than refuse a slice of their brown loaf, a cup of new milk, and a spoonful of honey, to the weary traveller who might pause before their door. They felt as if such guests had a sort of holiness, and that they ought, therefore, to treat them better and more bountifully than their own selves. Their cottage stood on a rising ground, at some short distance from a village, which lay in a hollow valley that was about half a mile in breadth. This valley, in past ages, when the world was new, had probably been the bed of a lake. There fishes had glided to and fro in the depths, and water-weeds had grown along the margin, and trees and hills had seen their reflected images in the broad and peaceful mirror. But as the waters subsided, men had cultivated the soil, and built houses on it, so that it was now a fertile spot, and bore no traces of the ancient lake, except a very small brook, which meandered through the midst of the village, and supplied the inhabitants with water. The valley had been dry land so long that oaks had sprung up, and grown great and high, and perished with old age, and been succeeded by others, as tall and stately as the first. Never was there a prettier or more fruitful valley. The very sight of the plenty around them should have made the inhabitants kind and gentle, and ready to show their gratitude to Providence by doing good to their fellow creatures. But, we are sorry to say, the people of this lovely village were not worthy to dwell in a spot on which heaven had smiled so beneficently. They were a very selfish and hard-hearted people, and had no pity for the poor nor sympathy with the homeless. They would only have laughed had anybody told them that human beings owe a debt of love to one another, because there is no other method of paying the debt of love and care which all of us owe to Providence. You will hardly believe what I am going to tell you. These naughty people taught their children to be no better than themselves, and used to clap their hands by way of encouragement when they saw the little boys and girls run after some poor stranger, shouting at his heels and pelting him with stones. They kept large and fierce dogs, and whenever a traveller ventured to show himself in the village street, this pack of disagreeable curs scampered to meet him, barking, snarling, and showing their teeth. Then they would seize him by his leg or by his clothes, just as it happened. And if he were ragged when he came, he was generally a pitiable object before he had time to run away. This was a very terrible thing to poor travellers, as you may suppose, especially when they chanced to be sick or feeble or lame or old. Such persons, if they once knew how badly these unkind people and their unkind children and curs were in the habit of behaving, would go miles and miles out of their way rather than try to pass through the village again. What made the matter seem worse, if possible, was that when rich persons came in their chariots or riding on beautiful horses, with their servants in rich liveries attending on them, Nobody could be more civil and obsequious than the inhabitants of the village. They would take off their hats and make the humblest bows you ever saw. If the children were rude, they were pretty certain to get their ears boxed. And as for the dogs, if a single cur in the pack presumed to yelp, his master instantly beat him with a club and tied him up without any supper. This would have been all very well only if it proved that the villagers cared much about the money that a stranger had in his pocket, and nothing whatever for the human soul, which lives equally in the beggar and the prince. So now you can understand why old Philemon spoke so sorrowfully, when he heard the shouts of the children and the barking of the dogs at the farther extremity of the village street. 
There was a confused din, which lasted a good while, and seemed to pass quite through the breadth of the valley. "'I never heard the dog so loud,' observed the good old man. "'Nor the children so rude,' answered his good old wife. They sat shaking their heads one to another, while the noise came nearer and nearer, until, at the foot of the little eminence on which their cottage stood, they saw two travellers approaching on foot. Close behind them came the fierce dogs, snarling at their very heels. A little farther off ran a crowd of children, who sent up shrill cries and flung stones at the two strangers with all their might. Once or twice the younger of the two men, he was a slender and very active figure, turned about and drove back the dogs with a staff which he carried in his hand. His companion, who was a very tall person, walked calmly along, as if disdaining to notice either the naughty children or the pack of curs, whose manners the children seemed to imitate. Both of the travellers were very humbly clad, and looked as if they might not have money enough in their pockets to pay for a night's lodging. And this, I am afraid, was the reason why the villagers had allowed their children and dogs to treat them so rudely. "'Come, wife,' said Philemon to Baucis. "'Let us go and meet these poor people. No doubt they feel almost too heavy-hearted to climb the hill.' "'Go you and meet them,' answered Baucis, "'while I make haste within doors and see whether we can get them anything for supper. A comfortable bowl of bread and milk would do wonders toward raising their spirits.' Accordingly, she hastened into the cottage. Philemon, on his part, went afterward, and extended his hand with so hospitable an aspect that there was no need of saying what nevertheless he did say, in the heartiest tone imaginable. "'Welcome, strangers, welcome!' "'Thank you,' replied the younger of the two, in a lively kind of way, notwithstanding his weariness and trouble. "'This is quite another greeting, then, we have met with yonder in the village,' "'Pray, why do you live in such a bad neighborhood? "'Ah,' observed old Philemon, with a quiet and benign smile, "'Providence put me here, I hope, among other reasons, "'in order that I may make you what amends I can "'for the inhospitality of my neighbors.' "'Well said, old father,' cried the traveller, laughing, "'and if the truth must be told, "'my companion and myself need some amends. "'Those children, the little rascals,' have bespattered us finely with their mud-balls, and one of the curs has torn my cloak, which was ragged enough already. But I took him across the muzzle with my staff, and I think you may have heard him yelp, even thus far off. Philemon was glad to see him in such good spirits. Nor, indeed, would you have fancied, by the traveller's look and manner, that he was weary with a long day's journey, besides being disheartened by rough treatment at the end of it. He was dressed in rather an odd way, with a sort of cap on his head, the brim of which stuck out over both ears. Though it was a summer evening, he wore a cloak, which he kept wrapped closely about him, perhaps because his undergarments were shabby. Philemon perceived, too, that he had on a singular pair of shoes, but, as it was now growing dusk, and as the old man's eyesight was none the sharpest, he could not precisely tell in what the strangeness consisted. One thing certainly seemed queer. The traveller was so wonderfully light and active that it appeared as if his feet sometimes rose from the ground of their own accord, or could only be kept down by an effort. "'I used to be light-footed in my youth,' said Philemon to the traveller, "'but I always found my feet grow heavier toward nightfall.' "'There is nothing like a good staff to help one along,' answered the stranger, "'and I happen to have an excellent one, as you see.' This staff, in fact, was the oddest-looking staff that Philemon had ever beheld. It was made of olive wood, and had something like a little pair of wings near the top. Two snakes, carved in the wood, were represented as twining themselves about the staff, and were so very skillfully executed that old Philemon, whose eyes, you know, were getting rather dim, almost thought them alive, and that he could see them wriggling and twisting. "'A curious piece of work, sure enough,' said he, a staff with wings. It would be an excellent kind of stick for a little boy to ride astride of. By this time Philemon and his two guests had reached the cottage door. Friends, said the old man, sit down and rest yourselves here on this bench. My good wife, Baucis, has gone to see what you can have for supper. We are poor folks, but you shall be welcome to whatever we have in the cupboard. The younger stranger threw himself carelessly on the bench, letting his staff fall as he did so. 
and here happened something rather marvelous, though trifling enough, too. The staff seemed to get up from the ground of its own accord, and, spreading its little pair of wings, it half hopped, half flew, and leaned itself against the wall of the cottage. There it stood quite still, except that the snakes continued to wriggle. But, in my private opinion, old Philemon's eyesight had been playing him tricks again. Before he could ask any questions, the elder stranger drew his attention from the wonderful staff by speaking to him. Was there not, asked the stranger in a remarkably deep tone of voice, a lake in very ancient times covering the spot where now stands yonder village? Not in my day, friend, answered Philemon, and yet I am an old man, as you see. There were always the fields and meadows, just as they are now, and the old trees, and the little stream murmuring through the midst of the valley. My father, nor his father before him, ever saw it otherwise, so far as I know. And doubtless it will still be the same when old Philemon shall be gone and forgotten. That is more than can be safely foretold, observed the stranger, and there was something very stern in his deep voice. He shook his head, too, so that his dark and heavy curls were shaken with the movement. Since the inhabitants of yonder village have forgotten the affections and sympathies of their nature, it were better that the lake should be rippling over their dwellings again. The traveller looked so stern that Philemon was really almost frightened, the more so that, at his frown, the twilight seemed suddenly to grow darker, and that, when he shook his head, there was a roll as of thunder in the air. But in a moment afterward, the stranger's face became so kindly and mild that the old man quite forgot his terror. Nevertheless, he could not help feeling that this elder traveller must be no ordinary personage, although he happened now to be attired so humbly, and to be journeying on foot. Not that Philemon fancied him a prince in disguise, or any character of that sort, but rather some exceedingly wise man who went about the world in this poor garb, despising wealth and all worldly objects, and seeking everywhere to add a mite to his wisdom. This idea appeared the more probable, because, when Philemon raised his eyes to the stranger's face, he seemed to see more thought there in one look than he could have studied out in a lifetime. While Baucis was getting the supper, the travellers both began to talk very sociably with Philemon. The younger, indeed, was extremely loquacious, and made such shrewd and witty remarks that the good old man continually burst out a-laughing, and pronounced him the merriest fellow whom he had seen for many a day. "'Pray, my young friend,' he said, as they grew familiar together, "'what may I call your name?' "'Why, I am very nimble, as you see,' answered the traveller. "'So, if you call me Quicksilver, the name will fit tolerably well.' "'Quicksilver?' "'Quicksilver?' repeated Philemon, looking in the traveller's face, to see if he were making fun of him. It is a very odd name, and your companion there? Has he as strange a one? You must ask the thunder to tell it you, replied Quicksilver, putting on a mysterious look. No other voice is loud enough. This remark, whether it were serious or in jest, might have caused Philemon to conceive a very great awe of the elder stranger, if, on venturing to gaze at him, he had not beheld so much beneficence in his visage. But undoubtedly, here was the grandest figure that ever sat so humbly beside a cottage door. When the stranger conversed, it was with gravity, and in such a way that Philemon felt irresistibly moved to tell him everything which he had most at heart. This is always the feeling that people have, when they meet with any one wise enough to comprehend all their good and evil, and to despise not a tittle of it. But Philemon, simple and kind-hearted old man that he was, had not many secrets to disclose. He talked, however, quite garrulously about the events of his past life, in the whole course of which he had never been a score of miles from this very spot. His wife, Baucis, and himself had dwelled in the cottage from their youth upward, earning their bread by honest labor, always poor, but still contented. He told what excellent butter and cheese Baucis made, and how nice were the vegetables which he raised in his garden. He said, too, that because they loved one another so very much, it was the wish of both that death might not separate them, but that they should die as they had lived, together. 
As the stranger listened, a smile beamed over his countenance, and made its expression as sweet as it was grand. "'You are a good old man,' said he to Philemon, "'and you have a good old wife to be your helpmeet. It is fit that your wish be granted.' and it seemed to Philemon just then, as if the sunset clouds threw up a bright flash from the west, and kindled a sudden light in the sky. Baucis had now got supper ready, and, coming to the door, began to make apologies for the poor fare which she was forced to set before her guests. "'Had we known you were coming,' said she, "'my good man and myself would have gone without a morsel, rather than you should lack a better supper.' but I took the most part of today's milk to make cheese, and our last loaf is already half eaten. Ah, me! I never felt the sorrow of being poor, save when a poor traveller knocks at our door. All will be very well. Do not trouble yourself, my good dame, replied the elder stranger, kindly. An honest, hearty welcome to a guest works miracles with the fair, and is capable of turning the coarsest food to nectar and ambrosia. A welcome you shall have, cried Baucis, and likewise a little honey that we happen to have left, and a bunch of purple grapes besides. Why, Mother Baucis, it is a feast, exclaimed Quicksilver, laughing. An absolute feast, and you shall see how bravely I will play my part at it. I think I never felt hungrier in my life. Mercy on us, whispered Baucis to her husband. If the young man had such a terrible appetite, I am afraid there will not be half enough supper. They all went into the cottage. And now, my little auditors, shall I tell you something that will make you open your eyes very wide? It is really one of the oddest circumstances in the whole story. Quicksilver's staff, you recollect, had set itself up against the wall of the cottage. Well, when its master entered the door, leaving this wonderful staff behind, what should it do but immediately spread its little wings and go hopping and fluttering up the doorsteps? Tap, tap, went the staff on the kitchen floor. Nor did it rest until it had stood itself on end, with the greatest gravity and decorum, beside Quicksilver's chair. Old Philemon, however, as well as his wife, was so taken up in attending to their guests that no notice was given to what the staff had been about. As Baucis had said, there was but a scanty supper for two hungry travellers. In the middle of the table was the remnant of a brown loaf, with a piece of cheese on one side of it, and a dish of honeycomb on the other. There was a pretty good bunch of grapes for each of the guests. A moderately sized earthen pitcher, nearly full of milk, stood at a corner of the board, and when Baucis had filled two bowls and set them before the strangers, only a little milk remained in the bottom of the pitcher. Alas, it is a very sad business when a bountiful heart finds itself pinched and squeezed among narrow circumstances. Poor Baucis kept wishing that she might starve for a week to come, if it were possible, by so doing to provide these hungry folks a more plentiful supper. And since the supper was so exceedingly small, she could not help wishing that their appetites had not been quite so large. Why, at their first sitting down, the travellers both drank off all the milk in their two bowls at a draught. A little more milk, kind Mother Baucis, if you please, said Quicksilver. The day has been hot, and I am very much athirst. Now, my dear people, answered Baucis, in great confusion, I am so sorry and ashamed, but the truth is, there is hardly a drop more milk in the pitcher. Oh, husband, husband, why didn't we go without our supper? "'Why, it appears to me,' cried Quicksilver, starting up from the table and taking the pitcher by the handle, "'it really appears to me that matters are not quite so bad as you represent them. Here is certainly more milk in the pitcher.' So saying, and to the vast astonishment of Baucis, he proceeded to fill not only his own bowl, but his companions likewise from the pitcher that was supposed to be almost empty. The good woman could scarcely believe her eyes. She had certainly poured out nearly all the milk, and had peeped in afterward and seen the bottom of the pitcher as she set it down upon the table. But I am old, thought Baucis to herself, and apt to be forgetful. I suppose I must have made a mistake. At all events, the pitcher cannot help being empty now, after filling the bowls twice over. What excellent milk, observed Quicksilver, after quaffing the contents of the second bowl. Excuse me, my kind hostess, but I must really ask you for a little more. 
Now Bossie's had seen, as plainly as she could see anything, that Quicksilver had turned the pitcher upside down, and consequently had poured out every drop of milk in filling the last bowl. Of course there could not possibly be any left. However, in order to let him know precisely how the case was, she lifted the pitcher and made a gesture as if pouring milk into Quicksilver's bowl, but without the remotest idea that any milk would stream forth. What was her surprise, therefore, when such an abundant cascade fell bubbling into the bowl that it was immediately filled to the brim and overflowed upon the table? The two snakes that were twisted about Quicksilver's staff, but neither Baucis nor Philemon happened to observe the circumstance, stretched out their heads and began to lap up the spilt milk. And then, what a delicious fragrance the milk had! It seemed as if Philemon's only cow must have pastured that day on the richest herbage that could be found anywhere in the world. I only wish that each of you, my beloved little souls, could have a bowl of such nice milk at supper time. And now a slice of your brown loaf, Mother Baucis, said Quicksilver, and a little of that honey. Baucis cut him a slice accordingly, and though the loaf, when she and her husband ate of it, had been rather too dry and crusty to be palatable, it was now as light and moist as if but a few hours out of the oven. Tasting a crumb which had fallen on the table, she found it more delicious than bread ever was before, and could hardly believe that it was a loaf of her own kneading and baking. Yet what other loaf could it possibly be? But, oh, the honey! I may just as well let it alone, without trying to describe how exquisitely it smelled and looked. Its color was that of the purest and most transparent gold, and it had the odor of a thousand flowers, but of such flowers as never grew in an earthly garden, and to seek which the bees must have flown high above the clouds. The wonder is that, after alighting on a flower-bed of so delicious fragrance and immortal bloom, they should have been content to fly down again to their hive in Philemon's garden. Never was such honey tasted, seen, or smelt, the perfume floated around the kitchen and made it so delightful that, had you closed your eyes, you would instantly have forgotten the low ceiling and smoky walls, and have fancied yourself in an arbor, with celestial honeysuckles creeping over it. Although good mother Baucis was a simple old dame, she could not but think that there was something rather out of the common way in all that has been going on. So, after helping the guests to bread and honey, and laying a bunch of grapes by each of their plates, she sat down by Philemon and told him what she had seen in a whisper. "'Did you ever hear the like?' asked she. "'No, I never did,' answered Philemon with a smile. "'And I rather think, my dear old wife, you have been walking about in a sort of dream. If I had poured out the milk, I should have seen through the business at once. There happened to be a little more in the pitcher than you thought. That is all.' Ah, husband, said Baucis, say what you will, these are very uncommon people. Well, well, replied Philemon, still smiling, perhaps they are. They certainly do look as if they had seen better days, and I am heartily glad to see them making so comfortable a supper. Each of the guests had now taken his bunch of grapes upon his plate. Baucis, who rubbed her eyes in order to see them more clearly, was of opinion that the clusters had grown larger and richer, and that each separate grape seemed to be on the point of bursting with ripe juice. It was entirely a mystery to her how such grapes could ever have been produced from the old stunted vine that climbed against the cottage wall. "'Very admirable grapes, these,' observed Quicksilver, as he swallowed one after another, without apparently diminishing his cluster. "'Pray, my good host, whence did you gather them?' "'From my own vine,' answered Philemon. You may see one of its branches twisting across the window yonder. But wife and I thought the grapes very fine ones. I never tasted better, said the guest. Another cup of this delicious milk, if you please, and I shall then have supped better than a prince. This time old Philemon bestirred himself and took up the pitcher, for he was curious to discover whether there was any reality in the marvels which Baucis had whispered to him. He knew that his good old wife was incapable of falsehood, and that she was seldom mistaken in what she supposed to be true. But this was so very singular a case that he wanted to see into it with his own eyes. On taking up the pitcher, therefore, he slyly peeped into it, and was fully satisfied that it contained not so much as a single drop. All at once, however, 
he beheld a little white fountain which gushed up from the bottom of the pitcher, and speedily filled it to the brim with foaming and deliciously fragrant milk. It was lucky that Philemon, in his surprise, did not drop the miraculous pitcher from his hand. "'Who are ye, wonder-working strangers?' cried he, even more bewildered than his wife had been. "'Your guests, my good Philemon, and your friends,' replied the elder traveller in his mild, deep voice, that had something at once sweet and awe-inspiring in it. "'Give me likewise a cup of the milk, and may your pitcher never be empty for kind Baucis and yourself, any more than for the needy wayfarer.' The supper being over now, the strangers requested to be shown to their place of repose. The old people would gladly have taken with them a little longer, and have expressed the wonder which they felt, and their delight at finding the poor and meagre supper prove so much better and more abundant than they hoped. But the elder traveller had inspired them with such reverence that they dared not ask him any questions. And when Philemon drew Quicksilver aside, and inquired how under the sun a fountain of milk could have got into an old earthen pitcher, this latter personage pointed to his staff. "'There is the whole mystery of the affair,' quoth Quicksilver. "'And if you can make it out, I'll thank you to let me know. "'I can't tell what to make of my staff. "'It is always playing such odd tricks as this, "'sometimes getting me a supper, and quite as often stealing it away. "'If I had any faith in such nonsense, I should say the stick was bewitched.' "'He said no more, but looked so slyly in their faces "'that they rather fancied he was laughing at them.' The magic staff went hopping at his heels as Quicksilver quitted the room. When left alone, the good old couple spent some little time in conversation about the events of the evening, and then lay down on the floor and fell fast asleep. They had given up their sleeping room to the guests, and had no other bed for themselves save these planks, which I wish had been as soft as their own hearts. The old man and his wife were stirring betimes in the morning, and the strangers likewise arose with the sun, and made their preparations to depart. Philemon hospitably entreated them to remain a little longer, until Baucis could milk the cow and bake a cake upon the hearth, and perhaps find them a few fresh eggs for breakfast. The guests, however, seemed to think it better to accomplish a good part of their journey before the heat of the day should come on. They, therefore, persisted in setting out immediately, but asked Philemon and Baucis to walk forth with them a short distance, and show them the road which they were to take. So they all four issued from the cottage, chatting together like old friends. It was very remarkable indeed how familiar the old couple insensibly grew with the elder traveller, and how their good and simple spirits melted into his, even as two drops of water would melt into the illimitable ocean. And as for Quicksilver, with his keen, quick, laughing wits, he appeared to discover every little thought that but peeped into their minds, before they suspected it themselves. They sometimes wished, it is true, that he had not been quite so quick-witted, and also that he would fling away his staff, which looked so mysteriously mischievous, with the snakes always writhing about it. But then again, Quicksilver showed himself so very good-humoured that they would have been rejoiced to keep him in their cottage, staff, snakes and all, every day and the whole day long. "'Ah, me! Well a day!' exclaimed Philemon, while they had walked a little way from their door. "'If our neighbors only knew what a blessed thing it is to show hospitality to strangers, they would tie up all their dogs and never allow their children to fling another stone. "'It is a sin and shame for them to behave so, that it is,' cried good old Baucis, vehemently. "'And I mean to go this very day and tell some of them what naughty people they are.' I fear, remarked Quicksilver, slyly smiling, that you will find none of them at home. The elder traveller's brow, just then, assumed such a grave, stern, and awful grandeur, yet serene withal, that neither Baucis nor Philemon dared to speak a word. They gazed reverently into his face, as if they had been gazing at the sky. When men do not feel toward the humblest stranger as if he were a brother— said the traveller, in tones so deep that they sounded like those of an organ. They are unworthy to exist on earth, which was created as the abode of a great human brotherhood. And by the by, my dear old people, cried Quicksilver, with the liveliest look of fun and mischief in his eyes, where is this same village that you talk about? On which side of us does it lie? Methinks I do not see it hereabouts. 
Philemon and his wife turned toward the valley, where, at sunset only the day before, they had seen the meadows, the houses, the gardens, the clumps of trees, the wide green margin street, with children playing in it, and all the tokens of business, enjoyment, and prosperity. But what was their astonishment? There was no longer any appearance of a village. Even the fertile vale, in the hollow of which it lay, had ceased to have existence. In its stead they beheld the broad, blue surface of a lake, which filled the great basin of the valley from brim to brim, and reflected the surrounding hills in its bosom, with as tranquil an image as if it had been there ever since the creation of the world. For an instant the lake remained perfectly smooth. Then a little breeze sprang up and caused the water to dance, glitter, and sparkle in the early sunbeams, and to dash with a pleasant rippling murmur against the hither shore. The lake seemed so strangely familiar that the old couple were greatly perplexed, and felt as if they could only have been dreaming about a village having lain there. But the next moment they remembered the vanished dwellings, and the faces and characters of the inhabitants far too distinctly for a dream. The village had been there yesterday, and now was gone. Alas, cried the kind-hearted old people, what has become of our poor neighbors? They exist no longer as men and women said the elder traveller, in his grand and deep voice, while a roll of thunder seemed to echo it at a distance. There was neither use nor beauty in such a life as theirs, for they never softened or sweetened the hard lot of mortality by the exercise of kindly affections between man and man. They retained no image of the better life in their bosoms. Therefore the lake that was of old has spread itself forth again to reflect the sky." And as for those foolish people, said Quicksilver, with his mischievous smile, they are all transformed to fishes. There needed but little change, for they were already a scaly set of rascals, in the coldest-blooded beings in existence. So, kind Mother Baucis, whenever you or your husband have an appetite for a dish of broiled trout, he can throw in a line and pull out half a dozen of your old neighbors. Ah, cried Baucis, shuddering, I would not, for the world, put one of them on the gridiron. No, added Philemon, making a wry face, we could never relish them. As for you, good Philemon, continued the elder traveller, and you, kind Baucis, you with your scanty means have mingled so much heartfelt hospitality with your entertainment of the homeless stranger, that the milk became an inexhaustible fount of nectar, and the brown loaf and the honey were ambrosia. Thus the divinities have feasted, at your board, off the same viands that supply their banquets on Olympus. You have done well, my dear old friends. Wherefore, request whatever favor you have most at heart, and it is granted. Philemon and Baucis looked at one another, and then, I know not which of the two it was who spoke, but that one uttered the desire of both their hearts. Let us live together while we live, and leave the world at the same instant when we die for we have always loved one another. Be it so, replied the stranger, with majestic kindness. Now look toward your cottage. They did so. But what was their surprise on beholding a tall edifice of white marble, with a wide open portal, occupying the spot where their humble residence had so lately stood? There is your home, said the stranger, beneficently smiling on them both. Exercise your hospitality in yonder palace as freely as in the poor hovel to which you welcomed us last evening. The old folks fell on their knees to thank him, but, behold, neither he nor Quicksilver was there. So Philemon and Baucis took up their residence in the marble palace, and spent their time, with vast satisfaction to themselves, in making everybody jolly and comfortable who happened to pass that way. The milk pitcher, I must not forget to say, retained its marvellous quality of being never empty when it was desirable to have it full. Whenever an honest, good-humoured, and free-hearted guest took a draught from this pitcher, he invariably found it the sweetest and most invigorating fluid that ever ran down his throat. But if a cross and disagreeable curmudgeon happened to sip, he was pretty certain to twist his visage into a hard knot and pronounce it a pitcher of sour milk. Thus the old couple lived in their palace a great, great while, and grew older and older, and very old indeed. At length, however, there came a summer morning, when Philemon and Baucis failed to make their appearance, as on other mornings, with one hospitable smile overspreading both their pleasant faces, to invite the guests of overnight to breakfast. The guests searched everywhere, 
from top to bottom of the spacious palace, and all to no purpose. But, after a great deal of perplexity, they espied in front of the portal two venerable trees, which nobody could remember to have seen there the day before. Yet there they stood, with their roots fastened deep into the soil, and a huge breadth of foliage overshadowing the whole front of the edifice. One was an oak, and the other a linden tree. Their boughs, it was strange and beautiful to see, were intertwined together, and embraced one another, so that each tree seemed to live in the other tree's bosom much more than in its own. While the guests were marveling how these trees, that must have required at least a century to grow, could have come to be so tall and venerable in a single night, a breeze sprang up, and set their intermingled boughs astir. And then there was a deep, broad murmur in the air, as if the two mysterious trees were speaking. "'I am old Philemon,' murmured the oak. "'I am old Baucis,' murmured the linden tree. But as the breeze grew stronger, the trees both spoke at once. "'Philemon, Baucis, Baucis, Philemon!' As if one were both and both were one, and talked together in the depths of their mutual heart. It was plain enough to perceive that the good old couple had renewed their age, and were now to spend a quiet and delightful hundred years or so, Philemon as an oak, and Baucis as a linden tree, and oh, what a hospitable shade did they fling around them. Whenever a wayfarer paused beneath it, he heard a pleasant whisper of the leaves above his head, and wondered how the sound should so much resemble words like these. Welcome, welcome, dear traveller, welcome! And some kind soul, that knew what would have pleased old Baucis and old Philemon best, built a circular seat around both their trunks, where, for a great while afterward, the weary and the hungry and the thirsty used to repose themselves, and quaff milk abundantly out of the miraculous pitcher. And I wish for all our sakes that we had the pitcher here now. End of chapter 13 Recording by Lee Smalley Section 14 of Myths Every Child Should Know This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Myths Every Child Should Know, edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. The Paradise of Children Long, long ago, when this old world was in its tender infancy, there was a child named Epimetheus, who never had either father or mother, and, that he might not be lonely, another child, fatherless and motherless like himself, was sent from a far country to live with him and be his playfellow and helpmate. Her name was Pandora. The first thing that Pandora saw when she entered the cottage where Epimetheus dwelt was a great box, and almost the first question which she put to him after crossing the threshold was this. Epimetheus, what have you got in that box? My dear little Pandora, answered Epimetheus, that is a secret, and you must be kind enough not to ask any questions about it. The box was left here to be kept safely, and I do not myself know what it contains. But who gave it to you? asked Pandora, and where did it come from? That's a secret too, replied Epimetheus. How provoking, exclaimed Pandora, pouting her lip. I wish the great ugly box were out of the way. Oh, come, don't think of it any more, cried Epimetheus. Let's run out of doors and have some nice play with the other children. It is thousands of years since Epimetheus and Pandora were alive, and the world nowadays is a very different sort of thing from what it was in their time. Then everybody was a child. There needed no fathers and mothers to take care of the children, because there was no danger, nor trouble of any kind, and no clothes to be mended, and there was always plenty to eat and drink. Whenever a child wanted his dinner, he found it growing on a tree, and, if he looked at the tree in the morning, he could see the expanding blossom of that night's supper, or, at eventide, he saw the tender bud of tomorrow's breakfast. It was a very pleasant life indeed. No labor to be done, no tasks to be studied, nothing but sports and dances and sweet voices of children talking, or caroling like birds, or gushing out in merry laughter throughout the livelong day. What was most wonderful of all, the children never quarreled among themselves. 
Neither had they any crying fits, nor, since time first began, had a single one of these little mortals ever gone apart into a corner and sulked. Oh, what a good time that was to be alive in! The truth is, those ugly little winged monsters called Troubles, which are now almost as numerous as mosquitoes, had never yet been seen on the earth. It is probable that the very greatest disquietude which a child had ever experienced was Pandora's vexation at not being able to discover the secret of the mysterious box. This was at first only the faint shadow of a trouble, but every day it grew more and more substantial, until, before a great while, the cottage of Epimetheus and Pandora was less sunshiny than those of the other children. Whence can the box have come, Pandora continually kept saying to herself and to Epimetheus, and what in the world can be inside of it? Always talking about this box, said Epimetheus at last, for he had grown extremely tired of the subject. I wish, dear Pandora, you would try to talk of something else. Come, let us go and gather some ripe figs and eat them under the trees for our supper, and I know a vine that has the sweetest and juiciest grapes you've ever tasted. Always talking about grapes and figs, cried Pandora pettishly. Well then, said Epimetheus, who was a very good-tempered child, like a multitude of children in those days, let us run out and have a merry time with our playmates. I am tired of merry times, and I don't care if I never have any more, answered our pettish little Pandora. And besides, I never do have any. This ugly box. I am so taken up with thinking about it all the time. I insist upon your telling me what is inside of it. As I have already said fifty times over, I do not know, replied Epimetheus, getting a little vexed. How, then, can I tell you what is inside? You might open it, said Pandora, looking sideways at Epimetheus, and then we would see for ourselves. Pandora, what are you thinking of? exclaimed Epimetheus. And his face expressed so much horror at the idea of looking into the box, which had been confided to him on the condition of his never opening it, that Pandora thought it best not to suggest it any more. Still, however, she could not help thinking and talking about the box. At least, she said, you can tell me how it came here. It was left at the door, replied Epimetheus, just before you came, by a person who looked very smiling and intelligent, and who could hardly forbear laughing as he put it down. He was dressed in an odd kind of cloak and had on a cap that seemed to be made partly of feathers, so it looked almost as if it had wings. "'What sort of staff had he?' asked Pandora. "'Oh, the most curious staff you ever saw!' cried Epimetheus. "'It was like two serpents twisting around a stick, and was carved so naturally that I, at first, thought the serpents were alive.' "'I know him!' said Pandora thoughtfully. "'Nobody else has such a staff. It was Quicksilver.' and he brought me hither as well as the box. No doubt he intended it for me, and, most probably, it contains pretty dresses for me to wear, or toys for you and me to play with, or something very nice for both of us to eat. Perhaps so, answered Epimetheus, turning away, but until Quicksilver comes back and tells us so, we have neither of us any right to lift the lid of the box. What a dull boy he is, muttered Pandora, as Epimetheus left the cottage. I do wish he had a little more enterprise. For the first time since her arrival, Epimetheus had gone out without asking Pandora to accompany him. He went to gather figs and grapes by himself, or to seek whatever amusement he could find, in other society than his little playfellows. He was tired to death of hearing about the box, and heartily wished that Quicksilver, or whatever was the messenger's name, had left it at some other child's door where Pandora would never have set eyes on it. So perversely did she babble about this one thing. The box, the box, and nothing but the box. It seemed as if the box were bewitched, and as if the cottage were not big enough to hold it without Pandora's continually stumbling over it and making Epimetheus stumble over it likewise and bruising all four of their shins. Well, it was really hard that poor Epimetheus should have a box in his ears from morning till night especially as the little people of the earth were so unaccustomed to vexations. In those happy days, they knew not how to deal with them. Thus, a small vexation made as much disturbance then as a far bigger one would in our own times. As Epimetheus was gone, Pandora stood gazing at the box. She had called it ugly above a hundred times, but in spite of all that she had said against it, it was positively a very handsome article of furniture 
and would have been quite an ornament to any room in which it should be placed. He was made of a beautiful kind of wood, with dark and rich veins spreading over its surface, which was so highly polished that little Pandora could see her face in it. As the child had no other looking-glass, it is odd that she did not value the box merely on this account. The edges and corners of the box were carved with most wonderful skill. Around the margin there were figures of graceful men and women, and the prettiest children ever seen, reclining or sporting amid a profusion of flowers and foliage. And these various objects were so exquisitely represented, and were wrought together in such harmony, that flowers, foliage, and human beings seemed to combine into a wreath of mingled beauty. But here and there, peeping forth from behind the carved foliage, Pandora once or twice fancied that she saw a face not so lovely, or something or other that was disagreeable, and which stole the beauty out of all the rest. Nevertheless, on looking more closely and touching the spot with her finger, she could discover nothing of the kind. Some face that was really beautiful had been made to look ugly by her catching a sideway glimpse of it. The most beautiful face of all was done in what is called high relief in the center of the lid. There was nothing else save the dark, smooth richness of the polished wood, and this one face in the center with a garland of flowers about its brow. Pandora had looked at this face a great many times, and imagined that the mouth could smile if it liked, or be grave when it chose, the same as any living mouth. The features, indeed, all wore a very lively and rather mischievous expression, which looked almost as if it needs must burst out of the carved lips and utter itself in words. Had the mouth spoken, it would probably have been something like this. Do not be afraid, Pandora. What harm can there be in opening the box? Never mind the poor, simple Epimetheus. You are wiser than he, and have ten times as much spirit. Open the box, and see if you do not find something very pretty. The box, I had almost forgotten to say, was fastened, not by a lock, nor by any such contrivance, but by a very intricate knot of gold cord. There appeared to be no end to this knot, and no beginning. Never was a knot so cunningly twisted, nor with so many ins and outs which roguishly defied the skillfulest fingers to disentangle them. And yet, by the very difficulty that there was in it, Pandora was the more tempted to examine the knot, and just see how it was made. Two or three times already she had stooped over the box and taken the knot between her thumb and forefinger, but without positively trying to undo it. I really believe, she said to herself, that I began to see how it was done. Nay, perhaps I could tie it up again after undoing it. There would be no harm in that, surely. Even Epimetheus would not blame me for that. I need not open the box, and should not, of course, without the foolish boy's consent, even if the knot were untied. It might have been better for Pandora if she had a little work to do, or anything to employ her mind, so as not to be so constantly thinking of this one subject. But children led so easily a life, before any troubles came into the world, that they had really a good deal too much leisure. They could not be forever playing at hide-and-seek among the flower shrubs, or at blind man's buff with garlands over their eyes, or at whatever other games had been found out while Mother Earth was in her babyhood. When life is all sport, toil is the real play. There is absolutely nothing to do. A little sweeping and dusting about the cottage, I suppose, and the gathering of fresh flowers, which were only too abundant everywhere, and arranging them in vases, and poor little Pandora's day work was over. And then, for the rest of the day, there was the box. After all, I am not quite sure that the box was not a blessing to her in its way. It supplied her with such a variety of ideas to think of and to talk about, whenever she had anybody to listen. When she was in good humor, she could admire the bright polish of its sides and the rich border of beautiful faces and foliage that ran all around it. Or, if she chanced to be ill-tempered, she could give it a push or kick it with her naughty little foot. And many a kick did the box. But it was a mischievous box, as we shall see, and deserved all it got. Many a kick did it receive. But, certain it is, if it had not been for the box, our active-minded little Pandora would not have known half so well how to spend her time as she now did. 
for it was really an endless employment to guess what was inside. What could it be, indeed? Just imagine, my little hearers, how busy your wits would be if there was a great box in the house which, as you might have reason to suppose, contained something new and pretty for your Christmas or New Year's gifts. Do you think that you should be less curious than Pandora? If you are left alone with the box, might you not be a little tempted to lift the lid? But you would not do it. Oh, fie! No, no! Only if you thought there were toys in it, it would be so very hard to let slip an opportunity of taking just one peep. I know not whether Pandora expected any toys, for none had yet begun to be made probably in those days, when the world itself was one great plaything for the children that dwelt upon it. But Pandora was convinced that there was something very beautiful and valuable in the box, and therefore she felt just as anxious to take a peep as any of those little girls here around me would have felt, and possibly a little more so, but of that I am not quite so certain. On this particular day, however, which we have so long been talking about, her curiosity grew so much greater than it usually was that, at last, she approached the box. She was more than half determined to open it if she could. Ah, naughty Pandora. First, however, she tried to lift it. It was heavy, quite too heavy for the slender strength of a girl like Pandora. She raised one end of the box a few inches from the floor and let it fall again with a pretty loud thump. A moment afterward, she almost fancied that she heard something stir inside of the box. She applied her ear as closely as possible and listened. Positively, there did seem to be a kind of stifled murmur within. Or was it merely the singing in Pandora's ears? Or could it be the beating of her heart? The child could not quite satisfy herself whether she had heard anything or no. But at all events, her curiosity was stronger than ever. As she drew back her head, her eyes fell upon the knot of gold cord. It must have been a very ingenious person who tied this knot, said Pandora to herself but I think I could untie it nevertheless. I am resolved, at least, to find the two ends of the cord. So she took the golden knot in her fingers and pried into its intricacies as sharply as she could. Almost without intending it or quite knowing what she was about, she was soon busily engaged in attempting to undo it. Meanwhile, the bright sunlight came through the open window as did likewise the merry voices of the children playing at a distance and perhaps the voice of Epimetheus among them. Pandora stopped to listen. What a beautiful day it was. Would it not be wiser if she were to let the troublesome knot alone and think no more about the box, but run and join her little playfellow and be happy? All this time, however, her fingers were half unconsciously busy with the knot and happening to glance at the flower-wreathed face on the lid of the enchanted box. She seemed to perceive it slyly grinning at her. That face looks very mischievous, thought Pandora. I wonder whether it smiles because I am doing wrong. I have the greatest mind in the world to run away. But just then, by the merest accident, she gave the knot a kind of twist, which produced a wonderful result. The gold cord untwined itself as if by magic and left the box without a fastening. This is the strangest thing I ever knew, said Pandora. What will Epimetheus say, and how can I possibly tie it up again? She made one or two attempts to restore the knot, but soon found it quite beyond her skill. It had disentangled itself so suddenly that she could not in the least remember how the strings had been doubled into one another, and when she tried to recollect the shape and appearance of the knot, it seemed to have gone entirely out of her mind. Nothing was to be done, therefore, but to let the box remain as it was until Epimetheus should come in. But, said Pandora, when he finds the knot untied, he will know that I have done it. How shall I make him believe that I have not looked into the box? And then the thought came into her naughty little heart that, since she would be suspected of having looked in the box, she might just as well do so at once. Oh, very naughty and very foolish Pandora, you should have thought only of doing what was right and of leaving undone what was wrong, and not of what your fellow Epimetheus would have said or believed. And so perhaps she might, if the enchanted face on the lid of the box had not looked so bewitchingly persuasive at her, and if she had not seemed to hear more distinctly than before the murmur of small voices within. She could not tell whether it was fancy or no, 
but there was quite a little tumult of whispers in her ear, or else it was her curiosity that whispered, Let us out, dear Pandora, pray let us out. We shall be nice pretty playfellows for you, only let us out. What can it be, thought Pandora? Is there something alive in the box? Well, yes, I am resolved to take just one peep, only one peep, and then the lid shall be shut down as safely as ever. There cannot possibly be any harm in just one little peep. But it is now time for us to see what Epimetheus was doing. This was the first time since his little playmate had come to dwell with him that he had attempted to enjoy any pleasure in which she did not partake. But nothing went right, nor was he nearly so happy as on other days. He could not find a sweet grape or a ripe fig. If Epimetheus had a fault, it was a little too much fondness for figs. Or, if ripe at all, they were overripe and so sweet as to be cloying. There was no mirth in his heart, such as usually made his voice gush out of its own accord and swell the merriment of his companions. In short, he grew so uneasy and discontented that the other children could not imagine what was the matter with Epimetheus. Neither did he himself know what ailed him any better than they did. For you must recollect that, at the time we are speaking of, it was everybody's nature and a constant habit to be happy. The world had not yet learned to be otherwise. Not a single soul or body, since these children were first sent to enjoy themselves on the beautiful earth, had ever been sick or out of sorts. At length, discovering that, somehow or another, he put a stop to all the play, Epimetheus judged it best to go back to Pandora, who was in a humor better suited to his own. But, with a hope of giving her pleasure, he gathered some flowers and made them into a wreath which he meant to put upon her head. The flowers were very lovely, roses and lilies and orange blossoms, and a great many more which left a trail of fragrance behind as Epimetheus carried them along, and the wreath was put together with as much skill as could reasonably be expected of a boy. The fingers of little girls, it has always appeared to me, are the fittest to twine flower wreaths, but boys could do it, in those days, rather better than they can now. And here I must mention that a great black cloud had been gathering in the sky for some time past, although it had not yet overspread the sun. But just as Epimetheus reached the cottage door, this cloud began to intercept the sunshine and thus to make a sudden and sad obscurity. He entered softly, for he meant, if possible, to steal behind Pandora and fling the wreath of flowers over her head, before she should be aware of his approach. But as it happened, there was no need of his treading so very lightly. He might have tread as heavily as he pleased, as heavily as a grown man, as heavily as I was going to say, as an elephant, without much probability of Pandora's hearing his footsteps. She was too intent upon her purpose. At the moment of his entering the cottage, the naughty child had put her hand to the lid and was on the point of opening the mysterious box. Epimetheus beheld her. If he had cried out, Pandora would probably have withdrawn her hand and the fatal mystery of the box might never have been known. But Epimetheus himself, although he said very little about it, had his own share of curiosity to know what was inside. Perceiving that Pandora was resolved to find out the secret, he determined that his playfellow should not be the only wise person in the cottage, and if there was anything pretty or valuable in the box, he meant to take half of it himself. Thus, after all his sage speeches to Pandora about restraining her curiosity, Epimetheus turned out to be quite as foolish and nearly as much in fault as she. So whenever we blame Pandora for what happened, we must not forget to shake our heads at Epimetheus likewise. As Pandora raised the lid, the cottage grew very dark and dismal, for the black cloud had now swept quite over the sun, and seemed to have buried it alive. There had, for a little while past, been a low growling and muttering which all at once broke into a heavy peal of thunder. But Pandora, heeding nothing of all this, lifted the lid nearly upright and looked inside. It seemed as if a sudden swarm of winged creatures brushed past her, taking flight out of the box, while, at the same instant, she heard the voice of Epimetheus with a lamentable tone, as if he were in pain. Oh, I am stung, cried he, I am stung, naughty Pandora, why have you opened this wicked box? 
Pandora let fall the lid and, starting up, looked about her to see what had befallen Epimetheus. The thundercloud had so darkened the room that she could not very clearly discern what was in it. But she heard a disagreeable buzzing, as if a great many huge flies or gigantic mosquitoes or those insects which we call door bugs and pinching dogs were darting about, and as her eyes grew more accustomed to the imperfect light, she saw a crowd of ugly little shapes with bat's wings looking abominably spiteful and armed with terribly long stings in their tails. He was one of these that had stung Epimetheus, nor was it a great while before Pandora herself began to scream in no less pain and affright than her playfellow, and making a vast deal more hubbub about it. An odious little monster had settled on her forehead and would have stung her I know not how deeply if Epimetheus had not run and brushed it away. Now, if you wish to know what these ugly things might be which had made their escape out of the box, I must tell you that they were the whole family of earthly troubles. There were evil passions. There were a great many species of cares. There were more than a hundred and fifty sorrows. There were diseases in a vast number of miserable and painful shapes. There were more kinds of naughtiness than it would be in any use to talk about. In short, everything that has since afflicted the souls and bodies of mankind had been shut up in the mysterious box and given to Epimetheus and Pandora to be kept safely in order that the happy children of the world might never be molested by them. Had they been faithful to their trust, all would have gone well. No grown person would have ever been sad, nor any child have had cause to shed a single tear from that hour until this moment. But, and you may see by this how a wrong act of any one mortal is a calamity to the whole world, by Pandora's lifting of the lid of that miserable box, and by the fault of Epimetheus too in not preventing her, these troubles have obtained a foothold among us, and do not seem very likely to be driven away in a hurry. For it was impossible, as you will easily guess, that the two children should keep the ugly swarms in their own little cottage. On the contrary, the first thing they did was to fling open the doors and windows in hopes of getting rid of them, and sure enough, away flew the winged troubles all abroad, and so pestered and tormented the small people everywhere about, that none of them so much as smiled for days afterward. And, what was very singular, all the flowers and dewy blossoms on earth, not one of which had hitherto faded, now began to droop and shed their leaves after a day or two. The children, moreover, who before seemed immortal in their childhood, now grew older day by day, and came soon to be youths and maidens, and men and women by and by, and aged people, before they dreamed of such a thing. Meanwhile, the naughty Pandora and hardly less naughty Epimetheus remained in their cottage. Both of them had been grievously stung and were in a good deal of pain, which seemed the more intolerable to them, because it was the very first pain that had ever been felt since the world began. Of course, they were entirely unaccustomed to it and could have no idea what it meant. Besides all this, they were in exceedingly bad humor, both with themselves and with one another. In order to indulge it to the utmost, Epimetheus sat down sullenly in a corner with his back toward Pandora, while Pandora flung herself upon the floor and rested her head on the fatal and abominable box. She was crying bitterly and sobbing as if her heart would break. Suddenly, there was a gentle little tap on the inside of the lid. What can that be? cried Pandora, lifting her head. But either Epimetheus had not heard the tap or was too much out of humor to notice it. At any rate, he made no answer. You are very unkind, said Pandora, sobbing anew, not to speak to me. Again the tap. It sounded like the tiny knuckles of a fairy's hand knocking lightly and playfully on the inside of the box. Who are you? asked Pandora with a little of her former curiosity. Who are you inside of this naughty box? A sweet little voice spoke from within. Only lift the lid and you shall see. No, no, answered Pandora, again beginning to sob. I have had enough of lifting the lid. You are inside of the box, naughty creature, and there you shall stay. There are plenty of your ugly brothers and sisters already flying about the world. You need never think that I shall be so foolish as to let you out. She looked toward Epimetheus as she spoke, perhaps expecting that he would commend her for her wisdom. 
but the sullen boy only muttered that she was wise a little too late. Ah, said the sweet voice again, you had much better let me out. I am not like those naughty creatures that have stings in their tails. They are no brothers and sisters of mine, as you would see at once if you would only get a glimpse of me. Come, come, my pretty Pandora. I am sure you will let me out. And indeed, there was a kind of cheerful witchery in the tone that made it almost impossible to refuse anything which this little voice asked. Pandora's heart had insensibly grown lighter at every word that came from within the box. Epimetheus, too, though still in the corner, had turned half round and seemed to be in rather better spirits than before. "'My dear Epimetheus,' cried Pandora, "'have you heard this little voice?' "'Yes, to be sure I have,' answered he, but in no very good humour as yet. "'And what of it?' "'Shall I lift the lid again?' asked Pandora. "'Just as you please,' said Epimetheus. "'You have done so much mischief today that perhaps you may as well do a little more.' One other trouble in such a swarm as you have set adrift about the world can make no very great difference. You might speak a little more kindly, murmured Pandora, wiping her eyes. Ah, naughty boy, cried the little voice within the box in an arch and laughing tone. He knows he is longing to see me. Come, my dear Pandora, open the lid. I am in a great hurry to comfort you. Only let me have some fresh air, and you shall soon see that matters are not quite so dismal as you think them. Epimetheus, exclaimed Pandora, come what may, I am resolved to open the box. And, as the lid seems very heavy, cried Epimetheus, running across the room, I will help you. So, with one consent, the two children again lifted the lid. Out flew a sunny and smiling little personage and hovered about the room, throwing a light wherever she went. Have you never made the sunshine dance into dark corners by reflecting it from a bit of looking-glass? Well, so looked the winged cheerfulness of this fairy-like stranger amid the gloom of the cottage. She flew to Epimetheus and laid the least touch of her fingers on the inflamed spot where the trouble had stung him, and immediately the anguish of it was gone. Then she kissed Pandora on the forehead, and her hurt was cured likewise. After performing these good offices, the bright stranger fluttered sportively over the children's heads and looked so sweetly at them that they both began to think it not so very much amiss to have opened the box since, otherwise, their cheery guest must have been kept a prisoner among those naughty imps with stings in their tails. "'Pray, who are you, beautiful creature?' inquired Pandora. "'I am to be called Hope,' answered the sunshiny figure." And because I am such a cheery little body, I was packed into the box to make amends to the human race for that swarm of ugly troubles, which was destined to be let loose among them. Never fear, I shall do pretty well in spite of them all. Your wings are colored like the rainbow, exclaimed Pandora. How very beautiful. Yes, they are like the rainbow, said Hope. Because glad as my nature is, I am partly made of tears as well as smiles. And will you stay with us, asked Epimetheus, forever and ever? As long as you need me, said Hope with her pleasant smile, and that will be as long as you live in the world. I promise never to desert you. There may come times and seasons now and then when you will think that I have utterly vanished, but again and again and again, when perhaps you least dream of it, you shall see the glimmer of my wings on the ceiling of your cottage. Yes, my dear children, and I know something very good and beautiful that is to be given you hereafter. Oh, tell us, they exclaimed. Tell us what it is. Do not ask me, replied Hope, putting her finger on her rosy mouth. But do not despair, even if it should never happen while you live on this earth. Trust in my promise, for it is true. We do trust you, cried Epimetheus and Pandora, both in one breath. And so they did. And not only they, but so has everybody trusted Hope, that has since been alive. And to tell you the truth, I cannot help being glad. Though, to be sure, it was an uncommonly naughty thing for her to do. But I cannot help being glad that our foolish Pandora peeped into the box. No doubt, no doubt, the troubles are still flying about the world and have increased in multitude rather than lessened, and are a very ugly set of imps and carry most venomous stings in their tails. I have felt them already and expect to feel them more as I grow older. But then that lovely and lightsome little figure of hope... What in the world could we do without her? Hope spiritualizes the earth. Hope makes it always new, and, even in the earth's best and brightest aspect, 
hope shows it to be only the shadow of an infinite bliss hereafter. End of section 14. Section 15 of Myths Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Myths Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section 15. The Cyclops. When the great city of Troy was taken, all the chiefs who had fought against it set sail for their homes. But there was wrath in heaven against them, for indeed they had borne themselves haughtily and cruelly in the day of their victory. Therefore they did not all find a safe and happy return. For one was shipwrecked, and another was shamefully slain by his false wife in his palace. And others found all things at home troubled and changed, and were driven to seek new dwellings elsewhere. And some, whose wives and friends and people had been still true to them through those ten long years of absence, were driven far and wide about the world before they saw their native land again. And of all, the wise Ulysses was he who wandered farthest and suffered most. He was well nigh the last to sail, for he had tarried many days to do pleasure to Agamemnon, lord of all the Greeks. Twelve ships he had with him, twelve he had brought to Troy and in each there were some fifty men, being scarce half of those that had sailed in them in the old days. So many valiant heroes slept the last sleep, by Samoys and Scamander, and in the plain and on the seashore, slain in battle or by the shafts of Apollo. First they sailed northwest to the Thracian coast, where the Siconians dwelt, who had helped the men of Troy. Their city they took, and in it much plunder, slaves and oxen, and jars of fragrant wine, and might have escaped unhurt, but that they stayed to hold revel on the shore. For the Siconians gathered their neighbors, being men of the same blood, and did battle with the invaders, and drove them to their ship. And when Ulysses numbered his men, he found that he had lost six out of each ship. Scarce had he set out again, when the wind began to blow fiercely, so, seeing a smooth sandy beach, they drove the ships ashore, and dragged them out of the reach of the waves, and waited till the storm should abate. And the third morning being fair, they sailed again, and journeyed prosperously, till they came to the very end of the great Peloponnesian land, where Cape Malia looks out upon the southern sea. But contrary currents baffled them, so that they could not round it, and the north wind blew so strongly, that they must fain drive before it and on the tenth day they came to the land where the lotus grows, a wondrous fruit, of which whosoever eats cares not to see country or wife or children again. Now the lotus eaters, for so they called the people of the land, were a kindly folk, and gave of the fruit to some of the sailors, not meaning them any harm, but thinking it to be the best that they had to give. These, when they had eaten, said that they would not sail any more over the sea, which, when the wise Ulysses heard, he bade their comrades bind them and carry them, sadly complaining, to the ships. Then, the wind having abated, they took to their oars, and rowed for many days till they came to the country where the Cyclops dwell. Now a mile or so from the shore there was an island, very fair and fertile, but no man dwells there or tills the soil, and in the island, a harbor where a ship may be safe from all winds, and at the head of the harbor, a stream falling from the rock, and whispering alders all about it. Into this, the ships passed safely, and were hauled up on the beach, and the crew slept by them, waiting for the morning. And the next day, they hunted the wild goats, of which there were a great store on the island, and feasted right merrily on what they caught, with draughts of red wine which they had carried off from the town of the Siconians. But on the morrow, Ulysses, for he was ever fond of adventure, and would know of every land to which he came, what manner of men they were that dwelt there, took one of his twelve ships, and bade row to the land. There was a great hill sloping to the shore, and there rose up here and there a smoke from the caves, where the Cyclops dwelt apart, holding no converse with each other, for they were a rude and savage folk, but ruled each his own household, not caring for others. 
Now very close to the shore was one of these caves, very huge and deep, with laurels round about the mouth, and in front, a fold with walls built of rough stone, and shaded by tall oaks and pines. So Ulysses chose out of the crew the twelve bravest, and bade the rest guard the ship, and went to see what manner of dwelling this was, and who abode there. He had his sword by his side, and on his shoulder a mighty skin of wine, sweet-smelling and strong, with which he might win the heart of some fierce savage, should he chance to meet with such, as indeed his prudent heart forecast that he might. So they entered the cave, and judged that it was the dwelling of some rich and skilful shepherd, for within there were pens for the young of the sheep and of the goats, divided all according to their age, and there were baskets full of cheeses, and full milk pails ranged along the wall, but the cyclops himself was away in the pastures. Then the companions of Ulysses besought him that he would depart, taking with him, if he would, a store of cheeses and sundry of the lambs and of the kids. But he would not, for he wished to see, after his want, what manner of host this strange shepherd might be, and truly he saw it to his cost. It was evening when the Cyclops came home, a mighty giant, twenty feet in height or more. On his shoulder he bore a vast bundle of pine logs for his fire, and threw them down outside the cave with a great crash, and drove the flocks within, and closed the entrance with a huge rock, which twenty wagons and more could not bear. Then he milked the ewes and all the she-goats, and half the milk he curdled for cheese, and half he set ready for himself, when he should sup. Next he kindled a fire with the pine logs, and the flames lighted up the cave, showing him Ulysses and his comrades. "'Who are ye?' cried Polyphemus, for that was the giant's name. "'Are ye traitors, or haply pirates?' For in those days it was not counted shame to be called a pirate. Ulysses shuddered at the dreadful voice and shape, but bore him bravely, and answered, "'We are no pirates, mighty sir, but Greeks.' sailing back from Troy, and subjects of the great king Agamemnon, whose fame is spread from one end of heaven to the other, and we are come to beg hospitality of thee in the name of Zeus, who rewards or punishes hosts and guests, according as they be faithful the one to the other, or no. Nay, said the giant, it is but idle talk to tell me of Zeus and the other gods. We Cyclops take no account of gods, holding ourselves to be much better and stronger than they. But come, tell me where you have left your ship. But Ulysses saw his thought, when he asked about the ship, how he was minded to break it, and take from them all hope of flight. Therefore he answered craftily, Ship we have none, for that which was ours, King Poseidon break, driving it on a jutting rock on this coast, and we whom thou seest are all that are escaped from the waves. Polyphemus answered nothing, but without more ado caught up two of the men, as a man might catch up the whelps of a dog, and dashed them on the ground, and tore them limb from limb, and devoured them, with huge draughts of milk between, leaving not a morsel, not even the very bones. But the others, when they saw the dreadful deed, could only weep and pray to Zeus for help, and when the giant had ended his foul meal, he lay down among his sheep and slept. Then Ulysses questioned much in his heart, whether he should slay the monster as he slept, for he doubted not that his good sword would pierce the giant's heart, mighty as he was. But, being very wise, he remembered that, should he slay him, he and his comrades would yet perish miserably. For who should move away the giant rock that lay against the door of the cave? So they waited till the morning. And the monster woke, and milked his flocks, and afterward, seizing two men, devoured them for his meal. Then he went to the pastures, but put the great rock on the mouth of the cave, just as a man puts down the lid upon his quiver. All that day the wise Ulysses was thinking what he might best do to save himself and his companions, and the end of his thinking was this. There was a mighty pole in the cave, green wood of an olive tree, big as a ship's mast, which Polyphemus proposed to use, when the smoke should have dried it, as a walking staff. Of this he cut off a fathom's length, and his comrades sharpened it, and hardened it in the fire, and then hid it away. At evening the giant came back, and drove his sheep into the cave, 
nor left the rams outside, as he had been wont to do before, but shut them in. And having duly done his shepherd's work, he made his cruel feast as before. Then Ulysses came forward with the wineskin in his hand, and said, Drink, Cyclops, now that thou hast feasted, drink, and see what precious things we had in our ship. But no one hereafter will come to thee with such like, if thou dealest with strangers as cruelly as thou hast dealt with us. Then the Cyclops drank, and was mightily pleased, and said, Give me again to drink, and tell me thy name, stranger, and I will give thee a gift, such as a host should give. In good truth this is a rare liquor. We too have vines, but they bear not wine like this, which indeed must be such as the gods drink in heaven. Then Ulysses gave him the cup again, and he drank. Thrice he gave it to him, and thrice he drank, not knowing what it was, and how it would work within his brain. Then Ulysses spake to him, Thou didst ask my name, Cyclops. Lo, my name is no man, and now that thou knowest my name, thou shouldest give me thy gift. And he said, My gift shall be that I will eat thee, last of all thy company. And as he spake, he fell back in a drunken sleep. Then Ulysses bade his comrades be of good courage, for the time was come when they should be delivered. And they thus thrust the stake of olive wood into the fire till it was ready, green as it was, to burst into flame. And they thrust it into the monster's eye, for he had but one eye, and that in the midst of his forehead, with the eyebrow below it. And Ulysses leant with all his force upon the stake, and thrust it in with might and main. And the burning wood hissed in the eye, just as the red-hot iron hisses in the water, when a man seeks to temper steel for a sword. Then the giant leaped up, and tore away the stake, and cried aloud, so that all the cyclops, who dwelt on the mountainside, heard him, and came about his cave, asking him, What aileth thee, Polyphemus, that thou makest this uproar in the peaceful night, driving away sleep? Is any one robbing thee of thy sheep, or seeking to slay thee by craft or force? And the giant answered, No man slays me by craft. Nay, but, they said, if no man does thee wrong, we cannot help thee. The sickness which great Zeus may send, who can avoid? Pray to our father, Poseidon, for help. Then they departed, and Ulysses was glad at heart for the good success of his device, when he said that he was no man. But the Cyclops rolled away the great stone from the door of the cave, and sat in the midst, stretching out his hands, to feel whether perchance the men within the cave would seek to go out among the sheep. Long did Ulysses think how he and his comrades should best escape. At last he lighted upon a good device, and much he thanked Zeus for that this, once the giant had driven the rams with the other sheep into the cave. For, these being great and strong, he fastened his comrades under the bellies of the beasts, tying them with osier twigs, of which the giant made his bed. One ram he took, and fastened a man beneath it, and two others he set, one on either side. So he did with the six, for but six were left out of the twelve who had ventured with him from the ship. And there was one mighty ram, far larger than all the others, and to this Ulysses clung, grasping the fleece tight with both hands. So they waited for the morning. And when the morning came, the rams rushed forth to the pasture. But the giant sat in the door and felt the back of each as it went by, nor thought to try what might be underneath. Last of all went the great ram, and the cyclops knew him as he passed, and said, How is this, thou, who art the leader of the sheep? Thou art not wont thus to lag behind. Thou hast always been the first to run to the pastures and streams in the morning, and the first to come back to the fold when evening fell, and now thou art last of all. Perhaps thou art troubled by thy master's eye, which some wretch, no man, they call him, has destroyed, having first mastered me with wine. He has not escaped, I ween. I would that thou could speak, and tell me where he is lurking. Of a truth I would dash out his brains upon the ground, and avenge me of this no man. So speaking, he let him pass out of the cave. But when they were out of reach of the giant, Ulysses loosed his hold of the ram, and then unbound his comrades. And they hastened to their ship, not forgetting to drive before them a good store of the cyclops' fat sheep, 
right glad were those that had abode by the ship to see them nor did they lament for those that had died though they were fain to do so for ulysses forbade fearing lest the noise of their weeping should betray them to the giant where they were then they all climbed into the ship and sitting well in order on the benches smote the sea with their oars laying to right lustily that they might the sooner get away from the accursed land and when they rowed a hundred yards or so so that a man's voice could yet be heard by one who stood upon the shore ulysses stood up in the ship and shouted he was no coward o cyclops whose comrades thou didst so foully slay in thy den justly art thou punished monster that devourest thy guests in thy dwelling may the gods make thee suffer yet worse things than these then the cyclops in his wrath broke off the top of a great hill a mighty rock and hurled it where he had heard the voice right in front of the ship's bow it fell and a great wave rose as it sank and washed the ship back to the shore but ulysses seized a long pole with both hands and pushed the ship from the land and bade his comrades ply their oars nodding with his head for he was too wise to speak lest the cyclops should know where they were then they rowed with all their might and main and when they had gotten twice as far as before ulysses made as if he would speak again but his comrades sought to hinder him saying nay my lord anger not the giant any more surely we thought before we were lost when he threw the great rock and washed our ship back to the shore and if he hear thee now he may crush our ship and us for the man throws a mighty bolt and throws it far but ulysses would not be persuaded but stood up and said here cyclops if any man ask who blinded thee say that it was the warrior ulysses son of lertes dwelling in ithaca and the cyclops answered with a groan of a truth the old oracles are fulfilled for long ago there came to this land one telemus a prophet and dwelt among us even to old age this man foretold that one ulysses might rob me of my sight but i look for a great man and a strong who should subdue me by force and now a weakling has done the deed having cheated me with wine but come thou hither ulysses and i will be a host indeed to thee or at least may poseidon give thee such a voyage to thy home as i would wish thee to have for know that poseidon is my sire maybe that he may heal me of my grievous wound and ulysses said would to god i could send thee down to the abode of the dead where thou wouldst be past all healing even from poseidon's self then cyclops lifted up his hands to poseidon and prayed hear me poseidon if i am indeed thy son and thou my father may this ulysses never reach his home or if the fates have ordered that he should reach it may he come alone all his comrades lost and come to find sore trouble in his house and as he ended he hurled another mighty rock which almost lighted on the rudder's end yet missed it as if by a hair's breadth so ulysses and his comrades escaped and came to the island of the wild goats where they found their comrades who indeed had waited long for them in sore fear lest they had perished then ulysses divided among his company all the sheep which they had taken from the cyclops and all with one consent gave him for his share the great ram which he had carried out of the cave and he sacrificed it to zeus and all that day they feasted right merrily on the flesh of sheep and on sweet wine and when the night was come they lay down upon the shore and slept end of section fifteen